exactly right. Okay, welcome to the 11th hearing of the Public Accountability Committee's inquiry into the appointment of Mr John Barillaro as Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner to the Americas. The inquiry is examining the circumstances leading up to the appointment of the various commissioners, including the processes, probity and integrity measures undertaken. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the lands on which we are meeting today. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Today, we'll be hearing from the following witnesses. Mr Stephen Cartwright, Agent General UK, Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner, Europe and Israel, Investment New South Wales. Mr Bran Black, Chief of Staff, Premier of New South Wales. I thank the witnesses for making the time to give evidence to this important inquiry. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing is being broadcast live via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, the House has authorised the filming, broadcasting and photography of committee proceedings by representatives of media organisations from any position in the room and by any member of the public from any position in the audience. Any person filming or photographing proceedings must take responsibility for the proper use of that material. This is detailed in the broadcasting resolution, a copy of which is available from the Secretariat. While parliamentary privilege applies in New South Wales to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or to others after you complete your evidence. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. If witnesses are unable to answer a question today and want more time to respond, they can take a question on notice. Written answers to questions taken on notice are to be provided within 21 days. Finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing. I now welcome our first witness. Mr Cartwright, could you please state your name? The capacity... He's been sworn in already. Yeah, so... Um, Mr. Currett, you've already been sworn in for this uh, for this inquiry. So, would you like to uh, begin today uh, by making a short opening statement, or proceed straight to questions? Uh, I, uh, Chair, gave you a very detailed statement uh, when I appeared the first time, so I'm uh, happy to um, proceed. Thank you. Understand. Uh, we'll go uh, straight to questions from the opposition, uh, Mr. Daniel Mulkey. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Agent General, for taking the time again this morning to join us. It's appreciated. I just wonder whether we can get into more of the... Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Scott. Can I just, just check as a preliminary matter that you have access to you the first tender bundle that we used at the last hearing? Uh, yes, I just found that, so I do, yes. Great, thank you. And you have the additional documents that have been supplied to you? Yes, they came through very late, um, but I managed to find a printer downstairs and I managed to get a copy done in time. Thank you, Agent General, and also thank you for joining us at the hour in which you are joining us, your time as well. We appreciate that uh, as well. Uh, can I just start, Mr Carro, with just, if you don't mind, you may, we do canvas some of this uh, in your last hearing, but do you mind just taking us through your contacts with Minister Ayres, if you don't mind? And my contacts with Minister Ayres. Could yeah, you, in your opening given statement. That I've, given that I've, I've known Minister Ayres for a long time, um, would I mean, would you sorry, as his minister, more? as minister for trade. Um, well, my recollection was he was originally minister for investment. Um, it was the deputy premier who was minister for trade. Um, so. Um, so you're correct, uh, but he becomes the Minister for Trade circa October 2021. Um, yes. So perhaps we can start from there. Um, you made a point in your opening statement, which is I think on page 8 of 10 in the version that you gave us in paragraph yes. 3, that early in your time with government you had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Minister Ayres and he gave yes, me his mobile right. phone number and told me that I could reach right. him directly if I ever needed to. Um, yes. Just by the way, do you just, uh, do you have any further information about the context of that meeting? Uh, it was just a uh, a meeting um, that um, I requested of the minister. I wanted to have a conversation with him before I 
shipped out to the United Kingdom uh, to take up my posting over here. And I just wanted to get a feel from the minister as to his expectations of the, the role of the Agent General. Um, and uh, and uh, that was really the, the, the purpose of reaching out and asking for the meeting. Okay. And uh, equally at that point, Minister Ayers said to you, and you clearly recollect him saying that you could reach him directly if you ever needed to. Yes, and I was very grateful for that because um, I think I referred earlier to my to my employment contract, which uh, committed me in my employment contract to directly briefing uh, the Premier and the various ministers involved and the Treasurer. Um, and so it was uh, helpful um, that that that's, uh, contact point was offered. And I assured the Minister that I wouldn't use it unless I needed to, but I was grateful to have that access. And uh, after that, did you have any other conversations with Minister Ayres in your, or have you, whilst he was the Trade Minister? Yes. Um, so Minister Ayres came to London for a week in February uh, and I, uh, I met the Minister and uh, Ms Brown, the CEO of Investment New South Wales, um, out at Heathrow Airport um, and uh, uh, organised a car um, to uh, take them back to their hotel. Uh, and so that was one occasion. Another occasion was in uh, May um, of this year. Um, I was in Sydney um, uh, doing some uh, work-related matters and we both spoke at a, uh, I, th I think from memory, it was a, 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 a Britain-Australia Chamber of Commerce lunch um, that we both spoke at about the upcoming free trade agreement um, and about the, the trade and investment opportunities between Australia and the United Kingdom. And there's also the contact that we already canvassed in which you contacted him via text app um, in order to raise issues to do with your remuneration, correct? Yes, that's right. And that's separate from the incidences that you just described? Yes. Okay. And is that the best recollection of your contacts with Minister Ayres during his tenure as Trades Minister? I did reach out to his office one other time in relation to a UK company that operates in New South Wales that was a flight risk of moving to Queensland and I just wanted to um, alert him to that potential um, loss of, a, of an important employer in New South Wales and just so that he was aware of it. Um, okay. Do you, Mr. Carr, do you mind just taking us through what was your investor ceremony? What was my investor? Oh, my apologies. When I, when I was awarded the Order of Australia, um, the investiture ceremony was supposed to be part of the normal ceremony that the New South Wales government presided, governor presided over, which would have been a, a group of people who were presented with their Order of Australia or, or their, their other um, uh, recognition awards. Um, because of COVID, um, the ceremony that was to take place, I think it was in November, had to be cancelled. And of course, I was moving to the United Kingdom toward the end of January, so the New South Wales Governor very kindly offered to do a, a once-off uh, investiture ceremony and to invite some key people from the government, but also uh, more members of my family than would normally be permitted to attend um, because it was... In the words, I think, of the, the Governor, it was both an investiture ceremony but also a farewell to the to the first Agent General for New South Wales in 30 years. Okay. Did you recall having a private chat with Minister Ayres at that ceremony? I had a private chat to most people who were there. There were probably 25 or so people at the event and I we wandered around the garden afterwards um, having a... A, a, a refreshment, so I would have had a chat to everybody. I suspect. Do you have? Do you recall having a specific, specific and discreet private chat with Minister Ayres at that ceremony? Um, I, not off the top of my head, Mr. Monkey. No. Do you recall discussing with him? His... I remember talking to everybody, including Minister Ayres, but I don't. I, I I don't recall. I thought it was largely, you know, sort of, have uh, just normal sort of polite conversation about about moving to the United Kingdom and those sort of things. Forgive my ignorance here, Mr. Um, Agent General, but when was that? That was January... Uh, I'm, I'm going to say around the 11th of 
January, something like that. I, I, I apologise, I don't have my diary here that to confirm that. That was 11 January this year. It was in January before I before I left for, for the UK. Okay. Um, did you recall having at this private conversation or conversation with Minister Reyes about his forthcoming London trip? Um, I don't specifically recall that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, did he tell you the purpose of his London trip? He certainly told me um, when uh, he was in, when I picked him up from Heathrow Airport, yes. Okay. And look, I, I, there's a couple of issues which I just want to tease out through this, but you make the point in your opening statement that I'm on, again, page 10 of the numbering of the document that you gave us, which is different to Hansard, so I'm just relying page on that 10. one. Page yeah. 10, your paragraph on that page, page 13. Uh, yes in which, uh, well, page paragraph 12 and 13, in which you say that you also wanted to meet with Miss Brown while she was in London to discuss a number of issues, including having your rent paid uh, yes. as well. And then you met Miss Brown at the Heathrow Airport on her arrival, but actually Minister Ayres was there too, was he? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you make the point you never had that conversation with Miss Brown whilst in London. That's right. Did you have that conversation or any conversation with Minister Ayres in London about your remuneration? No. Um, Is that because you had uh, Minister no... Ayres... Sorry, Mr. Sorry. Carr. Sorry, I interrupted you. I mean, Minister Ayres was clearly very busy with the reason that he had come over to the UK. Um, there were scheduled meetings every day um, to do with that, that uh, reason for the trip. Um, and so I, I didn't meet with Minister Ayres at all. And were you disappointed by that? I had been hopeful that I might find a few moments to meet with the minister while he was in uh, London, but um, it's not for me to um, to question that. So I accepted that he was obviously very busy and we wouldn't be able to find time to do that. Okay, Mr Carr, I just want to read you. I'm sorry that we haven't been able to provide this one to you this morning. Um, uh, apologies on our end. That's my fault. Um, but I'm just going to read you an excerpt from an email that you sent to Miss Bell on the 1st of February 2022. Uh, as well, mm. and then we can get a copy tabled and I'm sure sent over to you as well later on sure. just to corroborate it. Um, sure. But you say at this point, Minister is coming over next week, but DNSW, which I presume is Destination New South Wales, seem to want to manage his trip from start to finish, so it looks like he won't even do an office opening function now. He and I had a private chat at my investor ceremony, so I know why he's coming and it's great, but I hoped he would have some time for investment in New South Wales. Does that prompt any better recall? Uh, no, it doesn't. But I'm, I'm comfortable that he may have told me during the investiture ceremony why he was coming over. Um, but I, I, I still don't specifically recall that being the case. But that email would suggest he may have. So just to be clear, at either the investor ceremony, your Heathrow interaction, um, you had no discussions with Minister Ayres about your rent, about your school fees, and other issues to do with your remuneration. No, because at the investiture ceremony, I hadn't moved yet. Um, and uh, and in the uh, the only interaction I had with the minister was when I collected him from Heathrow Airport with Miss Brown. We had the chauffeur in the in the car. We had um, the minister and Miss Brown in the back. I was in the front next to the chauffeur, and we kept it very light and very uh, um, uh, normal conversation. We didn't get into any details. But, just, can I, forgive my ignorance again, Mr. Carr. But when did you actually get to London? So uh, I finally arrived on the 31st of January because I had to spend a week in Dubai at World Expo hosting some events um, for the New South Wales government in relation to uh, uh, Arab Health Week and a range of other things. So I spent a week on the way over in, in Dubai. Okay, so you got there into 31st, but within 13 days you're intending to start revisiting your remuneration arrangements with Miss Brown at least, according to that timetable. Yes, I wanted to raise with her what I'd discovered after I arrived because I started to seriously look for accommodation as soon as I got there because I knew I had a, a short window of opportunity with some temporary accommodation that was paid for. So you would know, I, I suspect, that um, in terms of a, a, a city rental market, um, you have to do a fair bit of research and you have to start to, to look at areas you might want to live in and you have to start to talk to real estate agents about what sort of how often these properties come up and how it works and 
So I started to do some of that research as soon as I arrived and um, was pretty horrified with what I saw. And so I wanted to have a conversation with Miss Brown um, when she was in, in the city, because it's a lot easier to have those conversations face to face than it is with a 10 or 11 hour time zone difference um, over, over a, a video call or a, or a telephone call. Okay, but basically the pattern is, is that the, the negotiations around your first package between, let's be clear, to be frank, to, to be fair to you, Mr. Cartwright, will go from June to uh, July, then there's revisited in October, and then within two weeks of you arriving in country, there's an attempt to renegotiate it again. Is that sort of loosely speaking the chain of events? No, I, I disagree with part of what you said. Um, I didn't seek to revisit it in October. I sought to have the original agreement that I had been asked to make um, honoured in October. Um, it was refused, um, despite the fact that nobody disagreed that that, that uh, deal had been made. Um, when I asked for it to be honoured, it, it, it wasn't. Um, and uh, I did have some then conversations about alternate ways that there could be some fairness brought to what was asked of me, um, and all of those were rejected. And so in the end, I had to accept um, that, uh, that, that I was going to be $56,000 out of pocket and uh, that I'd made a deal in good faith that was not going to be honoured, um, and therefore I had to move on. And uh, as upsetting as that was, um, uh, there was no attempt by me to revisit the contract. What I was asking for was for people to fulfil the obligation of a, of, a, of a deal that had been made. But that's the events of October. But you agree yes. that within two weeks you were uh, pretty determined to raise it with Miss Brown upon her visit to London. Two weeks of that is of your two arrival. Weeks. Two weeks after my arrival, yes. I wanted to have a preliminary conversation with her so that by the time the temporary accommodation expired, I was in a position to know what I was doing. So you go on to say, uh, again, I'm on page 10 on uh, paragraph 14, that you receive an email from Miss Bell, which she says, I have good news, I had a quick debrief with Amy on a few things and she's comfortable with us amending your package to pay the accommodation directly. Uh, I presume that that was news you received well? Yes, well, um, Miss Brown had only just got back from her trip to London. So given that I hadn't had the opportunity to raise it with her, I was very grateful this, that Miss Bell had raised it with her. Uh, and when I got that advice, you can see that uh, Miss Bell went on to say, if you want to go after the apartment, then yeah. go for it. So to me, um, what I had there was, a, was an, a, an approval to, to proceed on the basis that the government would pay the rent. So I was very pleased about it. Good. Um, and but presumably, were you having dialogue with Miss Bell whilst Miss Brown and Miss Minister Ayres were in London together about this? I, I had raised it with Miss Bell around about the same time. I don't know whether, the, whether during that six-day period I had any conversation with Miss Bell. I may or may not have, but I was certainly having some conversations with Miss Bell during that period about this issue. Okay, so when Miss Bell says that she raised it, we, well, when you say Miss Bell raised it with Miss Brown, that's probably reflective of some interactions between you and Miss Bell, which allowed Miss Bell to register that this was a concern for you. Yes. Okay. Yes, I'll, I'll okay. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. But then, Mr. Cartwright, why then two weeks later are you sending quite the WhatsApp message to Minister Ayres in March? If this issue was resolved 14 February, to your satisfaction, um, yes. what then prompted you to avail yourself of the private channel with Minister Ayres uh, for you to then raise some matters or to do with your rent and the school fees issue? Yeah, so I said to Miss Bell, I think we had a phone call, and I said to Miss Bell, um, it's, it's, if I'm going to make a commitment to a long-term lease, then I would really be grateful if I got something some, something in writing, some sort of confirmation that, I mean, I, I got this sort of brief email saying this is what Amy said, but I, I would prefer to have something a bit more tangible um, from head office that says, yes, we are definitely going to do that. There was then a series of meetings, but as I understand it, between Miss Bell, uh, I think 
maybe Mr. Carr, maybe somebody from HR, and I think possibly even KPMG, where there was advice being uh, considered and discussed. And then I was told, uh, maybe despite what had been sent to me on the 14th of February, maybe it wasn't going to go ahead that way, or if it did go ahead that way, that it that it might be done a different way, which wasn't going to provide any change in the tax arrangements. And it all got very confusing and very difficult. Meanwhile, my temporary accommodation is getting closer to finishing. I'm living in a small hotel room. I'm waiting for to figure out how I get my family to come over. What can I afford to rent that will accommodate my family? The weeks are moving on. The position in the head office is changing from yes, you can to maybe you can't to maybe Maybe we don't quite know how the tax arrangement's going to work. I got to the point where I thought, there's gotta be a circuit breaker here somewhere. I can't, I can't keep getting closer and closer towards the edge where I'd ran out of temporary accommodation and I can't lease something. And I had a real estate agent saying to me, well, if you want this apartment and good ones are pretty hard to find in London, then you either put down the deposit now or, or you lose it. And so all of this was going on, but nothing in head office was getting any clearer and the weeks were going by. And so I thought, I need a circuit breaker. So I, I took advantage of the offer that was made to me by the minister when I met with him. And as a last resort, I, I sent him a note saying, look, I've got to get this sorted out. And in your mind, is that, was that a display of good judgment on your part? Um, the difficulty here, Mr. Mookie, is that New South Wales hasn't had people at this level offshore for something like 30 years. Um, and it, it was very obvious to me through all of my time leading up to that point that that Investment New South Wales wasn't really sure how, how to do a lot of these things. It was really clear when I tried to set the office up and tried to get furniture and tried to get things sort, bank accounts. And it was really clear that there was not a lot of corporate memory inside Investment New South Wales or corporate knowledge about how you set up and support offshore activities. And so um, it's fair to say that uh, my experience up to that point in time didn't give me a lot of faith that it was necessarily going to be sorted out in time. And nobody, other than maybe Ms. Bell, nobody else seemed particularly bothered about it, um, despite the fact that I was coming close to the, you know, to the point where I was going to run out of somewhere to live. So um, in hindsight, should I have perhaps maybe gone to uh, Mr. Coots Trotter, perhaps, but um, I thought, well, um, I had the email, the, the previous email saying that at some point we were going to be ministerial appointments. I had the minister who said, if you ever need to reach out and, and if you, you know, if you need to, to, to contact me, reach out. So I said, I'll reach out. Um, um, Mr. Carr, it just just so I can understand properly here, um, you get an email which says <clears throat> the change you're seeking will be obtained. You become yes. frustrated because implementing that decision is a company with a bit of process. Is that right? No, sorry. that's not right. Okay. No, it's not about the process. It was... You thought they um, were negging. Well, it wasn't... Well, I didn't know whether whether this was Amy saying to Kylie, yes, okay, go ahead. And then when they got HR and legal and KPMG involved, all of a sudden it changed. And there was a point I remember where it was like, oh, well, actually, we don't think we're gonna be able to do that. And then it was, well, we might be able to do that, but you'll end up paying the same tax. And then it was, we'll, look, we'll see if there's any other way of doing it. And it all, the weeks went by and it looked like it wasn't getting anywhere. It was just bogged down in these discussions and things that so were going on in head office. And was your fear I that, just got to the point. Was your fear that it was taking too long or was it your fear that the government was going to renege? My fear was that there didn't seem to me to be a process by which I would end up with an answer and I was going to run out of somewhere to live. But do you not see how extraordinary it is for any public servant to privately message the minister as a circuit breaker in what to the eyes of many would just look like a routine dispute around <coughs> contract interpretation? Uh, it wasn't it wasn't contract interpretation because it, it was it, it would have it, as it in the end did require a 
contract variation. But um, but do you not see oh, how extraordinary it is for a public servant to privately message a minister about any matters to do with their remuneration? You need to understand, Mr. Mulgee, that I've never worked for government before. Um, and so I suspect that people who have you know, started in the government in a relatively junior position and have spent years and years coming to grips with the way that government work, then they may have inherently known that that wasn't something you did. Um, I've been in the private sector all my life and uh, uh, therefore um, when the minister said to me, if you ever need to, here's my mobile phone, reach out if you need to, um, then uh, to me, um, I, I had never been specifically told you don't do those things, so I, I reached out to the minister. Okay. Um, just in, can I just, just to close this matter off before we move to the next interaction, do you recall the date you sent that message to Mr. Ayres? No, I know. I, I think you're right. I think what you said before, which was that it was in March, I think that's right. Okay. Did you ever hear back from Minister Ayres about this? No. No contact whatsoever? No contact whatsoever. And what about in May? Let's go forward to May when you, you were speaking with Minister Ayres at a conference. Did you raise with him concerns to do with your rent and or school fees? No. Did no, we were, we were both speaking on a panel um, uh, and uh, we were sitting at a table of about 10 people and it was just chat about how things were going in, in London. We didn't speak about anything to do with remuneration. Did you... And... <coughs> after May through to June or July this year, did you have any discussions with ministers about any minister about any issues to do with school fees? No. You're absolutely positive. Well, I, I don't recall ever speaking to any minister about that. So, Mr Cartwright, I want to return to the matter that we left with before because, to be frank, it doesn't seem as though that what you're telling us aligns with the records, which we started to canvass at your last hearing uh, as well. Um, you would recall we were talking about um, the issues to do with the contract variations for rent and a similar arrangement being put in place for school fees. I want to invite you now to see whether or not in the intervening weeks since we first discussed this, where you have any better recall. Better recall about what? Talking to ministers about issues to do with uh, school fees. <coughs> No, I don't, I don't recall any conversation with any ministers about school fees. Okay. No, I, I, I don't. Fair enough. Um, if you don't mind, uh, if you've got the first tender bundle that we gave at the last yes. hearing. Yes. You grab it and let's go to page 93. You recall that you told us last time that you thought Miss Bell was having conversations with ministers around school fees. Do you recall saying yes. that? Do you recall which, well, part, in your recollection, which minister was Miss Bell discussing your school fees to do with your package with? Uh, yeah, uh, on page 92 and nine, yes. So I, I remember you suggested that I must have had a discussion with the minister because I referred to it in my email. Well, we'll and go I through suggested, that, yeah. I, uh, and I suggested to you that no, this was a matter that I had been advised by Miss Bell. I think you then suggested that she must have been having a meeting with the minister, and I said to you, I'm fairly confident she didn't have the minister with the meeting either, that she got it from Ms Brown. So uh, I assumed it was Minister Ayres, but I, but I have no direct knowledge that that was the case. So your recollection is, is that through a chain of hearsay that went from Ayres to Brown <coughs> to Bell to you, that's how you became aware of the fact that there was an arrangement that was to be entered into next year to apply a similar salary sacrificing arrangement to for your for the school fees issue that would see New South Wales picking up more fringe benefit tax and you paying less that's your recollection no um, uh, at, at the time and regrettably still is the case um, I, I hadn't been able to determine whether I could feasibly move my children from Sydney to London, um, and so the issue of the school fees wasn't a live issue at the time. Uh, and uh, so what I was concerned about was that the contract variation that was sent to me was very specific, that the arrangements that had been put in place for the rent 
um, were um, exclusive and that uh, no school fees or any other arrangements would be entered into in the future. And I contacted Miss Bell and said, that's different to what I had understood. Uh, and she said, uh, it's fine. Um, uh, if we need to in the future, we can do a similar contract variation uh, for school fees the, the same way we uh, took care of it for rent. Well, let's unpack that into two separate issues. Let's go through the chain of hearsay that apparently led you to believe that the minister was aware of this at least. Um, when you yep. say that you think it was some conversation between Ayres to Brown to Bell, when was, in your mind, those conversations taking place? I suspect it was um, after Ms Bell had done the uh, benchmarking report, which looked at uh, the other state agents general and the senior executives in London who work for Austrade, Ms Bell then looked at the arrangements that were in place for those executives who work for the Commonwealth, who work for Victoria, who work for some of the other states, and the way in which the packages for those senior trade executives in, in London incorporated a consideration for <coughs> rent, school fees, provision of cars, those sorts of uh, benefits. So Ms Bell prepared the benchmarking report. My understanding was that Ms Brown took the benchmarking report to the minister and said, um, this is what the benchmarking report says. Um, and then uh, Ms Brown then, as far as I know, um, instructed uh, Ms Bell uh, to advise me that um, as a result of the benchmarking report, the, the government is prepared to modify my contract to, to pay the rent directly. Uh, and then ultimately that was uh, that was uh, turned into a contract variation, which actually took some months to come through, but it finally came through. Okay, so let's, again, before we, uh, I guess, test that um, proposition, just so I understand it properly, uh, hmm. the, chain, the, the, the sequence of events there is that Miss Bell undertakes a benchmarking study, correct? Yes. Shares it That's with Miss right. Brown, presumably? Yes. She then shares it with... Minister Ayres? I don't have any direct knowledge that that was the case, but, that but that's what I understand. That's my understanding of what happened. And then Minister Ayres and, Minister, uh, and Ms Brown give effectively concurrence to the implement uh, the uh, results of that benchmarking, correct? I, I, I don't know whether, whether Ms Brown just shared it with the Minister as a matter of courtesy or to close the loop and whether the Minister said to her, it's a matter for you. I, I have no insight into those conversations. But after some meeting, some uh, well, the government comes to the mind to agree to the variation, correct? Yes, that's right. And that, and that then leads to, did you say a couple of uh, weeks, months of sort of just actually executing that decision? Uh, yes, I think, I think it was maybe four weeks or something that it, because it, they had to, they had to get legal to draft the variation and so that that always takes a while so given the variation was executed what in june was it this year yes that's right so all of that was taking place between may and june correct yes and that yes. was that, all that's my recollection and that was all yes. taking place after you had the interaction with minister Ayers, which you say you never actually had any discussions with i didn't have any discussions with him i sent the I sent the WhatsApp message, which you know about because it ended up on the newspapers. Uh, and uh, from that point onwards, I didn't hear from the minister, didn't interact with the minister at all. I, everything I was doing was through Kylie, through Miss Bell. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then you say that as a result of that, uh, that, that effectively you came to understand that the minister had agreed to a similar variation, at least in principle, to... Uh, applying a similar arrangement to school fees. That's what I was told. And Miss Bell told you that? That's your clear recollection? Yes. And do you recall when Miss Bell told you that? No, but you can see that I... that it's being discussed between us in these emails on page 92, 93, and that's in, that's in June, so it would have been prior to those emails. And you, and you agree that you invoked that understanding, regardless of how you came to it, um, in conversations with Miss Bell? 
that I invoked the the minister's concurrence to a, applying a salary sacrifice arrangement to school fees as you were. Uh, no, um, what what I was saying to Ms. Bell was the contract variation that had been sent to me specifically said we we will not enter into anything related to school fees. So I went back to Ms. Bell and said, well, what happens if the kids do move over and I do have to I do have to pay these <coughs> exorbitant school fees in London? How am I going to manage that? And she said, it's fine. We'll do another contract variation for that. Okay. If, if and when that happens, because it, it wasn't it wasn't certain. Mr. Carr, I will get to that um, because I think we're going to have to unpack that part separately to the first chain of events that we just went through. But do you not see how extraordinary it is that a minister was giving direct con who was at least given direct knowledge and apparently gave implicit or explicit approval to a change in arrangements that applies to one component of your remuneration strategy that. Uh, results in taxpayers having to incur a bigger tax bill and you paying less. Like, do you not see how that looks like? I mean, I've not come across any public servant that's ever had such a uh, chain of events take place that, <laughs> that, that led to uh, quite an extraordinary change, which is the reason why I'm a bit shocked by this. Like, you're saying to me that Minister Ayres was briefed on the arrangement to do with your rent and school fees and raised no objection at least and as a result you got your contract changed and taxpayers picked up a tax bill none of that strikes you as unusual well um it didn't strike me as unusual because my view had had always been that the uh, salary packaging arrangements were set up wrongly in the first place um, and so therefore this was really just correcting what was a inherent mistake in the way that the packaging was structured in the first place because if you go back to the original um, offer that was put to me way back in um, the early early parts of the negotiations, it did it did envisage a significant contribution to rent, a significant contribution to school fees, and that's very standard. That's what Austrade do. That's what the other states do. And so my view all the way through was that New South Wales Investment New South Wales had decided to go off on its own path instead of simply adopting what everybody else does. But, and there's a good reason why everybody Carr, else does. You agreed to this. You signed the contract. Now, you may yes. well have a view that, that, that you signed the contract in July. You raised yes. concerns about it in October. Um, yes. So to the extent to which you say that you were, none of these strikes you went unusual because you simply thought the minister was correcting bad arrangements. Like, yes. That just flies in the face of your own actions. No, well, you have to understand, Mr. Mookie, that the last time I lived in London was 1992. Um, and when I got over here and found out um, the outrageous rents that you have to pay here, the school fees that are double anything that you would ever pay in Australia, um, I then had conversations very quickly with the other agents general, with the senior people from Austrade, um, and discovered that there's a reason why the Commonwealth do it the way they do it. There's a reason why the other states do it the way they do it. And that is because nobody could afford to, to, to do these things if, if they had to wear them themselves out of a standard salary. So I thought that says we got it wrong. That says New South Wales didn't structure things properly. And so I asked for that to be reviewed because, because otherwise we would end up in a situation which is actually where I am today, which is that I'm living in London without my family. Um, and uh, I wasn't expecting that I was going to have to live without my wife and children. Um, I'm not sure... Um, whether you think that's fine. I don't think it's fine that I live without my wife and children. Um, I'm doing it because I made a commitment to New South Wales, but uh, I, I don't think that's fine. And when I got over here, I discovered just how poorly um, New South Wales had structured these things. So I Mr. said Carrie, I asked look, for it to be... I'm, I'm not going to dispute whether the genuineness of the grievance that you have. Um, uh, you just uh, did. Uh, you just did. Order. The previous question was exactly that. I'm not going to quibble with the genuineness of the grievance and how sincerely you hold it. The question I'm asking you is, do you actually think that nothing about seeking the intervention of the minister to correct it strikes you as unusual? So and having the minister's previous. concurrence to a, something as specific as this it would certainly suggest that Minister Ayres was closely and has been closely involved in these arrangements throughout. 
I, I, Mr. Mookie, it was a really confusing time because I had a I had a, 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 a substantial email from Ms. Brown toward the end of the year before that said we were going to become ministerial appointments, and not, that had never been countermanded. I'd never received another communication to suggest that wasn't going to be the case, and so um, it was a very con confusing situation because. Um, I'd had the minister who said, if you ever need to, just reach out. Here's my mobile number. Don't hesitate to contact me. I had uh, an email from Ms Brown saying we were going to transition from, from becoming uh, uh, employed by Investment New South Wales to becoming ministerial appointments. And it said, your conditions are likely to be grandfathered. But, and, and so I'm sitting here with, with time running out in terms of my temporary accommodation. My wife and children are still in Sydney. Me wondering whether I can actually afford to, 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 to secure a family home and pay school fees, and it's becoming pretty obvious we weren't going to be able to do that. And me thinking, well, how does everybody else do it? And so I went to the Commonwealth people, I went to the other states and discovered that New South Wales, um, th there's a reason why everybody else does it a different way, because, because otherwise nobody would be able to afford to rent a family home and send their children to, to these schools, because you just can't do it. It would take up more than what you get paid. So. So I asked for a consideration of change. Now, should I have gone to the minister? Um, in hindsight, if I'd known it was going to cause such a, a, a storm, then probably I shouldn't have. Probably I should have gone to Mr. Coots Trotter, but, but I didn't. I reached out to the minister to, to, to ask for help. Um, and as I said to you earlier, I've, I've not been raised as a public servant. I'm from the private sector. And, Actually, one of the reasons I think I was hired is because I'm from the private sector and I know how to get business deals Mr. done. Cartwright. I know. Well, yeah, no, 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 point just... of order. He's, you know, I think given the, uh, the, 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 the way the questioning has gone to Mr Cartwright so far, Mr Cartwright's trying to provide a very uh, uh, substantial answer to what has been, you know, a, 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 I would say an attack on his credibility. Please allow him to finish. Mr. Mr. Fang, I think Mr. Cartwright had actually uh, answer, was was uh, giving a, an answer that he had uh, was able to do for quite some time without an interruption, and I think it is perfectly reasonable for uh, another question to come no, from I, well, members. Sure, I'll, I'll take the point of order. He was continuing. You to have provide... already taken a point of order. Well, you're speaking to it again, are you? Yes, I am, Chair. I'm saying that Mr. Cartwright should be able to complete his answer. I don't care if he goes, speaks for half an hour. The point is, is that he's making a, he's making a contribution to a question that's been put to him that I think is, you know, was quite loaded, and um, and he has the opportunity to uh, provide. And his I, and he's done that substantially. Uh, proceed, Mr. Graham. I think you had a question. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Carroll, I just want to return to that point you are making that one of the reasons for your concern was this was, this recent view was out of step with the previous agreements. That is that had contemplated a substantial contribution to housing, contemplated a substantial contribution to school fees. What, um, I just wanted to understand precisely what earlier agreement you were referring to when you said that. No, I, I referred to the, the, the first offer that I was sent by NGS Global, <coughs> um, uh, which, which had those elements in it. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was, that was consistent. That first offer that I received was consistent with, with what I had understood would be um, components, if you like, of the package. And when I talked to the people from Austrade, they said, look, the way Austrade deals with these things is some people come to London and they don't have school children, so school fees is not a component of their package. Um, some people uh, who may just come over with themselves or themselves and their partner, they don't need a three bedroom family home or a four bedroom family home. So the components of their package differ in order to accommodate the ability to move a family from Australia to the UK. And, and when you say that was consistent with your expectations, one of the reasons that it was consistent with your expectations was the discussions you had right at the beginning of this process on the 17th of February with the Deputy Premier. Is that a fair comment? Yes, I think it is a fair comment because um, I raised with the Deputy Premier right back in our first conversation, the fact that some of the things that would that would influence whether I was able to make this move to mm. London would be things like my Precisely. my children at school and, and, and my elderly parents and other things. So we did have that conversation about those things. Yeah, and you talked about uh, the cost of housing, 
uh, potentially the cost of uh, school fees at, at that early stage? Yes, although I haven't lived in London for some years and I had never contemplated it would be anything like what it is. Mm. And this, and you've indicated in writing previously that one of the reasons these expectations had been formed was that you were told, uh, it was indicated to you, that the Deputy Premier and the then Treasurer had reached an agreement that the cost of suitable family accommodation in an inner suburb of London could be taken care of as part of these arrangements. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, I, yeah so as I said last time, um, uh, that's, that's my recollection of what was said to me in that first conversation, um, uh, that, that, that the government was prepared to consider um, a, a components to the package that would take care of those things, yes. Well, you put it slightly more strongly than that in writing. Uh, when you were negotiating about these, you said that the Deputy Premier and the Treasurer had reached an agreement that this could occur. That was that was my understanding of what was said to me by the Deputy Premier in that first coffee conversation. Thank you. Um, Mr Carr, we'll, we'll just we'll go uh, through the sort of documents um, just to sort of test the extent to which they align with what you said. Um, do you mind turning to page ninety three of the original of the original tender dump bundle that was produced on the second of the eleventh, twenty twenty two? Yes. Okay. We'll start at the bottom of the page here. This is an eighth mm -hmm. of June, twenty twenty two email from Miss Bell to you, which CCs in other personnel at uh, Investment New South Wales, who I think are in the HR team and legal team. You see that? Yes. So. You can see that the key piece here is please see a signed letter from the CEO to vary your employment agreement with us now paying your rent and wearing the tax implications with a subsequent rec redu reduction in your allowances to the same value of your rent. Uh, and you can see that this has all been discussed with Will and KPMG and you're across the details. Uh, you see that? Yes. Okay. If you go up over the page, it's your, your reply emails across two pages at the bottom of 92 and the top of 93. Yes. So, bottom of 92, you say, I look forward to hearing back from X on the operative date issue. Yes. And also, you and I discussed the opportunity for school fees to be paid via the same salary frack method as the, the rent if they moved over and went to school here. I recall that the minister agreed to this. However, this draft specifically prohibits this in the future. Uh, you see yes. that? Yes. So just firstly, when were you having those discussions with Miss Bell? It would, it would have been in the in the in the period before the date of this email so um, before the 8th of okay. june it so would have been around that time early june yeah, yeah. around that time early june. okay yeah. so it was a key issue then and that's when you were saying that miss bell was giving you verbal indication that such an arrangement would be possible yes and then you saw the draft and you saw that rather than what miss bell was telling you privately the draft told you the complete opposite Correct. Yes, that's right. And that, that's correct. That would have caused you some concern, I presume. Well, it just it, it uh, yes, because we were still figuring out whether whether I could move the family, and it would have probably been the single determining factor about whether I could afford to bring the kids over or not. Would have been the school fees. And that's why you then invoked the name of the minister. Well, it's what I what I said in the email was this is what I understood the. The minister had agreed to it. But you were basically told... reminding Miss Bell of what Miss uh, Bell had told order, you. It's happened twice okay. now that um, Mr Cartwright's trying to provide an answer and Mr Mookie puts the next question to him before he's completed his response. Um, given that we are on WebEx, given there is a time, sure. short time oh, delay, I would just ask that Mr Cartwright be allowed to finish his response before the next question is put to him. Sorry, I'll, Mr. I'll just, uh, I don't think there is a t uh, time delay, uh, actually, but um, I will uh, sure. remind uh, the member to just, you know, what I mean is allow the witness to, to, to finish his, his, his response. Apologies, mm -hmm. Mr Cartwright, if I was circuit circuiting your ability to respond. Um, but you were effectively reminding Miss Bell of something she had told you is in your mind. Yes, that's right. And uh, just so we are abundantly clear, the minister you were referring to is Minister Ayres in this email. That was my, that's my assumption, yes. Okay. Um, can we turn to page 92? Yes. And you can see Miss Bell's response 
there, which comes a few days later, to be free to Miss Bell, comes four days later uh, yes. as well. And you can see the highlighted uh, section. However, as agreed, next year, uh, if the children are with you in the UK and you require us to pay schooling directly from your base salary, a new letter will be issued with specific amounts for fees. Your base salary will be further reduced by the same amount and a new letter will be issued confirming the specifics and clean the benefits tax we will make good on your behalf each time we enter into a new salary packaging arrangement a new letter will be issued the same would apply if you opt for a different apartment yeah you see that yep i do yes and that were you satisfied by that yes because that uh, allayed all of my concerns and that allowed me to go ahead and sign the contract variation and uh did miss bell did you have any conversations with bell that surrounded this email or is this the only interaction you have with miss bell I think once I received that, I felt totally comfortable with it and signed it. Although, you yeah, know, I think that I, I can't remember if I had any more discussion with her about it, but I, I can't see why I would have because this dealt with all the issues I was concerned about, including the, the operative date. And part of the reasons why you, you were prepared to accept this assurance was because Miss Bell had told you as well, uh, verbally, that the Minister had indeed agreed to this. Well, uh, uh, yes. Well, according to this email, Frail, that, that would be a fair conclusion. So you were prepared, despite the document itself, apparently, was the document at this point still prohibiting such an arrangement? Yes. So despite the actual document that you would legally execute saying that such an arrangement isn't permissible, you were satisfied because you had a private understanding, at least from Miss Bell, that such an arrangement would be possible in the future uh, and because the minister had agreed to it. Well, what I had was a very explicit email from Ms Bell, who at this stage was my boss, telling me that that would be the situation in the future if I needed it to be. So and that's I had the that email. Right. I, that's the email I read to you. Uh, Sorry, I was that's just, right. yeah, that is the actual email, correct? That's the actual email. So that's the one you were relying. So you, yeah. your, your confidence to enter into this arrangement despite um, the actual agreement saying something to the contrary relied upon the fact that you had this email and a verbal yes. reassurance from Miss Bell that the Minister had given concurrence or at least agreement to? Yes, it was mainly this email because I tend these days to only trust things that I get in writing and that are explicit, but I then had this email from Miss Bell and therefore I, on the basis of that I felt comfortable to proceed. And you took further steps, did you not, to create a paper trail uh, with Miss Brown uh, that would make it clear the your understanding of the agreement that you were entering into correct i think i i think i wrote to miss brown thanking her for taking up my case um, and getting it fixed from memory so if we turn to page 96 yes so that's the the is that the email in which you think, or at least the correspondence in which you think you were thanking Miss Brown, or was there another one? Uh, yes, this would be the one. This okay. would be the one where I, yeah. Uh, let's unpack this one. Um, so this is after you enter it. You send this email to Miss Brown on the 16th of June, 2022, correct? You see yes. that top? Yes, I do. And this is the email in which you deliver the actual signed variation to your employment agreement, correct? Yes, Which is correct. incidentally from a matter of law when the agreement goes into effect um, when you return it, correct? That's your understanding? Yes, although it did have a specific operative date, but yes. Yep. yep. Yeah. And you say... Well, you, either I can read you the second paragraph um, if you want, but you can read it yourself, I guess. I did yeah. raise two queries relation to the wedding agreement, but I've been reassured on both, hence I've signed the document. So it's yeah. pretty clear that you relied on the verbal reassurances with Miss Bell before you executed the agreement? I always think it's wise if you clarify your understanding when you execute a document that there, there was a discussion that led up to it, but yes. Okay. Well, do you want to go to the highlighted paragraph? Yes. Do you want to read that out or do you want me to read it out? <laughs> Just so everyone I'm happy knows. for you to, Mr. Mookie. Sure. It says here, the second relates to the specific clause that rules out applying a similar salary sacrifice structure to school fees should my family move to London permanently. 
you will recall that the minister was very clear that school fees could be dealt with the same way as we were dealing with the rent. So this clause caused me some concern. You see that bit? Yes. And then you can go on, go on and say, I have a, I've been reassured by Kylie that the minister did in fact approve this. So if my family do yeah. permanently relocate, we can do another variation to cover the fees once the quantum of the fees are known. You see that? Yes. Yes. So uh, when you say you will recall that the minister was very clear that the school fees could be dealt with the same way as we're dealing with the rent, mm. you were referring to the conversation Miss Brown had with Minister Ayres. Well, I was referring to what Ms Bell told me, because you can see I go on to say I've been reassured by Ms Bell. You do. That we'll get to that. Did bit. in fact approve this. So, but you, when you so say clear you will recall, it's but, clear. No, no. He, he, sorry, uh, Mr. Cartwright is trying it's, it's to clear from, It's clear from the second sentence, or sorry, it's the third sentence in this paragraph. It's very clear there that I'm getting my information about what the minister has said from Ms Bell. Because it's very clear. However, I've been reassured that the minister did in fact approve this. So oh, look, we'll I didn't get to that, any... Mr. Cartwright. Don't get. We'll, we'll absolutely get to the second. Oh. But I'm going through the chain oh, I, because I think it's appropriate. Order. You can't, order. Mr. Mul point, yeah, we'll point of order. 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 Point of Mr. order. Mr. Fang, I, it's. We'll just hear what we will just hear what Mr. Cartwright will just allow him to finish his um his response. Continue, Mr. Cartwright. Then back to Mr. Lucky. I strongly suggest to you that you can't read the second sentence independent of the third sentence because the third sentence clarifies where I got my information from. Which, look, to be frank, I agree with you. Like, you can't separate the two. But when you say to Miss Brown, you will recall that the Minister was very clear, um, uh, you're referring to the information you got from Miss Bell about a conversation yes. Miss Brown had had with Miss Minister Ayres. Yes. And... Uh, so when you say that you're very clear, you, you're relying on effectively Miss Bell's version of the conversation with Miss Brown to remind Miss Brown that the minister was very clear because that's what you were told. Yes, and that was obviously important in the context of the document I was returning. So can you go to the last paragraph that's not highlighted? Yes. This is when you do thank Miss Brown. You say, I would like to thank... Well, actually, you don't thank Miss Brown. You would say, I would like to thank Kylie and X for their persistence in shepherding this through our internal process. And then you go on to thank Miss Brown for securing yes. the minister's approval of the variation. You see that? Yes, I do see that, yes. So you... <laughs> that doesn't... Look, there's an important distinction between that email and how you gave it before, which in which you weren't certain about whether or not the minister had approved the variation. But here it's quite clear that the minister did. And in fact, you thank Ms. Brown for securing the minister's approval of the variation. So uh, just yeah. again, just in respect to this, um, it's quite clear that the minister, I'm reading from this, that the minister did approve it was asked to approve it, and it wouldn't have happened but for Minister Ayer's approval of this arrangement. I, I can't help you with any direct knowledge of that. I can only tell you that these references in this email were to what I had been told, not what I know per se. But that was certainly your understanding at the time. It had to be, given yes. the words you've written in this email. At the time, you believed the Minister had approved this variation. Is that yes. correct? That's correct. Thank you. And you thought as well that the minister's approval was also for a arrangement which would be entered into in 23 onwards if it was necessary as, uh, as well and therefore there wasn't a need to go back to the minister, I presume. In financial year 23, yes. Okay. Thank you. So it applied to both the rent and the school fees issue in terms of what the minister approved? That was my understanding. I might just pause there if there's any questions we probably can get to. Uh, no, I think I can keep rolling. Sure. Um, Mr Cartwright, I'm just going to turn now... Um, staying on the contract, though, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, is there anything further you want to tell us about the school fees before we move to um, the, the negotiations period from April through to July last year? Anything further you want to add on that matter? Um, no, other than the fact that I'm not 
I'm not facing having to pay school fees because my children are still living in Sydney. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. Um, if we don't mind, can we just go, uh, I think we'll go to your opening statement um, as well. And I'm just going to again use the numbering and the paragraphing from the tabled copy. Thank you for providing that uh, as well. If we can turn to page six of that. So just as a refresher, um, I guess, it, we've established in the last hearing, we did spend quite a bit of time on uh, circumstances that led you to enter the process. But I think for the purposes of this line of questioning, as my colleague made reference to before, uh, there was a conversation with the Deputy Premier on the 17th of February, correct? Yes. In which the Deputy Premier made reference to a, a private agreement he secured with the Treasurer in order to, uh, around what the remuneration package could resemble, correct? Well, I, I rejected the use of the word private agreement. I explained that in terms of the, the word you use uh, email. email. That, in, the, in the email that I sent to Dr. Broadbent, I explained to you that when I said privately, I was referring to between she and I, but we disagreed on that. Um, but um, I'm not sure much turns on it, but. Okay. Um, but the, you use the term private agreement. So your words at the time were he indicated in brackets privately, of course, that he and the treasurer had reached an agreement. And Mr. Mookie suggested to me in the last hearing that that meant that it was a private agreement between the Deputy Premier and the Treasurer. And I said, no, privately, of course, was me telling Dr. Broadbent that I oh, wanted her oh, to yeah, keep... Oh, I get the distinction. Yeah. Yes, but, but you'd certainly agree it wasn't a public agreement between the Deputy Premier and the Treasurer. Well, if there, if there was such an agreement, bear in mind that I was told only by the Deputy Premier, but if there was any such agreement, then I suspect it wouldn't be something that was public, no. And that informed you in respect to uh, the uh, your starting position in terms of the negotiations that you were set to embark upon, correct? It, it certainly set my expectations that um, the components of the package that would be offered to me would, would reflect um, uh, housing and school fees and those elements, yes. Yes, and then, there's, then we join the chain of events that you describe from paragraph 17 onwards in which yes. you say you got an email from Dr. Broadbent in uh, 14 April. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yes. But we actually established, and there's not much turns on this distinction, but you got the email on the 12th of April and it's replicated on page 13 of the t first tender bundle. Yes, I, I don't know how I got 14 April, but I'm happy to accept that it was 12 April. Yeah. Um, can I ask, between... Uh, between th that email of the 12th of April mm. and the events of May, can you just take us through your contacts with Dr. Broadbent to the best of your recollection? Were you talking to her on the phone in parallel or? I, look, I, I, may, I may have uh, talked to her to say... Uh, I haven't heard anything or can, can I have an update on what's going on? Um, but there was no, I remember getting quite concerned because the time was drifting on. There was no meaningful kind of advice coming as to what was happening. Um, I Look, we may have had some short conversations about what was happening. I, you know, I, I was in, the, by this stage, I've been in this process since February and I, I, I needed to understand whether this was going to proceed or, or it wasn't so that I could look at other options in terms of what I was going to do. So, um, but we, we may have had some interaction during that period, but it wouldn't have been anything particularly meaningful. It would have just been me asking for an update or, or saying, look, I'm, I'm concerned about the delays and the, the fact that time is dragging on and I don't see it progressing. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, from effectively the 14 April to early May, you, you're still off the assumption that an offer might be forthcoming that would resemble what you were told on the 12th of April by Dr. Broadbent. That's fair? Until I received this call from Dr. Broadbent in paragraph 17, that my assumption was that we were still operating on the, the 12 April 
um, uh, offer. Okay. And so there was no interim communication verbally or in writing which would allow you to either infer or that there was a change in the government's position? Well, no, because when this call came, um, it was a very strange call. It sticks out in my memory because um, Dr Broadbent was very curt and um, I, I was confused as to why she would adopt that tone in her call to me. Um, and in hindsight, perhaps there were things going on in the background, but to me it came out of nowhere that this this change of approach and change of tone in communication um, and when I said, well, look, could you explain to me what's changed? It was no, it's a last and final offer. It's a take it or leave it. And that's, there's no more discussion to be had. And I was quite sort of surprised at why she would adopt that tone um, because I'd been waiting and waiting and waiting. And all of a sudden I got this, this sort of curt last and final phone call. And, and I said to her, I, I haven't done anything wrong here. I've, I've been sent an offer and I said I was happy with it. So. It was a little bit of a surprise to me. So what, Dr. Broadbent called you? Dr. Broadbent called me. I was in a shopping centre with my wife and she called me. I vividly remember it. Do you recall when this was in May? No. I, my, my recollection, it was early May, um, but I, I can't give you an exact date. I, okay. I've, I've searched okay. phone records and I can't find any. So what, first 10 days of May, thereabouts? I think so. I think it was in there somewhere. Um, and, and when you look at then what happened subsequently to that, that sort of positions at about right, it was in between, it was in between the 12 April email and the first time I ever met Ms. Brown, it was in there somewhere. And I'm guessing that's sort of in that first two weeks of May somewhere. So before the might 19th have, of have... May, when you first met Ms. Brown. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So just, just again, so I understand this. You get a call out of the blue from Dr. Broadbent and yes. what she says to you that the offer was now withdrawn and... She said, she said uh, the offer has changed. It's now a flat $600,000. There's nothing else, um, no other benefits, nothing else. Um, it's last and final. You can take it or leave it. And I was like, whoa, stop, what, what, what's happened here? What, why all of a sudden is there, like, please just tell me what, what's changed? Because up until that point, we'd been proceeding on the basis of the, the first offer that was made. So, and she said, I, I can't go into it with you, um, but that's last and final. You can take it or leave it, and there won't be any other discussions entered into it or something. It was, it was very curt, and I, I, I was quite surprised because it was almost like, it was almost like, I was getting blamed for asking for the wrong things, whereas the offer that had come to me was something that was formulated by the government and sent to me. So I was surprised when the call came because it was almost like she was blaming me for these things and I, I didn't do it. I just, I just was sent an offer. It's just so I'm pretty clear about what you felt. The early offer had been withdrawn and that the offer was reduced to a flat amount of $600,000. Yeah. Um, I just want to understand how that is different from the first offer, if you don't mind. So the components that, that were withdrawn, if I just take you to page yeah. 13 of the tender bundle, which is just the original yeah. offer, right? Um, so did, did you interpret this as saying that the government would now pay you $600,000 flat but wouldn't be making a significant contribution to, co to accommodation understanding that a well-located three-bedroom residence is required? Yeah, so if you if you go to the bottom of page five of the of the statement. Bottom of page five, yep. Yep. So that's right. Yep. So that's in terms of the very I'm reading from the same email, uh, effectively on the tender bundle as well. Um, it's the same yes. thing. But I'm just trying to understand, in your mind, part of the reason why this conversation was a shock was because effectively if if the offer was just a salary of six hundred thousand dollars you were no longer um, being offered a significant contribution to accommodation, uh, appropriate contemporary accommodation to longer term arrangements are located, a significant contribution to school fees. Uh, I presume you still thought you were entitled to reasonable relocation expenses and reasonable travel. 
So in terms of no, the, 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 the reasonable travel have been withdrawn as well. Oh, okay. So they withdrew that too. Yes. So in effect, the, the, the three components that were no longer offered to you were the contribution to accommodation, the school fees and the travel. Are they the main ones? Yes, that's right. And that's sort of what you thought you had an arrangement with the Deputy Premier, and the, did you not? No, I, I didn't think I had an arrangement with the Deputy Premier. I just, it was matters that we discussed when I said things like, okay. I have school kids to move, I have elderly parents that I may need to come back and visit from time to time, and that's where the, the reasonable sort of travel between the UK and Sydney as required came in, was because... I was concerned about having to leave elderly parents back in Sydney and not be able to get back if they needed, you know, sort of medical treatment or something. So you're quite they right. were part of the original discussion. I shouldn't have characterised it as an arrangement, um, but your expectations. It was a significant deviation from the expectations that the, at least the Deputy Premier had led you to believe might be possible. Well, look, um, it was a significant departure from what was sent to me by the government on the 12th of April. Um, but Mr Cartwright, like this April, on yeah. the 12th of April, this didn't, wasn't formulated by the government, it didn't fall from the sky. You had set out your expectations on the 31st of March, as you say in your statement and is contained in the documents. You set them out in detail. You detail yes. the discussions with the Deputy Premier. You invoke yes. the name of Treasurer Perrottet. You refer to the arrangements about housing and school. You refer to your discussions with the High Commissioner to New Zealand, Patricia Forsyth. Yes. You refer to yeah. your discussions on the 19th of February with Mike Pratt, yes. one of the two yes. most senior public service officials uh, in the state of New South Wales. You set out your views, your expectations. Yes. This, didn't, this offer didn't fall from the sky. It wasn't just formulated from the government in the absence of your view. You put out some detailed no. requests here, direct to NGS Global, direct email from you to Marianne Broadbent, Dr Broadbent, on the 31st of March. That's correct, isn't it? Um, You're I, not disputing I, I, any I, of that, are you? Well, I, I dispute the fact that I invoked the name of the Treasurer, but... Um, well, uh, do you want me to put to you the paragraph again where you invoke the name of the Treasurer? No, what I... What I was clear about was it was something that I was told by the Deputy Premier. I didn't invoke the name of the Treasurer per se. Well, I'll stop you it. there, Mr Cartwright, because you do invoke the name of the Treasurer. You're then making the point that you invoke the name of the Treasurer because that was put to you by the Deputy Premier. I agree with that. But there's no dispute here that you invoke the name of Treasurer Perrottet in this email, is there? Well, what, what do you believe is meant by invoking the name of the Treasurer? Well, I'll put to you the words and tell me if you dispute this, a apart from improving the base package, he mentioned low fives, he indicated privately, of course, that he and the Treasurer had reached an agreement that the cost of suitable family accommodation could be taken care of by the New South Wales Government. I'm putting yes. the position to you that in your email, negotiating these arrangements, you refer to Treasurer Perrottet. Is that correct? I made a reference to what I was told by the Deputy Premier. That's right. Correct. I'm going to take a point of order at this point, Chair. There's been a number of assertions that have been put to Mr Cartwright. Um, well, I'm trying to give him the opportunity to answer. Oh, just hear the point Mr. of order. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Graham. Um, I through appreciate me. your... Through me. Chair. Um, Mr Cartwright has had a number of, uh, I'll say, accusations put to him. Um, he... <coughs> Uh, continues to uh, defend those positions. Um, what's not clear in any of this uh, line of questioning is what it is that uh, the opposition are seeking to... Mr Fang, that's not a point of order. Uh, no, Chair, it is. You're, you're Chair. questioning the line Chair. of questioning. That's not a point of order. Mm. I'm questioning <laughs> the... Like if you... So finish I... your point of order. Thank you. I am questioning the continued uh, re-prosecution uh, of Mr Cartwright on matters that he's already addressed without an actual uh, 
circumstance being put Mr. to Mr. Fay, Cartwright. Mr. Fay, I'm going to stop you there. That's not a point of order. The opposition is entitled to ask any questions they like, as long as it's respectful to the witness, which it has been. The witness is also able to respond as he sees fit. I think this exchange has been perfectly reasonable. Um, continue, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Cartwright. You've clarified that small point, but I might return to the broader point I was making. Um, this offer on the 12th of April didn't fall from the sky. It wasn't simply formulated by the government. It was a response in part to your detailed email to NGS Global on the 31st of March that set out uh, your expectations clearly that invoked the name of the Deputy Premier, Treasurer Perrottet, High Commissioner Forsyth, Mike Pratt, uh, in the course of setting out your expectations. Do you agree with that? Again, I might quibble with you on the use of the word invoke. I was simply um, advising um, Dr Broadbent of some of the conversations that I had had around these matters because I was trying to familiarise myself with the, the, the dichotomy between what I understood was a standard way of managing these kind of packages that I'd got from a range of different sources um, with the uh, job description information that had been sent to me by NGS Global, which was, didn't have any of those components in it. And so I was trying to, I was trying to have a conversation with Dr Broadbent that said, look, I, I don't understand the difference between the two and therefore um, I, I'm seeking to understand how to raise that with Miss West because um, I, I need to be able to have that conversation with her because I have to be honest with you, Mr Graham, if, if at that point, either Dr Broadbent or Ms West or the offer that had been sent to me, if any of those things had said, look, mm -hmm. it's 430 or 450,000 flat and that's it, I would say, well, thanks very much. I can't move to London with those arrangements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr Cartwright, uh, I'm, I'm not critical in because you were acting, you were correctly conveying an assurance that had been given to you by the Deputy Premier. So I think I'm not disputing any of the facts here, you were critical and I'm not of it, disputing you were critical of it in the last question. The um, fact you're fairly conveying those things. I am making the point that this offer did not come out of the blue. Do you accept that your email of the 31st of March was material, would have been material to the offer that you then received on the 12th of April? It was designed to uh, influence that offer. Yeah, it was. It was certainly designed to to highlight the fact that that there was an inconsistency between the information pack and what I had understood would be the components of, of, of the package. And that I felt needed to be out in the open fairly early on so that we weren't wasting each other's time. Um, and uh, I will say though that, uh, that I hadn't had any discussion, you won't find any discussion in, in there um, about the, the base uh, remuneration. It was mm. more the components that I was concerned about. Yes. I want to take you to another email you um, uh, have sent, and I don't think you will have this um, in front of you, but it was sent on Monday the 8th of August 2022. It was in response to uh, some Channel 7 interest in your entitlements. I'll um, just read you the first part of that uh, email. It's from uh, you to Staff and Investment New South Wales. Uh, you say this, I understand nobody cares what the truth is, but for the record, one, I never once asked for a package of $800,000. That it, This is a straight up fabrication. I was asked by the DP in our first chat back in February 21, what I had been on at the chamber, and I told him it was around $800,000. He said that the government was looking at a base in the low fives plus allowances and I said that sounded okay. Now I'll stop yeah. there and I'll indicate that's entirely consistent with what you've set out in your uh, statement to the committee, in your opening yes. statement. You then go on yes. to say, from that moment on, that is from February 21 on, it was the recruiter making unsolicited offers to me and the first one mm -hmm. sent to me was a base of 600K plus allowances. I never, ever asked for it, exclamation mark. Mr Cartwright, That's right. how do you reconcile that with your email of the 31st of March asking for exactly this in a great deal of detail? No, I, I totally disagree with you, Mr Graham, because uh, my expectation 
um, when I was engaging with Dr Broadbent early on was that there would be a base and I had I had thought okay the the information pack said I think 450,000 base the deputy premier had mentioned low fives um, I had expected a base of around somewhere between you know 450 and and 500,000 dollars plus uh, the contributions to rent and school fees and the and the travel um, and then out of the blue comes the offer with 600 base now uh, you won't, I don't think, find anywhere where I asked for that. Um, not in the not in the email to Dr. Broadbent on the 31st of March, nor anywhere else. So I'm very comfortable with the email that you've just read out because it's absolutely factual. Uh, so even though your email on that date refers to the base and the allowances, you don't feel that your email of the 31st of March, designed to influence the officer, invoking the name, or if you want to choose another word, feel free to of the Deputy Premier, the Treasurer, High Commissioner Forsyth and Mike Pratt, you don't believe uh, that that, in fact, was you asking for your offer to be improved? No, I, I, uh, I had not anticipated that the offer that would come would have a base that high. You go on to say, Amy never told me it was unrealistic because I never met her until a week before I joined. Jenny did all the negotiations and Amy needs to print a retraction. Yes. Is that correct? Well, um, in hindsight, I realised that I had met Ms Brown um, on the 19th of May, but it, it certainly was after we dispensed with the $800,000 issue. Um, so um, the substance of what I said there is correct. It was, I just got the dates wrong as to when I first met Ms Brown, but I don't think anything particularly turns on that. Well, in fact, it was incorrect. You'd met... Ms Brown on the 19th of May. Yes, that's right. Uh, 2021, and then you met her again, which is then the meeting yes. you refer to. Why didn't you refer to that first meeting with Ms oh, Brown I, in the I, forgot, I had forgotten that we'd met on the 19th of May, but, but I knew that by the time I met Ms Brown, we'd already dealt with the issue of the, of the 600,000 flat package. So um, there's no way that I would have been engaged in a, in a debate with Ms Brown around $800,000 packages because that had already been dealt with before I ever met Ms Brown. You go on to say, she, that is referring to Amy Brown, has told the inquiry something that can't be true. What is it yes. that you wanted Amy Brown to retract? The fact that, that, that she had said to me that an $800,000 package was unrealistic because we couldn't have had that conversation. Sorry, you said package just then, and you're using the term package and salary interchangeably. Um, it's entirely possible that it had the, you, if you were persisting in your demands, or at least uh, persisting in your attempt to have the offer of the 14th of April 2021, the 12th, yeah. uh, 12th of April 2021 offer honoured. That package would well and truly exceed eight hundred thousand dollars. To be fair, I use the terms, sorry, Mr. Uh, Deputy uh, President, Mr. Fang. Um, I'm asking the witness. You say in your paragraph eighteen. Yes. Accordingly, insofar may Miss Brown may have given evidence to the committee that I demanded that she agree to a package of eight hundred thousand dollars. Yes. You don't say salary of eight hundred thousand dollars. You say package. Yes. So. We'll get on the nineteenth of May. Were you still mm. pursuing a contribution to accommodation? No. Were you still pursuing a contribution to school fees? No. Were you still pursuing a contribution to rent? No. So, in your view, is is that you would abandon these requests by that point in time? If you go to the previous paragraph 17 on page 6 of my statement, if you yes. go to the last line, go to the last line of that paragraph. Yeah, sure. But you, it but says, you. a day or so later, I advised Dr Broadbent that I was prepared to continue with the process. Now, this was after she had made it crystal clear that it was a flat $600,000. There was nothing else. It was to cover everything. No more correspondence to be entered into. So therefore, it's totally unrealistic to suggest that sometime later, 
I was still arguing for rent or school fees or well, any other additional parts. Okay, sure. So you're saying at the 19th of May meeting that this wasn't a dispute with Miss Brown because you had already abandoned this, uh, th these, this request? It had been made crystal clear to me that if I was to continue in the process, that was the offer. There so the issue no is, is that Miss Brown never told us that this conversation took place in May. Miss Brown was of the view that this conversation was taking place in October when you were revisiting your arrangements, not May when you were negotiating them at first instance. And given that, to be frank, you didn't recall um, this is inconsistent with, as my colleague took you through the inconsistency uh, here, there has never been a suggestion that this conversation was taking place in May. The, the conversation in which Miss Brown says that you had invoked the name of the Minister, the Deputy Premier and the Premier was taking place through the events that you describe in October. That That's is on the 28th of October at 52 Martin Place. And That's what are you insinuating by all so of this? So, what, what, what is the... Mr Fang, the order, order. What Just because the, the questioning, it might be getting a little uh, 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 tough. No, it's uh, not tough. Tougher. I'm actually it, trying to work out the relevance, um, Chair. Sorry, I am trying no, to Mr. understand Fang, the relevance of this. That is not a point of, of order. You get your 15 minutes at the end. Yeah, 15 minutes. And you will be the, able to the, ask the questions then. The relevance of all of this order. The... What is questioning? Relevance? Just because you're wanting to know where the questioning is going doesn't no, no, mean I know. I just need that to you are entitled relevance. to take a I point of order. Yeah. I don't, so I do we'll not point of order. Mr. Fang. Point of order. Chair, the fact that Mr. Fang can't keep up is not a point of order. I'd ask that you rule <sighs> him out of order. He is repeatedly interrupting. Yes, he is repeatedly interrupting with no valid point of order. So I'll ask Mr. Fang to sit back and listen and remember that you will have your 15 minutes of questions as we've agreed uh, to ask the witness anything you wish to clarify. Uh, proceed, Mr. Uh, Graham. I'll, I'll just put to you your evidence, Mr. Cartwright, just so we can confirm this point. You, mm -hmm. you are arguing over these issues um, on the 28th of October 2021 when you meet with Ms Brown at 52 Martin Place with the General Counsel, Mr Carr, on the phone. Do you agree these matters were discussed at that meeting? No, I do not. Not in any way, shape or form do I agree with that. Can I put to you then the evidence of Ms Brown uh, that she's put to this committee? Uh, she says in that meeting on the 28th of October 2021 in her office... Uh, she says you did invoke the name of uh, the, uh, a range of people, including the Premier. She says this, yes, it was actually the name of the Premier that jumped out at me. I sent a follow-up text to my general counsel to say, oh, I didn't like that. I said I found it quite threatening. But yes, it was at that point he was saying that he would talk to Michael Coots Trotter or even the Minister or the Premier because... The, and this is now a quote of what you said in that meeting, according to Ms Brown, the current outcome is not what I was offered. Did that exchange take place in that meeting? I've dealt with that extensively in my statement, the exact uh, arrangements that took place in October. I, I'm really going to need to deal with this because I've seen at various stages in the transcript of the prior hearings in, 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 this, um, in this committee that, that the... Um, the discussions around negotiating my original salary package and the revisiting of what was agreed to in October were all merged into one in, in people's timelines and certainly the media has completely misunderstood all of that. Um, so I'd like to be crystal clear here about which bits we're talking about and what was said because I'm really clear Thank on you. it and it's all in my statement. So let's start by saying the suggestion that... Um, that I was demanding $800,000. I never did, never requested it, never demanded it, never asked for it. All right, so let's be clear about that point straight away. The second thing is that by the time I first met Ms Brown, I had already accepted what Dr Broadbent had put to me, and that is that it was a $600,000 package, nothing extra, no more correspondence to be entered into. Last and final, if you proceed from this point forward, it's $600,000. So what I'm suggesting, first of all, is that any suggestion by Ms Brown that we were still haggling over the 800,000, that I was demanding the 800,000, that I said I would go to the Premier or the Minister or somebody else if I didn't get those things, has to be untrue. The timeline suggests to you 
that it could not have been happening at that point in time. So that has to be untrue. So let's let's accept that for the conversation that was happening in May. But, but, sorry, now we go sorry. forward. To just, just before we go forward, and I'm very eager to hear your account of the events of October, but before we go forward, in terms of the events of May, there's never been a suggestion. Miss Brown never told us that you were raising or invoking the names in May. So you're denying an allegation that's never been put to you. Like you're denying something which we're not alleging. I've, I've, I've read the transcripts over and over, Mr. Mookie, and it is incredibly confusing because it jumps between May and October and Ms. Brown gets confused. I think the committee gets confused. I've no doubt the media got confused because some of the reports that the media ran on this were that I was threatening to go to the Premier if I didn't get the job. Um, they've got it completely wrong. And so as a result of all of that confusion, I wanted to make crystal clear in my statement that I never asked for $800,000. I never demanded it. I never threatened to go anywhere over it. And I couldn't have because it was already resolved by the time I met Miss Brown. So as long as we're all happy that that is the fact, then I'm happy to move to October. Well, I'm happy, I'm accept, Mr. Ke that's your account, that we're happy to hear your account of October. Good. So when we move to October, this is based on the fact that Ms. West had contacted me prior to me signing my employment contract and asked if I would agree to take that $600,000 that I had agreed to and that we had been discussing for weeks by that stage, if I would be prepared to do a favour to Investment New South Wales <clears throat> to break that into two parts, 487000 base and 113,000 allowance. And the reason she asked me to agree to that favour was because she said it would save Investment New South Wales having to make a special application to the Remuneration Tribunal to have the 600,000 package approved. And I said to her, provided that every month when my pay packet comes, it still reflects a $600,000 base package, then I am comfortable to help out my new employer I'm happy to do a favour to Investment New South Wales. I'm happy to agree to break it into two parts. I said, I don't really mind what you categorise the various components to be, provided that at the end of the day, I still get paid the same amount that I would have if it had been a, a flat $600,000. And she said, all good. Thank you for agreeing to that. That will solve us, save us a lot of problems. Um, thanks for agreeing to do those things. It will make it a lot easier. I said, that's fine. So then I start in the end of July. I get my first pay in August. In my first pay, there's the 487,000 or the, the pro rata amount of that for the, for the, for the month. And what's missing is, is the component, which was the allowance. So I raise that with Miss West, I raise it with HR, I raise it with payroll. And the response that I kept getting was, well, that might've been what you agreed to, but you've signed a contract that says you don't get it until you arrive in the UK. And I said, well, hang on a minute, I'm not able to move to the UK because of COVID and other matters. So um, that means that I won't get that big chunk of what I had agreed to in my salary package. I won't get that until January, which is about a $56,000 loss of income. That can't be right. And I ultimately ended up having a conversation with Miss Brown, but Prior to the meeting I had with Ms. Brown, which is the one that Mr. Graham was referring to, I actually set out all of the facts in a very long email to Ms. Brown to explain to her the background, explain to her some options that we might have in terms of solving the problem. I said, look, maybe I could go over to the UK early and come back because I had to pack up the house and move the kids. Maybe um, I could put the allowance towards some of the costs I was already starting to incur in the UK because it was a UK allowance. Maybe I could claim the UK allowance after I got there, but have the whole annual entitlement um, after I arrived. None of those things were acceptable to Investment New South Wales. I was basically told, you've lost the $56,000, it's a matter for you. When we had the meeting that Mr. Graham was referring to, I had already the previous day suggested that if Ms. Brown didn't have the authority to fix the problem, that I was happy if we went and spoke to somebody who did have that authority, Mr. Coots Trotter. I said, we could go and talk to Katrina Lowe because she had suggested that if I had any 
any challenges or issues working for the public service that I could go and speak to her. I, I said, or maybe the minister or whoever had the authority to agree to fix the problem that I had just encountered because I'd entered into an agreement in good faith and it had been reneged upon. And I wanted somebody who had the authority to fix it, to fix it. Thank you, Mr. It wasn't a shock. It wasn't a shock to Ms. Brown that, that any reference was made to people in higher authority during the meeting because it was in the email the day before. So it could not have been a shock to her in that meeting. That's why that has to be fabrication as well, because it was in the email the previous day. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. We've got statement. questions now. Uh, a question now from uh, Ms. Sharp. We'll just go to her. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. I just am interested in your evidence that says that um, you know Investment New South Wales came to you to say to ask you for a favour in relation to your remuneration. Yes. Um, do you, did you get any, at any point, did you get the sense, two things, one, that they were operating within the framework that they'd been given by the government in relation to how much they could pay all of the senior trade and investment commissioners um, and that yours was a special arrangement? No. No, I had no knowledge of any of that. You don't, you don't believe that they <clears throat> felt under pressure to deliver more um, pay and can pay and other arrangements to you as a result of the agreement you believe you had with the Deputy Premier? No, I, I had no insight into what negotiations were happening with the other Senior Trade and Investment Commissioners. I had no insight into what the rules were for the government. I'd never worked for government before. I had no insight at all into what was happening behind the scenes. I was only aware of what I was having in my conversations. And you don't believe that those those public servants ever gave you um, information in relation to the constraints with which they were operating under um, for the um, your remuneration package? What, sorry, what don't I believe? That they that, that did, did they ever give you an indication of the constraints with which they were operating under when putting together your your package? Toward the toward the end, when <clears throat> when I was asking for um, uh, particular clauses um, in the employment contract or particular arrangements in the relocation arrangements, um, uh, Mr. Carr or or Miss West, I think mainly Mr. Carr because it was him that was taking over the kind of legal negotiations. He would say, "Well, um, we can't do that." I said, "Okay, I, I don't know these things, um, uh, but okay." Um, and so, so that's that's very normal in a negotiation for a, for an employment arrangement. There are some things that can be changed, and to be fair, Ms. Carr, Mr. Carr did change one of them, that being the the reciprocal notice period. But other things he couldn't fix, like the uh, extended redundancy arrangements or other things that I was having conversations with. But this is pretty normal stuff, as far as I know, and it certainly has been in my decades of hiring senior executives. You have these conversations about what can and can't be done. I had no insight into any other negotiations and I had no insight into uh, the broader rules that were governing the public servants other than what they came back to me in their response to particular issues we were discussing. But you did believe that the minister um, or perhaps Mr Coots Trotter could change the arrangements on your behalf? Again, can we be crystal clear about the period before I signed the contract and then the period in October where we were trying to resolve the, the reneging on the deal that was asked of me back before the contract was signed. And and i would be really grateful if we can keep those because I've seen in the transcript that everybody gets confused about those two things. So... Um, well, I mean, the thing here, Mr Cartwright, that, that puzzles us is that um, <coughs> no other sticks have the arrangements in relation to um, their rent. Everyone, everyone else is paid. Um, the allowance, that's also straightforward across all of the other uh, senior trade and investment commissioners. Um, oh, we are, well, I am um, puzzled that after signing the contract, um, you know, and getting that sorted, that as soon as that was signed, that then there were the cha then there were ongoing changes, which led to taxpayers in New South Wales having to pick up um, the fringe benefits tax arrangements as a result of the changes to your accommodation allowances. So uh, this is... This is why we keep asking about it because yes, there are two separate there are two separate arrangements. But you, on one hand, you say, um, "Well, I accepted that that was the package," but yet it, the package continually continues to change. No, the package didn't continue to change. Um, the discussions I had in October were about what was 
represented to me and what I was asked to agree to, um, which was then reneged upon, and that, that's fine. I, in the end, I had to accept that, and I had to accept a loss of $56,000. And then the, and, and I had put a whole range of alternative ways of dealing with it, and all of those were rejected. So nothing had changed there. The only change that occurred was then in the following June. So almost a year later, there was a change in relation to the rent. So there was one change made only. Um, and why do you, what, what, what do you think, what, what changed to make um, that become possible if it was impossible in October? It wasn't raised in October. I never talked about rent in October. This is where everybody's getting confused and the, the committee's confused and the transcript's confused and the media's confused. We never talked about rent in October. October was about the UK allowance, which I'd been asked to agree to as a construction, it wasn't real, it was a $600,000 package and that had been confirmed by Deloitte. I'd been asked to break it into two parts for the convenience of investment New South Wales to save no, them going I think, I think we'll have to agree to disagree there. It was, it was an arrangement that was um, within the bounds of what the other sticks had. Um, I think that the interpretation in relation to what, what was in or out of that, I think is where the point of difference is. Um, my final question to you, Mr. Mr. Cartwright is, did, I mean, has it ever, given that you've read all the transcripts and you've seen all this material, I mean, do you accept that the public servants bent over backwards to maximise your package on the basis that they believed that the Premier, uh, then Treasurer and the Deputy Premier um, had wanted this to occur? I, I have no direct knowledge of that and uh, uh, so far I haven't I haven't seen any evidence uh, to that effect, but um, I can't help you with that inquiry. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ms. Sharp. Back to uh, Mr. Mookie now. Mr. Cartwright, we will get to the um, artificial <clears throat> arrangement you say that you did as uh, the investment New South Wales asked you to agree to uh, shortly. Mm. But just so I'm clear here, um, because I don't actually think there is a confusion around the events and the muddling of the timeline at all. But in October, you were agitating for the payment of a cost of living slash offshore allowance whilst you were still onshore. That is, you were still in Sydney, correct? Uh, that's one way of putting it. That's and not the, how I would put it. But the reason why you were agitating for Investment New South Wales to pay you the allowance which you would be entitled to the moment you get to London is because you thought that it was a <clears> contrivance <throat> for Investment New South Wales's perspective and that actually your understanding was it was a part of your salary that should have been paid regardless of whether you were in Sydney or London. I was specifically asked if I would break it into those two parts. Now, Think about this, Mr. Mookie. We're going along. I've got documents from Deloitte that say $600,000. We're travelling along towards a final destination. And then it changes to 487 plus 113. Where did the 113 come from? It's not based on any benchmarking studies. It's simply to allow the 487 to be created as a base that fits inside the bands. So when it's you not, say it's not when you say it's not based on any benchmarking figures, we were told that it was. That, that we had Mercer come well, in and benchmark it all and we paid Mercer well, a lot of money to benchmark it and they thought the whole reason why you're getting paid more than the other sticks in terms of the cost of living is apparently because there was a benchmarking exercise. Are you telling us that that entire, that entire shenanigan was a contrivance? What I'm, what I'm saying to you is they may well have done a benchmarking study that said that the, the $600,000 package is the right package for, for this role in that, in that environment. That may, that may have been the case. Uh, but what I'm saying to you is I was proceeding towards signing an employment agreement that had a flat $600,000. That's what Dr Broadbent said it was going to be. That's what the Deloitte papers that I've included have said it was going to be. We were moving towards signing an agreement that had that as a flat salary arrangement. Then I was asked if I would break it into two parts and it had to be 487 because that was the maximum that I could receive in relation to a base salary to get it into the right band and therefore avoid the need to have to go to the remuneration tribunal. So it broken into 487 base, yeah, 113 no, UK. Mr Cartwright, you say you wouldn't have described it as an expatriate cost of living allowance, but isn't that exactly 
the term that was put to you not in October, but actually in the sixth on the sixteenth of August, twenty twenty one, in reply to your inquiries, where you were told this: our processes require that all employment agreements be set out in writing and comply with the relevant legislation. A sensible point. At no point goes on to say at no point was there an expectation or commitment in the documents provided to you, in brackets, which were negotiated extensively with you, that you would be paid expatriate cost of living allowances while you are still based in Australia. Do you accept you were told that on the 16th of August, well ahead of this yes, October uh, meeting? I was told that about a month after I had started and days after I had received my first pay packet and had therefore raised the issue about why the deal that I had entered into was not being honoured. Yes, that's what I was, I, I certainly was said that. And you agree with those observations that this is consistent with what had been set out in writing uh, and agreed with you? Do you agree with that? What I agree with, what I agree with Mr. Graham is that in order for it to be a legitimate um, employment arrangement, I understood that the base had to be 487 and the UK allowance had to be 113, but I had never understood that it wouldn't be paid to me um, uh, until I had moved to the UK. Now, um, I understood that the, that the employment contract had to say that, otherwise it wouldn't be uh, deemed to be a legitimate allowance. Um, but when I was asked to break it into two parts and said, provided I still get paid the same amount and was told, yes, you will, then I think that creates an expectation. And that's why I was so upset when it didn't happen. Did you understand so when thought, you agreed to this, was that this was an expatriate cost of living allowance? I agreed that that's how it was to be categorised in the employment contract, yes. Yes. And do you feel that it's appropriate or inappropriate for an expatriate cost of living allowance to be paid uh, while you're not, in fact, an expatriate at all while you're living in Australia? I feel that when uh, somebody asks you to agree to something uh, and you are explicit about the terms under which you agree to it, that to then not honour that agreement um, is not uh, appropriate. And I did then offer to find other ways to, uh, to, to if you like, offset that, that substantial loss um, and all of those alternative suggestions were rejected. Uh, and in the end, I had to accept that I had entered into an agreement in good faith, that I had been taken advantage of in relation to that agreement, and that I would end up wearing a substantial loss as a result of, of entering into an agreement in good faith. And to return to that point my colleague was making, you really did see this as a contrivance to allow that $600,000 package to flow. That really is a fair... Uh, statement about I, the, I about the evidence you're giving us. I saw that the breaking up of the 600,000 into a 487 base and 113 allowance was a construction that allowed Investment New South Wales to avoid going to the remuneration tribunal. That's and what it was. That, that's what I was told. Yes, uh, told by Ms. Bell. By Ms. West. By Ms. West. And you, your evidence on the benchmarking is while the 600,000 might have been benchmarked, that expatriate cost of living allowance was never benchmarked. It was... I don't. It, I, it, never, I, never saw, I never saw the Deloitte benchmarking reports at all, so I don't know. But, but Mr Cartwright, when Miss, if, when Miss West asked you to agree to this artificial arrangement, hmm. did you not think that, or did it occur to you at any point that if we're to believe, well, if we're to believe your version of events that you had gone along with this in order to suit investment in New South Wales and to do them a favour, yeah. did it occur to you to perhaps ask whether or not investment in New South Wales was engaged in misleading, deceptive or fraudulent conduct with you and that you were being asked to agree with that? Because that's effectively what you're describing, which is a conspiracy in order to circumvent public sector rules, is what you are narrating here that apparently led by Miss West, for which you went along with. Uh, what I'm saying to you, Mr Mookie, is that I was assured at the time that if I agreed to that separation, then 
then it then it would be compliant with the governing rules around the setting of salary packages. That's what I was told. But there is no documents, no correspondence, no legal advice, no emails, no nothing which would suggest that Miss West put this to you. Well, what I put to you, Mr. Mookie, is there needs to be an explanation as to how we move from an agreed six hundred thousand dollar base package, which we were proceeding along towards towards agreeing to an employment contract that had that in it, to suddenly 487 plus 113. The letter from Deloitte that, that contained the outline of the salary package that was sent to me by Ms West <clears throat> did not have did not have anything to do with a UK allowance in it at the time. So how do we explain the fact that we have gone from a $600,000 gross package, which was what we were talking about, what we were agreeing to, what's in the Deloitte letter, what they've considered, how do we move to a 487 plus 113? How does it get from one to the other? <coughs> there has to be some explanation for that change, and I've given you the explanation. Thank you, Mr Cartwright. Uh, we will actually go for a short break now. Um, uh, we'll go to, we'll have a 15 minute break until five past 10. Mm -hmm. So we'll see you back in 15 minutes. Thank, Thank you. you.
our hearing now. Welcome back. Uh, we'll start with Thank questioning you. again from the opposition, Mr Mookie. Thank you, Mr Carroll. Uh, Chair, before we, Chair, before we start, could I just make one reference, please? Yes, you can. Um, I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity for the break because it allowed me to uh, peruse uh, some of the tender uh, documents um, and it may assist in the last matter we were discussing before the break. Um, if I can take the committee to page 62 of the uh, first lot of tender uh, documents, so 62 of 99. What you'll see there is a, an email from me to the head of HR um, copying in Ms West, and that email was sent by me on the 6th of August, which was 12 days after I started in the role. And uh, this would have been after I re received my first pay slip. And I refer the head of HR to the fact that um, I had only received the base arrangement of 487 in my first pay, not the 113,000. And I, I start by saying, if this is right, and I must admit it has caught me by surprise, given the artificial nature of the way my package has been structured, and then I go on to ask if, it, if, it, if the allowance could be applied pro rata from when I did arrive in the UK, so that I didn't miss out on the, on the $56,000. And then I go on to say toward the bottom, if this doesn't occur, then I'm being paid less than I agreed to for this year by a huge amount. Given the design of my package was artificial to meet internal considerations, I can't imagine Jenny will allow that to happen. Now, this is 12 days after I started. This is after I received my first pay packet. Um, it, it, there seemed to be some uh, doubt that um, I, I was, um, uh, was, being, was, was asked prior to signing my contract to agree to what I agreed to. And I'm just reinforcing here that an email that I sent immediately after I got my first pay very clearly sets out that I was surprised and that um, I would be surprised if Jenny West allowed that to actually happen. So uh, I know Mr. Mookie was perhaps raising some doubt about what I was suggesting occurred. Um, this is uh, an email that is very proximate um, and, and very relevant in that regard. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. You. Cartwright, because it's ironic. I was, I appreciate the, um, <clears throat> you drawing our attention to this because I was going to ask you about these emails um, now, actually. So that's quite apt. And just to be clear, I wasn't disputing, and I'm not disputing the sincerity upon which you held this issue. But <clears throat> I think what I was putting to you beforehand was that if we're to believe what you were saying, which is you went along with an artificial or a arrangement as a favour, <coughs> uh, I was asking you whether or not it occurred to you that you were engaging in or facilitating Miss West's attempt to circumvent public service rules. Uh, but that's okay. I think you gave us your view on that matter quite clearly. But just, I guess, let's cover off these emails. You, you do make the point... That as you just did, that you got your pace, your first pay slip, you notice this discrepancy. Uh, yes. And that's on page, and then you immediately emailed HR. That email is on page 63 of the bundle. Yes. Down that's the bottom, you see that? You, 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 yes, uh, you say to, I believe that's a HR person, um, or it's a senior leader at the time, uh, I just checked my, good afternoon X, I just checked my pay slip and I'm concerned that there may be an error interpreting my employment contract. My first pay seems to be based on my annual base of 487, but the extra 113k of allowances is missing. Payroll staff may be mistaken in thinking that this only applies when I'm in the UK or that I need to claim expense reinvestment, but the reality is this is actually part of my negotiated monthly salary. Can you please explore for me and let me know when it can be fixed, which is absolutely consistent with what you've told us. Yes. Okay, if you go up, you can see that the director of people and culture at the time replies yes. to you the next day. Yes. And goes, hi, Stephen, happy Friday. Thank you for your patience. I've looked at your contract and also the background on this particular arrangement. And then she uh, exerts clause 5.3 of your contract, 
which is yes. uh, quite clear that the allowance is referred yes, to in is. Clause 2, shall only be made in respect yes. uh, of that, and it's payable upon your relocation to the UK. So there's no dispute around the actual contractual interpretation, correct? Uh, that's correct. And then you reply hmm? uh, on the 6th of August. That's when you reply the email you just read out, the most pertinent bit is, if this is right, and I must admit it's caught me by surprise given the artificial nature of the way my package has been structured, then can you please confirm that the pro rata application will apply from the time I arrive in the UK, but calculated to ensure. So you're not quibbling with whether it's payable at this point in time, whilst you're in Sydney, you're suggesting in effect that if you don't claim that part of the allowance whilst in Sydney, you should be able to claim it pro rata um, uh, when you arrive, so you are paid the full year's amount despite you being in the UK for a shorter period of time, correct? I, I, I thought that may have been one of the explanations for how it would work. Sure. And then if we go forward um, to... We'll have to jump forward in time to pick up the next part of the email chain, which is if we go to forward to page nine, 59 this time. 59? Yep, and 58. Yes. You, on 58, I think you in effect forward this email, uh, or actually, to be fair, someone forwards. Well, you write to, from the second part at the top there, you then write to Miss West uh, asking for this to be added to the weekly agenda. You see that? And you will mm. need your guidance yes, to help this resolved ASAP. Yes. And then that, in effect, triggers the chain of events that leads to the October meeting with Miss Brown, correct? Correct. So I presume in the interim it was discussed with Miss West at your weekly meeting and it wasn't satisfied to your conclusion? To your My recollection is that Miss, Miss West said, look, there's nothing I can do because the contract is clear. But Mr. Carr, this is another incidence in which you seem to be relying on a private arrangement despite signing a contract to the contrary. I, I accept that, Mr. Mookie, and um, you, You're an experienced professional who's led an employer organisation amongst other parts of its functions, but you would know that written contracts supervene and override all forms of private arrangements that are reached beforehand, correct? I believe that if it goes to a court, that would be what would be decided. And that's a basic principle of contract law, which, frankly, every first-year lawyer is taught. Um, so why did you feel as though uh, your private arrangement should prevail regardless of the fact that you had entered into a written agreement to the contrary? I felt that I had only changed my arrangements prior to signing the contract because I was asked to do so as a favour to Investment New South Wales. And I had assumed that there was some way in which uh, my allowances would be paid in accordance with what I had agreed to. And then when I, um, look, if I, ha if I have to be honest with you in hindsight, I would say I suspect it was probably envisaged that I would get uh, employed toward the end of July, that the approval to reinstate the position of the Agent General would come quickly from the UK and that I would then be over in the UK very quickly and uh, I suspect Investment New South Wales thought it would be a very short period uh, between when I started and when I would be um, collecting this allowance and that was probably in thinking at their time. But as it turned out with COVID and with the delay to getting the approval from uh, the UK government taking so long um, and a range of other issues it ended up becoming a six month delay, which then made it a very big problem. Um, so I did try to find alternative ways of resolving it. There were, I was saying, you know, there are, there are UK costs that I'm incurring now, even though I haven't moved yet. Perhaps we could put those against the allowance. I was trying to be reasonable in coming to some way of dealing with this that would be fair under the circumstances. Uh, but each one of those suggestions was rejected. And so in the end, I had to let it go and say it was a lesson I've learned in life, Mr. Mookie. Well, Mr. Carr, let's just, before we move beyond this matter, which I've got maybe five more minutes on, um, uh, the, as after this dispute is triggered, after you get your first pay slip, 
you in effect mm. step by step go up the chain of command as you see it correct in order to get it resolved um i i did explore uh, a range of alternatives before i did that but ultimately uh, miss brown um, sent me an email saying how are things going so i responded and <coughs> told her that i had a a concern when did miss brown send you that email would have to go back and find it but it was prior to the it would have been in the week prior to our October meeting so it was probably middle of October okay so let's just in effect you go to page art they can't solve it you go to Miss West she doesn't solve it um, and then yeah. Miss Brown contacts you just to inquire into your well-being and uh, whilst you're in Sydney and then you take that as an opportunity to tell her that this is disputes going on correct yes and yes that's right uh, and then that, what, did you request a meeting, the October meeting? Um, I think after I laid out all the, back, all the background to it and all the alternatives that I had tried to resolve it, um, I think she then said, um, well, let's have, a, let's have a meeting to discuss it. And we went backwards and forwards about what date or time that meeting could occur. And ultimately, we did find an opportunity to meet in the offices a couple of days later. Okay, so uh, let me just take you to paragraph seven of your statement on page nine. Mm -hmm. it's, it, you make the point here that on the 23rd of October, you decided to escalate the matter, so you sent a long email to Miss Brown. So let me just yes. be clear here, right? Did Miss Brown send you an email or did you send her an email? She sent me a very short email saying, how are things going? Are you settling into the role? It was a very kind of, right. you know. And that was that was before the 23rd saying, of October. Yes. And I responded by saying, well, this is an issue that I've encountered. And I provided her with a very detailed explanation of what was going on. And then Miss Brown, you say an email back to you, rejected your request for any consideration and said that she had just yes. spent the day in budget estimates where... It was made clear that the issue of luxury expenses would be the subject of ongoing scrutiny by the upper house, which, to be fair yes. to Miss Brown, I think that came from myself and Miss Sharp at the time. Um, yes. And she said that she was sorry that that wasn't the answer you were looking for. And then you replied yes. to her with another email on the 27th of October in which you say you made reference to Commissioner Lowe, Secretary Coots Trotter, or even the Minister and the Premier. Mm. And what, did she then the day after say, well, why don't you come into Martin Place and let's have a chat? Or did you ask for that meeting or what happened? I, I, I can't recall. I, I know that we set up a meeting to talk about it further, but I can't recall who asked for the meeting. And then you, in that meeting, your recall is, uh, uh, do you recall making reference to the Premier, the Minister or Secretary Coots Trotter? I think what I said in the meeting was that, that I... I reiterated what I'd said in the email the day before, and that is that I was happy to talk to anybody in authority that had had the authority to fix the problem. If 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 that like what basically Miss Brown was saying, she didn't have the authority to fix it. Um, well, was, was she saying that, or was she saying that the it wasn't that she was she, or was she saying that she disagreed with you? It wasn't a question of authority. She thought your request was unreasonable. What she was saying was that because of the scrutiny in budget estimates, that the answer was no. Well, that's not the same as I don't have the authority. Did she say to you, I don't have, I think you've got a good idea here, but gee, it's not within my power to give. No. So, no. so she no, doesn't my apologies. say. I wasn't, mean, I, I wasn't meaning that. What I was saying was that her, her answer was no. And I said, well, uh, well and, and it was. It that's was a material that change. Well, sorry, Ms. Curry. Well, I haven't I haven't put in my statement that she said anything about authority. I, I misspoke. I'm sorry. What I'm what I'm saying is, she was making reference to the scrutiny by the upper house in budget estimates of the offshore expenses as the reason why nothing could be done. Sure, and, like that that was the reason she gave you. I accept that. But your yes, reply yes. was, <clears throat> well, then let's go talk to the minister, the premier. Was it? My reply was, I'm happy to go and and have the conversation about what happened, as in the uh, the arrangement I was asked to enter into and what has subsequently occurred, I was happy to have that with anybody who could help, whether that was Commissioner, Commissioner Lowe, because 
in previous <coughs> conversations, you have said if you encounter any issues working in the public service, you can always come to me for support or advice. I was happy to go to Secretary Coote's product because he was the secretary of the department I was working in. So I thought those. But if if it if it required some other form of intervention, then it may have had to go further. I, I didn't know how to get it resolved. So, but but just be clear here. You email her asking for a solution. She replies back saying that's not possible. Somehow the very next day a meeting is convened in Martin Place. Effectively, you repeat the position as outlined in your email exchange. She rejects your position yeah. again. And then you then say yeah. words to the effect of, well, we maybe, well, or at least you then invoke the names of the Public Service Commission and the Minister and or the Premier as you put it in your statement, because the outcome was simply not what I agreed to and it needed someone with sufficient authority to fix it. I think you've missed out one step, Mr Morgan. Which step did I miss? You missed the fact that I replied to her email before the meeting. Sure. I raised yep. those, that uh, uh, sure, fine, yep, fine. You, you made the... No, no, the, 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 reason, the reason that's important is because in Ms Brown's evidence, she said that <clears throat> I raised the issue of escalating the matter to more senior people in the meeting and she was shocked by it and and taken aback by it and, and sent it off a note to her general counsel. She couldn't have been shocked by it because it was in the email the previous day. But Mr Cartwright, I think her shock was from the fact that you were persisting with it despite her rejecting it in email. I don't think it was That's a shock. That's not what she said in her evidence. So I accept, Mr Cartwright, that you... Uh, raise the names of the Premier, the Minister and the Secretary of DPC in writing the day before you had the meeting in person. Uh, so just to be very clear, I accept that that happened. Uh, but do you not see how uh, your att continued attempts to, as you put it, get this issue fixed would appear to the public servants like you simply trying to get their bosses involved because they're not going to give you what you want. Um, what I was seeking was a way of uh, overcoming the impasse um, and I was being met with a flat no, despite me trying trying to be accommodating and saying other, other ways we can get this resolved because the unfairness is pretty, is pretty huge. So, um, and I, I said, so there are other ways we could get it resolved. And it would, every one of those suggestions was met with a blank no. So, so I didn't so, quite know where to go from there. So, Mr. Carwright, you're not the first public servant to find themselves in an employment dispute of the 440,000 public servants that there are in New South Wales. And I'm sure that's true. You're not the first person to go, SES executive even, to have issues like this uh, as well. But you seem to be the first public servant in the SES to name drop the Minister, the Premier and the Secretary Coach in both writing and in person in order to get a relatively minor issue from the perspective of the public service resolved. Do you not see that that is actually um, intimidatory to public servants? You have... Um, uh, I don't know where to start with all that statement, Mr Mookie. I didn't name drop them. I was, I was, and, and I, re, I actually referred to them in the reverse order to the way you referred to them. So I know you started with the premier and worked back to the minister. I didn't do it that way in my correspondence. I said, could, should we go to the public service commissioner? Should we go to Mr. Coots Trotter? I was saying, <coughs> at some point in that chain of command, there's somebody who can intervene to fix the problem. And so I wasn't name dropping. I was simply making a suggestion that if, if it couldn't be resolved with. Ms Brown, then perhaps it could be resolved with somebody that Ms Brown reported to, and I didn't know where that might come from. You say it's a relatively minor issue. Um, I don't think losing $56,000 is a relatively minor issue, um, and uh, particularly when it is as a result of me agreeing to something that I was asked to do and change a position to my detriment. So I think I was entitled to ask for it to be reviewed by somebody um, uh, who, could, who could perhaps intervene to to help me resolve the problem. Now, in the end, I didn't. In the end, I had to accept that it was not going to be resolved and fixed, and I moved on. Okay. Um, can I just ask you one, one other matter um, before I pass to my colleague, uh, uh, Mr Cartwright, just returning to the negotiations that took place prior to you entering into the arrangement. So as you quietly, quite rightly say, we should be very separate around the timelines and very clear about the events we're talking to. I'm now talking to events around 
uh, the end, the conclusion of negotiations with Miss West and thereabouts. Do you recall having conversations with Miss West around 18 June 2021 about your potential contract? I'm sure we did. Do you remember that conversation becoming heated? No. Do you recall that conversation becoming short? No. Do you recall Miss West at all in that conversation uh, expressing any upset with your behaviour? No, I, I recall Miss West um, was getting a little frustrated because I was asking for explanations as to why some things that we were negotiating couldn't be agreed to or, um, or, or, or for a logical explanation to some of the positions that were being adopted in the negotiations. And I do remember her getting a little frustrated with that, um, but I don't remember it being particularly difficult in, well, in my experience, I guess I've had a lot of experience in these negotiations, but I don't, it did, certainly, it was always professional. Okay, can I just quickly take you to, uh, just in terms of the bundle from this morning, page 36, yeah. if you don't mind. This is the bundle that is titled Contract Negotiations at the top. Um, yes. So you're not you're not you wouldn't have seen this before, to be clear here. This is correspondence between the HR business partner and the director of people and culture at the time. And this yes. is a email that is on the at 50719 on Friday the 18th of January. Um, and you can just see it, it refers to some other matters involving Miss West for which these two officials are trying to get some clarity from. But she goes on yeah. to say, the, the HR business partner goes on to say this uh, in response in about Miss West. Uh, not sure, to be honest, where that's at. So let's connect with Jenny on Monday to confirm with her. She, that is Jenny, called me a couple of times today, but on the last call was in a real tears and kind of hung up on me because only because she was so upset from a call with Stephen C. Do you know mm. why Miss West would have been so upset with you that day? No, I, I mean, this is a long time ago um, and um, I have no insight into what this third person might have thought about why Miss West was upset. Um, it's a bit of a stretch to ask me to make a comment on that because we're not even getting first-hand evidence here. It's third-hand evidence. And, well, you are um, one of the parties I, that's <clears throat> West Cartwright, which is why I'm asking you if you recall the conversation and whether or not there's... No, I don't, I don't. Okay, I'll move on then. Mr Cartwright, I might just return to the evidence you gave before the break. I just want to return to that 28th of October 2021 meeting in the Martin Place office of Amy Brown yes. uh, where you met face-to-face. Mm -hmm. You have said yes. you were surprised that she gave evidence to this... Uh, inquiry that she was shocked uh, when you raised yes. the matters you had raised in the email beforehand. In fact, you went further yes. than that. You described it as a, as a fabrication. Is that evidence you stand by? What, what I'm saying is that um, given that I had said exactly the same thing in the email the day before, I'm, I, I, I'm at a loss to understand how she could say that she was shocked when we were having the conversation during the meeting because that email had been with her for 24 hours and I wasn't saying anything different in the meeting to what I said in the email. That is her evidence to this committee. So are you suggesting she's fabricated that evidence? Well, I'm suggesting that I'm telling you what, what happened and I'll leave it for you to make that conclusion because you know that the email on the prior day raised exactly the same issues. Well, you haven't left exact it same to us. You've suggested that Ms Brown has fabricated that evidence. Are you withdrawing that? Well, perhaps Ms Brown uh, uh, doesn't accurately remember what happened. I'll turn to another matter uh, that my colleague raised with you last time. I'll briefly um, recap the evidence you gave. It was a brief exchange where Mr Mookie said to you, uh, you did authorise an extensive advertising campaign directed against the Labor Party, didn't you? And you replied, no, I did not. I just wanted to ask some right. questions in relation to that campaign. That campaign sure. was in the lead up to the 2019 state poll and was the yes. New South Wales Business Chambers keeping New South Wales number one campaign. Is that correct? Uh, if that was the, uh, uh, the... That was the campaign we ran in the lead up to the 2019 election, yes. And electoral funding disclosures show that the campaign was uh, worth more than $500,000, correct? Uh, from memory, that's true. I think there's a cap, so it, it would have been under the cap, but, but from memory, that could be right. 
uh, mm. under the cap, but more than five hundred thousand dollars. That accords with your recollection. It, it could be right. I can't re recall, but I know we invested substantially in in the campaign. It included sixty three thousand dollars, for example, on digital strategy with one provider. That, that could be right. Uh, it included television ads uh, targeting Labor's payroll tax threshold in three marginal seats in the north of the state, Tweed, Lismore, yes. and Ballina. Yes. And you've stated about this campaign in the Chamber's annual report in 2019, you said this, we said about using social media and digital marketing tools with a more powerful reach, targeting at voters in seats where the outcome of the election would be determined. They're your comments from 2019 in the annual report. Is that correct? Uh, if, if, if you're reading from the annual report, then I guess it is. I don't remember, but that, that could be right. Uh, the campaign involved Facebook advertising, digital advertising, radio advertising, print material and newspaper advertising. Is that correct? To your from, recollection? From memory, that's right. Yep. Yes. It also involved a series of meetings, one of those at the Elements of Byron in the electorate of Ballina, one at Dalton House, one at Coogee Diggers in the seat of Coogee, one at the Mingara Recreation Club in the seat of the entrance. Uh, is that correct to your recollection? Uh, we, we used to have those uh, member meetings all the time in the lead up to elections and generally, so it's probably <coughs> right. And you attended each of those meetings? I don't remember. Yeah. Highly unlikely, actually. But, but yeah, I so you, your evidence is you did not attend those meetings. Did no, you attend any evidence? Of I'm saying I don't, I don't remember. It was a long time ago. Yeah. And I went to so many member meetings. That I, I could yeah. have, I, I might not have. I don't remember. These were meetings that are disclosed as part of the electoral return uh, relating to this specific campaign. Ballina on the 21st mm -hmm. of February. Dalton House on the 12th of March. Coogee on the 11th of March the entrance on the 19th of March, immediately before the election. Does that assist your recollection of whether you attended any of these no. meetings? No, it doesn't at all, um, because um, first of all, I wasn't the authorising officer for that campaign. Um, and secondly, uh, from, what, from what you've read out, it doesn't say that I was there, so it doesn't assist me at all. Well, I'm asking you, were you there? I don't remember. We Do you recall so who was members. there, Mr Cartwright? Well, no, Chair, we, we at this point, I'll probably take a point of order, to be frank. Point of order's been taken, Mr Martin. We've heard this go on. Mr Carrot has given his recollection or lack thereof. Um, but to be frank, I don't believe that this line of questioning is within the terms of reference for this inquiry at all. I think uh, it is within the terms of reference. Um, the uh, member has been asking a specific question about the... the potential, whether it's potential conflict of interest between Mr Cartwright and the government. And um, I think that is a legitimate line of questioning. It's a robust line of questioning. I, I will just remind the member to allow the witness to um, respond, but if he can continue. Mr Cartwright, in the course of uh, running this campaign or prior to the running of this campaign, did you have any discussions or did the chamber have any discussions with members of the government? We, in the 11 years that I was CEO of the New South Wales Business Chamber, had extensive discussions with lots of members of the government, lots of members of the opposition, uh, opposition leaders. I met with, I met with Michael Daly, Luke Foley, John Robertson. I mean, I, I can't. I, I, the, the, we met with political operatives all the time, regularly about everything. I accept uh, that, no Mr. Way Cartwright. I accept today. your. I accept your meetings about everything with a range of... I'm asking a more specific question. Did you meet or discuss with members of the government this more than half a million dollar election campaign? No, I don't recall ever meeting with them to say, we are running an election campaign along these lines. I don't ever remember that. Now, again, I will say to you, I was not the authorised officer running this campaign. And you will notice that if you have gone to the trouble of obtaining the information about the return that's, that's, that's been a point, filed. That's a point you've made. No, 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 point of order. Right, point of order. Point of order. I'm agreeing Mr. with point the of witness, order. Mr Fang. No, no. Well, Mr Cartwright is... Uh, whether you agree with him or not is irrelevant. Mr Cartwright is providing an answer 
please allow him to finish the answer before you interrupt. Uh, I'll just remind uh, the member once again just to, to, to allow the witness to, to at least uh, finish uh, what he's responding to. Mr Cartwright, I agree with that observation you're making. I'm asking a different question, which is, did you discuss uh, this campaign with any member of the government? I don't ever remember discussing it with any member of the government because it wasn't a matter for the government, it was a matter for the chamber. So it's never came up in conversation over the course of March, February, January, December. This was not, not, a, not, not the subject not, of discussion not, with any member of the government. That, not a discussion that involved me. Uh, this was not discussed with either of the coalition parties, this campaign? Not that I recall. Are you aware of other members of Business New South Wales who may have been party to those discussions? No. One of the agencies that was used, that $63,000 spend that mm. I referred to, was with digital strategy agency Topham Gearin, uh, which was also used by the Lib state Liberal Party during the election. This was the Liberal Party's digital strategist. Were you involved in the selection of that digital strategy agency? No. Why was this digital strategy agency used by the Liberals chosen? I would, you would have to ask the authorising officer for the campaign. You were not party to any of those decisions or discussions. That's Point your evidence. Order, Chair, this question has already been put. Mr Fang, I won't, honestly, I feel like you're running interference now with the last... Uh, it's chair, the no, no, last chair, chair, that is, seven chair, minutes that is, of the opposition's chair, questioning. Chair, that, uh, As I have said before, bow. he is entitled to chair. ask questions no, 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 even no, 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 if no, they no. are trying to pursue... No. The, the question has already been put. The question was already answered. The question is being put again. There is uh, the procedural fairness resolution, which is quite clear about the way that questioning uh, occurs to a witness, and also as a chair, what is relevant. Now, the chair can rule on the relevance Mr. of the Fang, question. I don't understand ruled, the relevance. I, I don't ruled, understand the relevance me, of the question. I have already ruled on the relevance of this in that if the member is attempting to draw a connection between Mr. Cartwright no, and government members, you're trying to smear somebody. You're trying to smear somebody as if they're, they're the some order. connection to us. Can I just remind the deputy president that no one should be talking over the chair? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mulcahy. Well, the chair's not allowing me to finish my point of order, and that's probably the first problem. I think, um, Mr Fang, you've made multiple points of order, all to uh, the same. Yeah, and mostly I, relevant. I am now going to go back to the member. We have seven minutes, if we could just allow this course of questioning to continue. What processes were put in place to ensure that the digital strategy agency, which was being used both by the Chamber and by the State Liberal Party, did not allow those two campaigns to cross-pollinate at all? You would have to ask the officer who was responsible for the campaign. Who was that officer? Uh, I think it, if, if, if you have the report there, then perhaps you can help me, Mr Graham. Well, I'm asking you who the officer is. You're asking us to make our own inquiries as I take your... Yes, no, the, exactly the, the, only reason, the only reason I'm hesitating is because we ran about five, camp five or six campaigns while I was CEO and there were different responsible officers for each of them. So I, I'm just, I don't want to mislead you by saying the wrong person. Perhaps I take it on notice. Thank you. You were the spokesperson though for this campaign. For example, you spoke to the Daily Telegraph and you indicated this. You said, this is the first time we've undertaken a television advertising campaign of this kind. Is that correct? Yes. That's, 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 that's what I said. Yeah, and it was quite unusual that you're advertising in these three National Party seats on television. It was the first time that had occurred. Is that correct? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, yes. You say, and you're told by a colleague, that you did not authorise this campaign. Uh, this right. is a statement from Business New South Wales. When asked, who signed off the group's 2019 campaign? A spokesperson for Business New South Wales says the 2019 campaign was approved by the then CEO. That's you. Why is Business New South Wales saying you approved this campaign? Uh, because I don't know why Business New South Wales is saying that. I was very clear on the structure under which these campaigns are built, authorised, approved and funded. Uh, and uh, they were, they were um, 
designed by the policy and advocacy department of business new south wales with input from the policy uh, policy committees of the members uh, so the members identified the crucial issues the policy and advocacy uh, division of the chamber developed the campaigns the uh, funding for the campaigns was was approved by the board uh, it was put up as a special resolution and approved by the board it was beyond my authorization level to sign off on a campaign of that size uh, and uh, there was a there was an appointed responsible officer for the management and the conduct of the campaign, which was not me. It was it was somebody who was the head of policy and advocacy. That detail is interesting, Mr. Cartwright. But why is your own organisation pointing the finger at you as the person who approved this election it's campaign? Provided the response, you've just asked the same question Order. again. You, you would need to ask them, Mr. Gray. I suspect. I don't know why they would say that. I mean, I was the CEO, so I was part of the decision-making process. I was at the board meeting where the board signed off on the funding for this campaign, and they understood the detail of the campaign. And they, but 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 I was I was the CEO. I wasn't the ultimate decision maker in any of these areas. Mr. Cartwright, is one of the reasons why ministers were so enthusiastic to put you into this process late because of your enthusiastic support for their election campaign in oh, 2019. That, so that is that. Chair, that question I would ask you to rule out of order. It is not appropriate. It's not covered by the terms of reference. It is smearing uh, somebody. And let's be Mr. honest, the, the opposition is just slightly. I've heard enough, that, Mr. Uh, Fang, and my previous ruling uh, stands. This this what, inquiry is specifically looking at the circumstances surrounding the appointment of uh, various positions. And if the, the, the opposition is suggesting mm. there may have been uh, uh, favours done or connections between the Liberal and National Party, and Mr Cartwright, they are very well uh, uh, able and uh, it is within the terms of reference of this committee for those questions to be asked. Continue. Let me put to you my concern, Mr Cartwright, and allow you to respond. Was this job in London the payoff for your campaign for the coalition in 2019? Oh, man, that is desperate. Yeah. Have you run out of you questions? You flogged the order. dead horse, order. haven't you? You we'll can't just you've allow got Mr. Cartwright to go on order, this. Mr. Fang. Absolutely are, nowhere. You've painted yourself I in can, your corner. We are now going to be eating into the government's time if this continues. So, Continue, Mr. Graham. Oh, well, Mr. Cartwright, sorry, it's over to you. I thought I had adequately dealt with this issue in my statement where I made it crystal clear that I have never been affiliated with any political party. I've never supported any political party. I was well and truly qualified to get this job on merit without any reference to any of the untenable things that you've just suggested, Mr. Graham. What I was known for, what I was known for was being passionate, deeply passionate about business in New South Wales, growing the economy, creating jobs, generating more taxes for the state government to be able to fund schools and hospitals and roads and, and everything else that, that is done. And I was deeply for 11 years passionate about that and was a contributor to the state of New South Wales going from the very worst performing economy in 2010, the bottom, number eight, of all the state and territory economies, it was number eight in 2010. And by working constructively with a series of governments through 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, we became the number one economy in Australia. So Mr. And Cartwright, that was something I was very proud of. But given, it's nothing to do well, with no, politics. No, no, you've, you've tried to it's smear him, let him answer. Mr. Cartwright, given that- it's all, to do with, it's all to do with helping business to grow and, and to create jobs and to, to support our communities that's what I'm passionate about. And to suggest that I got this job because I did my job, because I headed the New South Wales Business Chamber and worked constructively to get the state of New South Wales out of the economic basket case and turn it into a strong, high-performing economy, to suggest that is offensive and I have a real problem with it. Mr Cartwright, yeah, so given you should. This right. is a smear one, campaign. One, one more this is all about Labor getting square. We'll have square. one more question from yeah. Mr Mookie, considering the interruptions earlier. Mr Mookie, the final question from the opposition. Mr Cartwright, uh, Given that if, if you're saying to us that your only motivation in 2019 was altruistic and for the interests of the members, which frankly I would expect, um, given New South Wales is again number eight and is again the <coughs> worst performing economy, are you telling us that you would run, you seriously telling us that you would run the same campaign directed this time against the coalition parties? Because if we follow the logic of what you're saying, then we would expect you to do the same. 
Uh, are you telling me it's now, given that the New South Wales economy is back to the position you allege it was in 2010, that we would that you we should trust you that you would do the same it's thing against the coalition party? Good job. Against great. Oh, 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 sorry, I might repeat the great, question because the deputy great president order, was order, great advocacy order, from the shadow Deputy this president seems not to be able to keep himself under Mr. control. Mr. Mookie, I think right? you've, you've so I might just have to repeat the question, Mr. Carr, because I'm sorry the deputy president was interfering. Sorry, are you going to use? But well, are you seriously you suggesting? In, use witch hunt in your. Are you seriously suggesting to us that we should believe you about your altruism and your desire to put the state first? Because if we would, you would run the exact same campaign today, wouldn't you? Well, he's not in business New South Wales, is he? Order, Mr Mookie, perhaps, in, perhaps instead of answering your hypothetical, because it's been uh, years since I was in charge of the New South Wales Business Chamber, so I'm not as familiar as I used to be with the moving parts that have resulted in any of the economic performance, and I suspect COVID you're, you're, had a bigger impact on New South Wales than perhaps places like Western Australia. And things like the the, uh, the change in the GST arrangements that have favoured states like Western Australia are also part of that picture. But leave to one side the fact that what you're asking is a completely hypothetical question that I have no ability to answer because I'm not involved in that process anymore. I will point out, as I pointed out in an answer at the end of the last hearing, that when the coalition government was proposing to increase workers' compensation premiums substantially... Like they are now. Um, can I, can I finish, Mr Lewis? Yes, yes, Mr Cartwright, you can. The opposition has finished all their questions and um, interjections, I hope, when, so Mr when, Cartwright. When the government in New South Wales was proposing to substantially increase the workers' compensation premiums, which we estimated if those <coughs> premium increases had gone ahead would cost 12,000 jobs across the New South Wales economy, we did run a campaign against that change, which demonstrated beyond any doubt that... The New South Wales Business Chamber is an apolitical organisation that will always argue for the best interests of business, their employees and the state of New South Wales. Perhaps that's a better way to answer your question, Mr Mookie. Thank you, Mr Cartwright. We are now going to questions from the government, if they have any. Mr Barton. Well, Martin. Madam Chair, I don't think there's too much more to add or to ask. I mean, we've just seen the line of questioning. Quest questions, not comments, though. You're going oh, to a well, question? Well, are you, you cannot be serious, Madam Chair. I've just started. Okay, when you Five said there's not too much to ask, ask, I assumed you were about to comment. So please Don't go to your questions. given them free reign for 20 minutes on old history. The Labor Party's upset because they lost in 2019 and Business New South Wales might have been upset. Order, Mr Martin, if you could just Let ask him your ask question. His question. I assumed Chair. you were well, going to provide a professor. comment. Yes, Mr Paul. Now who's running defence? <laughs> and Mr. don't forget Jenny West applied after applications closed. Does the government have questions? Yes. yes. Point of order. If, I can, if I'm able point, to I've get my order. first one out. Hello. Yes, sorry, Ms Sharp on a point of order. Which... Okay. I know that the government's upset. They've got 15 minutes to ask questions to Mr Cartwright, who's well, been we very don't forthcoming have in relation anymore. to his answers. It's not an opportunity yes, for yeah. them to provide ongoing commentary about how they feel the questioning went or how they feel the hearing is going. Okay. Um, I'd ask them to ask the questions that they're entitled to do and they've got 11 minutes. Thank you, uh, Ms Sharp. I'll go back to Mr Martin. Apologies I, I interrupted too soon, uh, you, Taylor. I did think you were just going to provide a comment, but now that you're going to ask a question, that is a relief. If you could please proceed. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, <clears throat> given the last 15 minutes we heard from the Honourable John Graham, Mr Mookie, um, in regards to the 2019 campaign, a whole range of things happened. Effectively, they've bailed the cat here. This is what this inquiry, had, the reason why it's dog-legged away from the New York posting and into the London posting. Mr Cartwright, thank you for your evidence this morning. Um, is there anything that's been raised this morning that you wish to go back to, particularly given that I don't believe you're able to answer, to finish off all of your answers this morning? Is there anything you'd like to revisit? Uh no, only to say that I would take everybody back to my original statement that I provided at the beginning of the first hearing as my um, evidence um, that, that, that I still stand by, I still rely upon. I don't believe um, uh, that there has been any evidence led in this hearing so far which justifies a conclusion that I was appointed other than on merit. Um, you've heard from Mr Pratt that that was the case. You've heard from Mr Reardon that that was the case. You've heard from Mr Warwick Smith that that was the case. Was I referred into the process by the Deputy Premier? Yes. Um, but beyond that point, it was a competitive process. I won the position on merit. 
Uh, I have built a great team over here and we are going to deliver for New South Wales. That's already happening now. And, uh, and I, I am at a loss to understand um, what else I can tell this committee other than the fact that, that, that I have given the evidence um, that I've been asked to provide. Thank you. Deputy President. Uh, I just wanted to give you the opportunity um, to clarify some of the uh, points that were raised initially in the questioning uh, around the arrangements that uh, you sought uh, post your arrival in uh, the UK uh, and how other jurisdictions perhaps uh, handle issues such as uh, the way that uh, rents for properties uh, and schooling are handled. Um, could you just detail quickly how um, some of the other Australian jurisdictions, both state and federal, um, handle them and, and how that differs to what New South Wales had in place and what it was that you were seeking? Um, so my information comes from some conversations that I've had with um, uh, senior trade officials at a Commonwealth and, and state level in other jurisdictions, um, but also uh, some work that was done by Ms Bell um, on a benchmarking report, um, which gathered that information in a more formal way. Um, and I could summarise it this way. Um, if you take the Commonwealth, um, it's quite common for the circumstances of the senior trade official to be taken into account when constructing the salary package arrangements. And so, uh, for example, one senior trade official in London who had three children um, was uh, provided with a, uh, a, a substantial family home to accommodate the family. Uh, and my understanding is that the uh, the the the, uh, the monthly rental for that would run to about sixteen thousand dollars a month, something in that order, um, as well as uh, school fees at a private school for three children. Again, you're probably talking there about uh, fifteen to eighteen thousand a month for those. That's thirty-four thousand just for those two benefits. Um, that's way way more than I clear. Um, so what I'm saying to you is that although the base salaries for these positions may be um, lower, um, the, uh, the, the Commonwealth and some of the other states accommodate the requirements of living in an, in an offshore post by, by recognising that uh, families have to relocate. They, they don't get the option of sending their children to government schools because you, you simply won't get the kids into government schools over here. There's a waiting list. So you have to go to private schools and private schools are about twice, they cost about twice what they cost in, in Sydney. So um, the Commonwealth take care of that. In the state jurisdictions, um, there is one state that provides their agent general with a home, which if it was rented would be probably more than the, than the Commonwealth officials. Uh, they also provide school fees at private schools and they provide a vehicle um, as well. Uh, I wasn't permitted to bring my own vehicle, but other states provide their agents general with vehicles. Uh, and so, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the rents are paid for directly um, as, and, and in one case, there is actually a, a, a substantial apartment in a very salubrious suburb that is provided free of charge to the Agent General as well. Now, New South Wales used to have one of those apartments, but we sold it about 30 years ago when, when we, we pulled out of the UK. So um, it's, it's, it's very common for those jurisdictions to recognise that the cost of accommodation and school fees is something that uh, that the people posted to London need help with. So the inference that what um, that seeking these things is unique to your position and unique to your circumstance isn't supported by the provisions that are provided by other jurisdictions. Is that a fair uh, summary of uh, your last piece of evidence? Yes. And is it fair to say that um, given that the other jurisdictions uh, are prepared to package these uh, uh, entitlements into um, uh, into, in such a way that it doesn't um, uh, impact on uh, your agreed package, um, but is uh, taken up by the uh, the state government. Uh, 
the the inference that you've um, offloaded uh, the taxation um, impacts onto the state government um, is not recognising the fact that other jurisdictions would also carry the same uh, implicate tax implications as well from the same packages that they offer. Would that be a fair assumption? Certainly the state governments would. I don't know what arrangement um, the uh, Commonwealth Trade Agency has with the Commonwealth Office of Taxation. I have no idea whether, whether um, fringe benefits tax or, or other like taxes are, how they're treated at a Commonwealth level. Uh, but, but at the state uh, jurisdiction, I, I, yeah. at the state the, jurisdiction, the state jurisdiction absolutely would. Yes. Yeah. And could you just briefly outline the difference between uh, the New South Wales office and perhaps some of the other state offices, and <clears throat> as to how many staff they have and the um, support that's provided? Uh, so we are potentially around the middle. Um, uh, there, there's a, at least two states that have more people than we do here. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of states that have around the same size team as we do here and one I think that's smaller. Um, and then um, there's, a, there's a ramping up happening in Europe at the moment. At the moment we have two staff, one in Berlin, one in Paris. Um, most of the other states have some people in Europe, but the Victorians are actually ramping up quite hard in Europe now and getting bigger over there as well. Okay, so uh, the inference that's uh, been put forward by uh, the opposition that uh, this is somehow a um, a jaunt, uh, you know, a favour given to you, uh, what belies the the evidence, which is that um, other states are uh, operating offices of much equal or, or greater size in order to leverage off the trade uh, situation uh, in Europe and the UK? There is, a, there is a shared belief amongst the other states of Australia that um, the AUKUS agreement, the Space Bridge agreement, the FinTech Bridge agreement and the Free Trade Agreement, uh, as well as the potential Free Trade, mm. trade Agreement with Europe and the future developments of green hydrogen and critical minerals uh, opportunities in, in Europe are so big that they are investing uh, very heavily in supporting their agents general uh, in this part of the world. We're talking about a region with 600 million people. We're talking about a region going through substantial energy transition and New South Wales could be a big player in relation to satisfying a lot of those needs if we are allowed to get on with winning those opportunities. The opposition have said that they will um, abolish these positions uh, should they win the election. Could you just quickly outline what risks that would put to New South Wales and the economy uh, should we not have uh, trade uh, positions overseas to leverage our position? I've been instructed, um, Mr Fang, that I'm not supposed to comment on policy uh, Matters. No, no, that's uh, that's fair. Um, well, okay, then I'll I'll, I'll accept that, and uh, I'll I guess I'll just put one final question to you, um, if that's right, Mr. Cartwright. Cartwright. We're very happy for Mr. Cartwright to do so. Order, order. One final no, no, no. question. I just, I just, I just, heard I just, Mr. just wanted to know. I just to know what the risks were. Let's just were go with that one elected, final question, okay. Mr. Fang. If we could focus and have some uh, discipline in these proceedings, that would be that great. Would be nice Mr. Start. Fang, your final question. Thank is you, um, Mr. Cartwright. Um, We've heard from the opposition questioning today that uh, they believe that you were provided uh, the role, I guess, as a reward for uh, your 2019 campaign. I guess the, uh, the counterpoint to that is that um, this witch hunt which has been occurring is perhaps the opposition's way of getting back at you for, um, you know, running a, a, a you know, reasonably successful campaign against their lack of business acumen in 2019. Do you think that that's a possibility at all? Some of the comments that have been made in the media um, uh, certainly go to that suggestion and there are direct quotes from members of the New South Wales opposition that seem to indicate um, in the media that this is a line of uh, uh, questioning um, that supports that view. Um, uh, I will simply say that I stand on the record of 11 years acting in a very apolitical way, very passionate about getting involved in making sure that New South Wales has the best possible policies to support business growth and economic economic growth and job creation. Always very passionate, 
always prepared to go out and say those things, uh, but always apolitical, never told voters who they should vote for, simply educated the voting public on the competing policies and let the voters decide who should be elected as the government of this state. Um, if, if I'm being now punished for that, then what that's suggesting is that I shouldn't have done my job when I was the CEO of the New South Wales Business Chamber. I should have uh, not said anything, not done anything, not worked constructively with the various governments to, to repair and, and rebuild the economy of New South Wales, that I should have simply hidden away so that in the future I, I, it couldn't be questioned as to, as to whether I should or shouldn't get a job like this. Um, I think one of the things I would suggest to the opposition is that people who run unions get appointed to these kind of roles all the time uh, and nobody ever suggests that it's a, a reward for the fact that they were running unions and doing their job as head of the unions. I find it offensive that this has been suggested. Um, I got this job based on merit. Everybody, all the evidence has said that. Uh, and there is there is there is no evidence to suggest that this is somehow a reward for 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 me doing my job as head of the peak business organisation in 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 the state of New South Wales. I was very proud of my record. I worked very constructively to help New South Wales recover and rebuild. We created tens of thousands of jobs as a result. And I'm a little offended. I have to tell you that there's there's an attempt to smear um, the appointment that I have uh, had to this role by suggesting that it's somehow a, 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 a doing a favour or jobs for mates. It, it cannot be said that that is so. Thank you, Mr Cartwright. You'll be uh, pleased to know you have the last word here because we are now uh, out of time, even though I'm sure there would have been uh, more questions to you after that. But thank you uh, so much for, again, you know, for appearing a second time. We really do appreciate you making yourself available for this committee, also recognising the time difference once again for you. So thank you, Mr Cartwright. Uh, the committee will, secretariat will be in touch with any questions uh, you have taken on notice and with any supplementary questions that members may have. Uh, the committee will now break and we will be back at 11.15.
Okay, I'll now welcome our next witness, uh, Mr. Uh, Bran Black. If you could please state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation. Uh, certainly, uh, Branwell Taliesin Inigo Black. If you I'm could just the, move the uh, microphone a little bit closer, closer to you as well, please. Yeah. Branwell Taliesin Inigo Black. I'm the Premier's Chief of Staff and I'll take the oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me should be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much, Mr Black. Now, do you have any opening statement that you'd like to make for the committee? No. Okay. We'll proceed straight to questions then from the opposition. Mr Daniel Mockey. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Mr Black, for your appearance this morning. Um, we do appreciate it. It's a pleasure. And uh, I just want to be very clear at the outset to say, uh, firstly, uh, we're very respectful of the position that you hold. And we certainly have no inferences and no inferences are being made about you at all in your respect, but it's more a case of the role that you performed as a staff member for the Treasurer, just to be very clear and upfront from the outset. I just wanted to be very clear about that before we get I'll going. Ask you Thank you, Mr. Woody. Um, but equally, it is the case that perhaps we, we are have invited you today to give evidence because the Premier has declined. Uh, is there any particular reason you're aware of as to why the Premier has declined? Well... I would say that there are ample opportunities to ask the Premier questions. Firstly, he's appeared Mr. before Mr. Blake, do you mind just moving the microphone forward? Forward? Forward, yeah, yeah, yeah. closer. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, he's appeared before budget estimates. He answers in the ordinary course about six questions in question time. You have opportunities to ask him a question on notice and he stands up in front of the media approximately four times a week. So I think accountability is an issue. Uh, it's not because he is making himself absent. I appreciate that, Mr. Black. Mr. Mulkey, well. you might want to also yeah, I will do that too. Microphone um, closer. <laughs> uh, Mr. Black, just first some preliminary questions. Um, what's your your current position is chief of staff to the premier? That's correct. And you've been chief of staff to the premier since the premier became the premier. That's correct. And prior to that, what was your role? I was chief of staff to the treasurer. And when did you become chief of staff to the treasurer? 18 January 2000 uh, uh, 2021. 18 January 2021, and prior to that, what were you doing? I worked with the then Premier, um, uh, Berejiklian, as her Director of Cabinet and Legal um, uh, from, as I recall, the 19th of December 2019 until the, uh, uh, the 18th of January 2021. Okay, and uh, just, just to be clear, there'll be questioning which covers your tenure as... Chief of Staff to the Premier, and there'll be uh, questioning which covers your tenure as Chief of Staff to the Treasurer, just why it's important to just delineate the dates here. Uh, but can I just ask you for your basic job description as Chief of Staff to the Treasurer? Uh, well, I, in, in the ordinary <coughs> course, as a Chief of Staff, you um, uh, have, uh, I guess, overall responsibility for uh, uh, the conduct of the office. What does that entail? Well, it entails lots of different things. What in particular are you concerned with? Uh, it's more your general duties. Uh, I mean, uh, only because there's no defined job description uh, for a chief of staff. As is always the case, different ministers have chief of staffs do different things to suit them. So I'm just asking you for your general duties, other than obviously you are the chief of staff, responsible for staff. But from a day-to-day -day perspective, uh, as to the Treasurer at the time, um, what was your responsibilities? Well, I think um, it's reasonable to say that as a Chief of Staff in any office, you're responsible for um, the overarching policy, media, um, uh, strategic work that happens within that office. Okay. Did you, I presume you interacted regularly with the Treasurer? Yes. Daily? Yes. <coughs> I presume as well that you interacted uh, equally with the Premier's, sorry, the Treasurer's policy team at the time? Yes. And the media team and the like? How big is the office at the time, by the way? I can't recall the size of the office at the time. I think it was probably would have had um, somewhere between 10 to 15 staff. Okay, so it's... Standard office. Standard office choice. size, yeah. Okay, yeah. A little, a little bit larger because um, the Treasurer was the lead of the Treasury cluster. Yep. 
so there are additional staff allocated to account for that position. And you would have interacted with the public service, correct? Correct. How often would you interact with the public service? Daily. And who would you interact with? It would depend on the circumstances. I would most regularly interact uh, at the time, if, if we're talking about the time that I was Chief of Staff to the Treasurer, uh, with the Secretary of the Treasury, and in addition to that, with the Deputy Secretaries from Treasury. Okay. And the Secretary of the Treasury at the time being Mr Pratt? Correct. And what, you'd interact with him weekly, at least? Daily. But would you have a weekly standard meeting? Of yes, I would. Yeah. And that's standard across most departments. There's nothing exceptional about that. That's fair, Mr Black? I think what relationships occur as between chiefs and departmental secretaries um, varies across different offices, but my standard practice has always been to have uh, a weekly one-on-one -on -one with uh, the department and uh, myself. Okay, so a weekly one-on-one -on -one with the department as the secretary and yes, the deputy sorry, secretary? Yes, just, sorry, just with the secretary. Okay, so it was just a one-on-one -on -one with you and the secretary on a weekly Correct. basis? Did you also attend meetings between the treasurer and the secretary as well? <coughs> yes. And were there any standard or fixed meetings akin to a week-to-week -week meeting that you attended? Yes. Did, okay. And so there's two sets. There's your interactions as well. And then what would you have weekly meetings with the deputy secretaries as needed or...? I think from memory that I had a monthly uh, meeting between myself and the deputy secretaries sure. uh, within Treasury. So as a collective? Correct. As an executive. I think the term was a Treasury executive. At the time. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. That's helpful. Um, so you'd interact with the public service. Would you assist the Treasurer in the preparation of correspondence? Not in the ordinary course, no. Would you see correspondence that the Treasurer would issue? It would depend on the nature of the correspondence. But it's common that certain correspondence would be brought to your attention if they've, someone felt it was necessary for you to see it? I think the second part of your statement there is the pertinent point. If somebody thought it was sufficient yeah. for it to be brought to my attention, yes. Okay. And would the same apply to briefs that come from the department? As in, would you see all briefs that the Treasury would be sending to the Treasurer prior to the Treasurer seeing it or concurrently no. with the Treasurer seeing it? No. So the Treasury had the opportunity to give briefs directly to the Treasurer without your knowledge? No. Uh, we had and still have a process within our office whereby briefs would come via the department to the DLO stationed in our office. Uh, that DLO would assign the brief to the relevant policy advisor uh, and that policy advisor would in turn um, make a call as to whether or not the brief required input from a more senior member of staff, um, whether or not it could go back to uh, the agency um, or whether indeed it should go directly to the then treasurer. So no brief got to the treasurer without that process being undertaken to the best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Okay, <clears throat> and then what, if a DLO, you mean department liaison officer? Correct. And just in respect to policy advisors who would inspect the document at first instance, if they felt it was necessary for your attention, they draw it to your attention? Yes. And so you're... Well, not necessarily directly to me at first. Uh, you would, in the ordinary course, expect that a policy advisor um, might raise it with the policy director um, at first instance. And then if necessary, it might go on to me um, or it might in turn go on to the Treasurer directly. Okay. And what uh, how, was that a routine thing that happened or was it exceptional? What Was what a routine thing? As in people would draw matters to your attention prior to going to your <coughs> policy advisors, uh, <coughs> take it to your policy director who'd bring it to you or...? I, I think the, the, the process was reasonably clear and remains clear that um, briefs go first to the policy director if there is a need for higher input um, before going on to uh, the Premier or the Treasurer. Um, and uh, that was certainly the case when I was Chief of Staff to the Treasurer. Okay, but was that a common occurrence that people would feel that some, there was a matter of sufficient importance that had to be drawn to your attention? Yes, I believe yeah. so. Yeah, and look, to be fair to you, Mr Brown, you were, you were responding at a time during COVID, so I mm. imagine there was quite a few. There were uh, lo lots of issues to deal with, yes. Indeed. And just in respect, so you were assisting the, the, the Treasurer in the preparation of briefs. What about what, what role did you play in Cabinet submissions? In Cabinet submissions? Yeah. It depended on the nature of the submission and it depended on 
um, really what the Treasurer's priorities were. So as you'd appreciate, the role of a Chief of Staff includes taking um, uh, carriage and responsibility for those matters that are top of mind of highest importance for the Minister. So uh, to the extent that there was a matter uh, to be put forward to Cabinet um, or that was being considered by Cabinet that fell within that category, then yes, I would be involved in that. And how would you know what, the, what was a matter of importance to the Treasurer? Based on discussions that I had with him. Sure. And so you said there's dependent on. Uh, so do you want to take me through those dependencies? Matters that were of high interest to the Treasurer, how would they happen? And matters that were of low interest to the Treasurer, how would they happen in so far as it involves you? Well, in the ordinary course, um, uh, the Treasurer doesn't tell me things that don't matter to him. Um, he Sorry. tells me <laughs> what's important to him uh, and what his priorities are. And then um, as part of my role, I make sure that we can, um, as best as possible, deliver on them. And so what does that mean in practical terms? If the Treasurer indicates to you that a matter or a subject matter is of high interest, you, you would take an interest in the matter itself, I presume? Indeed. And you'd be assuming that, that you'd be at least acquainting yourself with the view as to whether or not the submission is in line with what the Treasurer expected or what the Treasurer did not expect, presumably. That's a basic judgment you'd reach? Agreed. And then presumably if you find yourself in a situation where a cabinet submission wasn't to the Treasurer's liking, you would discuss it with the Treasurer at least? Uh, either I would or somebody um, else senior in the team would do that. Okay. Just in terms of, can you take me through, what role did you play in terms of interactions with other ministerial officers as Treasurer's Chief of Staff? Again, it depended on the circumstances. I would, I would speak to other ministerial officers uh, on a daily basis, depending on the issue. But the Treasurer also would um, also jump on the phone and talk to ministers as well in parallel if he felt that that was a better way of handling an issue? <clears throat> well, he, he certainly spoke with other ministers. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, well, yes, he would absolutely be speaking with other ministers. That's what other minister, That's what ministers do. So in the event that there was a position that the Treasurer uh, did not favour that was being brought to the Cabinet, he would at, what, he'd, he'd go onto the phone or he'd leave it to you or he'd I can't speak to that. above? I mean, in relation to an issue that was brought to my attention, yep. then I would deal with it, but I can't speak to the, the point that you're making in relation to how the Treasurer might deal with an issue. Okay. But would, did you witness or ever provide him advice to that effect or not? To what effect? He should go onto the phone with ministers and talk through issues that are in Cabinet if it's not to his liking. I have given advice to the Treasurer previously with respect to the need to speak to his colleagues on certain points, yes. Okay, has that process that we just went through, actually before I do that, um, I presume you assisted the Treasurer and the Treasurer's office in terms of meeting requests and others? Yes. And in terms of identifying what meetings the Treasurer should be at or not at, correct? Yes. And that included with public liaising with the public service when the public service is requesting meetings. <coughs> Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. And as in respect to the description of the sort of the correspondence function, the meeting function, the brief function, the cabinet submission process, has there been anything dramatic that's changed uh, day to day from the treasurer to the premier, other than the obvious fact that he's now the premier and he chairs the cabinet? Uh, other than the um, other than the, uh, the the nature of the work, which is obviously expanded in scope process remains substantially the same. Okay, thank uh, you. Can I just, um, I might pause there on the process issues and then before we get to some other. Is that all good? Yep, great. Uh, Mr. Uh, Black, were you one serving with Premier Berejiklian involved in the development of a global New South Wales strategy? No. Okay, uh, and so when you became involved with the global New South Wales strategy, you became aware of it, it was because you became the Chief of Staff to the Treasurer, correct? I wouldn't say that I was involved in the Global New South Wales strategy, but yes, I became aware of it when I was Chief of Staff to the Treasurer. Okay, and at this point in time, uh, the strategy was being developed by the Treasury, was your understanding? That was my understanding, yes. And uh, that was your understanding from January 21, you said you started? Was it immediately, did you come to understand this or? I don't think it was immediately. When I um, first started working uh, as Chief of Staff to the Treasurer, I had um, meetings individually with the Deputy Secretaries, um, one of whom was Jenny West, 
and I think she might have brought that to my attention at that, uh, but I can't remember when that meeting took place. Um, it would have been relatively early in the piece, but I dare say it probably wasn't January or or, or even February. Okay. Uh, do you recall, I'm just going to ask you <clears throat> to give us your best recollection of the initial briefing you got from Miss West about the global New South Wales strategy and specifically where, global, where the Treasury was up to in the recruitment of both the, the Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner to Japan and the Agent General Senior Trade Investment Commissioner to the United Kingdom. I honestly couldn't give you a recollection of that conversation. Okay, did, did uh, nothing at all? No. Okay, um, uh, so just some very specific. Did Miss West provide you any advice at all about where the recruitment process was up to? No, not that I recall from Miss West. From she may else? have. I just don't remember. That's fair, Mr. Platt. Um, but do, <coughs> do you recall anyone else giving you such advice? The only advice that I recall receiving in relation to the recruitment process was, um, uh, um, I think uh, Mr. Pratt may have raised with me um, at some point reasonably early in um, my time working for the Treasurer that he had, um, uh, through the Treasury, um, identified a candidate for the for the for the uh, for the UK role. Um, uh, beyond that, I don't really recall. Do you recall Mr. Pratt disclosing to you who that candidate was? I, I dare say he did, but uh, it didn't it didn't register with me at the time. And but for this committee's work, I wouldn't know um, who that person's name was. No. Uh, fair enough. And, and um, when did that disclosure? That was about to say. Occur, yeah. the, quite a, I will ask you to search your recollection, um, Mr. Black, but do you, can you recall when Mr. Pratt would have disclosed this to you? No, I don't. Or what I what I do remember in that regard is that um, there was uh, an initial conversation with Mr. Pratt in which he indicated that there was, um, and this would have been, I think, I, I can't remember the actual conversation itself. Um, I just remember having the knowledge. Um, uh, but uh, as I recall, I had the knowledge of the existence of a candidate um, reasonably early in my time working for the Treasurer, and then some weeks later, um, uh, there was a further update to me to the effect that there was another candidate who was preferred for that role. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the time frame, but... That's the general nature of my recollection. But you did call that... Okay, that's actually very helpful, Mr Black. But, um, but you recall that the first... That, the, that there was a change. Yes. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to unpack that. I just want to cover off one matter because if we don't do it now, we'll have to return to it and it will create a disjointed uh, transcript, which I don't want to do. Um, and so uh, just in respect to the I decision to, to create investment in New South Wales and move it from Treasury, when did you first find out that that was taking place? Uh, the decision itself, as I recall, was made around the 20th of March. Um, there were some discussions in the mix in respect of that movement for, I think, approximately three to four weeks beforehand. I, I'd be guessing there, but that's On what basis broadly. did you say that there were some discussions? What do you mean, what basis do I say? Where did you get that information that people were discussing it? Were you party to those discussions? I was. You were? Yes. Who with? Uh, the then Premier's Chief of Staff, Neil Harley. Can you take us through that? It, it, uh, we, we sought to um, uh, retain that function within the Treasury um, and that was on the basis that uh, it, uh, it was um, an investment function um, and we put that view to uh, the Premier's office and they ultimately made a call that... Uh, the uh, trade function should move to DPC, and that's precisely what's happened. So just just look, um, thank you, um, but can I just get a bit more detail around that? So you became aware that there was a proposal to move it from Treasury? Yes. When, how did you become aware of that? I can't recall how I became aware. Okay. Um, was it, Did you tell the Treasurer? What did the I, Treasurer tell you? We obviously spoke about it. But it was, I can't recall the nature of those conversations or when they took place, mm -hmm. other than mm -hmm. as per the description that I've provided. I presume the Treasurer was also opposed to that transfer when you had those discussions with him? Initially, yes. 
Um, and uh, once the transfer was made, we moved on. Just so, again, I, I accept that the decision is announced the 20th of March or thereabouts, but do you have any recall as to when those conversations had begun? No. Okay. Um, did it... Uh, I, I will have... I accept, Mr Black, that this might not help assist, but I have to put it to you. Is there a chance that the conversation took place beyond after the 18th of February to the 20th? Sorry, I honestly couldn't say. Do you recall the Treasurer having any discussions with Minister Barilaro, who was the Trade Minister at the time, about this move? No. Do you recall... The, the Trade Minister was in the Treasury cluster at this time, correct? Correct. And <clears> the <throat> Treasury was supporting Mr Barilaro? Correct. Did you... You had conversations with Mr Harley at the time? Who... Harvey? Harley. Harley, who was... I will just refer to him now as Mr Berejik Clan's Chief of Staff. Um, do you recall having any similar conversations with the Chief of Staff at the Trade Minister's office? No. Okay, do you recall Mr Harley at all referring to... That's not to say that I didn't, but I don't recall That's any. That's fair. Um, but you don't recall Mr... Do, well, did, did Mr Barilaro, to the best of your knowledge, have? were you aware of what his position was on this proposition? No, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and in respect to the actual decision to shift it... Uh, you did you understand that this was a proposal that came from DPC itself? Uh, that was my understanding. Yeah, and was that uh, and you made the point that this was a, a decision that ultimately belonged to the Premier, but it was one that the Treasurer preferred not happen. That's correct. Correct. But you never discussed it with Mr. Pratt. I'm sure I must <clears throat> have, but I can't recall the nature of those discussions. All I can recall um, uh, is um, on one occasion. Um, raising it with um, Mr Harley and uh, um, um, we, you know, it was very clear in the conversation that the decision had been taken and um, once the decision was taken, we moved on. How many discussions did you have with Mr Harley about this matter? I can only recall one. It may have been one or two. Mm. So can I uh, just, as a result of this <coughs> decision, as you understood it, it would result in the Treasury having the transfer a lot of its staff and function across to this new agency, correct? That was your understanding? Well, the machinery of government matters were obviously a matter for the Secretary of the Department and DPC, but in a broad sense, yes, I understood that there would be some transfer of staff and function from Treasury to DPC. But equally, uh, the Treasury would cease supporting Minister Barilaro as Trade Minister and that function would be picked up by the new agency through the DPC cluster, correct? Uh, yes, I imagine that was certainly the case. I didn't really turn my mind to that at the time. Okay, but um, all right, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, can I just take you very quickly before we move on this one up? But um, this is what Mr. Pratt told us uh, that uh, the date I do, I'm just going to read from his written answer. I'm sorry I haven't got a copy for you. I can give it to you afterwards if you want. All right. It's just scribbled. Um, he goes, the date I do well remember is 8 March 2021. I was attending budget estimates with then Treasurer Perrottet when I received an email from Miss Amy Brown enclosing a brief from Miss Brown to Premier Berejiklian. The brief requested the transfer of all global New South Wales responsibility to investment New South Wales into DPC. This included all components of the strategy, people and budget. The brief had been approved by the Premier. Whilst I thought the means of communicating the transfer was somewhat unusual, i.e. no prior discussion, no meetings, no phone conversations, I respected the right of the Premier as Head of State to be the designated leader of Trade and Investment New South Wales. That's what Mr Pratt said. We did actually ask Mr Pratt about this. I don't know if you saw that evidence, but no. he was he told us that the first he became aware of it was when he was sitting there, actually, and uh, got the email while I was questioning him on other matters, which I'm sure he, he, he recalled fondly uh, as well. And then equally, he says to us, that's the first time, to best of his recollection, that the Treasurer was aware of it. But you're saying to us the Treasurer knew beforehand. I That, that sort of time... Um, aligns with my recollection, but I honestly don't recall whether or not um, uh, on that particular occasion, as in on that day, uh, it was when the Treasurer first found out um, or uh, whether or not it was beforehand. I couldn't tell you. I mean, it was... The, Can I just the, ask about that, Mr Black? I don't want me to interrupt you if you want to finish that answer. No, that's fine. Um, you've given us the date of the 20th of March. In fact, Mr Pratt's evidence is this decision had been made, the brief had been signed by the Premier on the 8th of March. Uh, does that lead to any... No, I mean, the, the, the dates themselves, I mean, I can remember now that you've put it to me, um, that Mr Pratt raised this with me um, following uh, the budget estimates hearing 
Um, I can't recall whether or not that was the first time I'd learned of it or whether it wasn't. It, as I said before, it was roughly at that early stage in the year that I became aware of the transfer. Did you Harley occur before or after that? I, couldn't I, co- I honestly couldn't recall. Well, uh, it is quite important. It's whether well, this uh, occurs before or after the brief has been signed, in effect the decision has been made. But I don't have any recollection in this regard. What I would point out, and I think this is important context, is that I mentioned before um, that the Treasurer sets out um, a series of priorities and those are the priorities that I work towards. This was never one of them. So the, the trade function was never a function that he raised with me as one that he had a particular interest or priority regarding. Um, the priorities that we had at that particular point in time were fairly and squarely the half yearly review, which um, took, uh, w- which was handed down, I think, in the later part of February, um, on or around the 25th of February. And from day one of my time working with the Treasurer, that's where my focus was. Um, there were no doubt a few other priorities that we were working towards as well. But I can honestly say that this was never on the list as one of those things that I should be giving attention to. Thank you, Mr. Pack. It becomes quite important because it's happening in parallel with what conversations we've since found out that the Deputy Premier was having with Mr. Cartwright at the same time. And this leads to a pretty significant change in who the decision-making authority is for that decision. And it also results in the departure of Mr. Barilaro from your cluster to the other cluster, which then incidentally becomes quite important later on when we get to the Cabinet submission process that took place in September of that year. So the reason we're pushing you on these dates, just so we're very upfront, there's no suggestion about you, I accept you that you had other things to, mm. to matter, but this change in governance is happening at the same time Mr Cartwright has been effectively recruited by Mr Barilaro to enter the process and there seems to be a change in governance happening in parallel. Now, look, I accept you might not be able to shed any light on that, but I just want to ask you again, do you recall having any conversations with any member of Mr Barilaro's staff no. at this period of time about this ben, change whatsoever? No. May I take a point of order on that question, Chair? Um, the inference that uh, Mr Cartwright was effectively recruited by Mr Barilaro has not been supported by the evidence. I'm sure referred, can... referred is um, perhaps just, just a better... The debating point, Chair. Well, I think it's, uh, it's putting context to the situation, Thank you, Mr. Which isn't Mr. Accurate. Fang. I'll uh, allow the member to proceed with the questions. It was uh, in order. And look, just to Mr. Black, just to cover up the contacts so you have the information. From what we can tell, the Treasury Secretary is told at eight March, but the twentieth of March data lines because that's I think where it's announced publicly. Uh, through the formation of Investment New South Wales, which incidentally is a day which a different group of Treasury officials were giving evidence in budget estimates as well, which is probably the two days as well. So, so you have the context around what that is. Um, but can I just, before I pass to my colleague, just the last... There are many budget estimates. <laughs> there is. <laughs> okay. Long may that continue. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but just in respect to... Did you recall then, presumably, the, the Treasury Secretary made it clear that he certainly uh, wasn't pleased about the decision or the manner in which he was informed uh, when he came and spoke to us a week or two ago. Uh, did you recall in any of the weekly meetings or daily interactions with him between the 8th and the 20th any specific conversations you were having with him about what the implications of this would be? No, I don't. Uh, as I... S- as I said, it was it, no doubt it was a, a matter that Mr. Pratt was exercised about. Um, he's made that plain. Um, it was not a matter that was high on my list of priorities. So um, whilst it was a matter that I raised um, with the Premier's office, uh, once it was clear that there was a decision, um, we moved on. Now, I can't recall the timing associated with those discussions, um, it may have been uh, early March, it may have been late March. I honestly couldn't tell you. Uh, you've indicated that you raised this matter once or perhaps twice with the Premier's Chief of Staff. Uh, did you raise it in strong terms or in the passing manner which your observation just now seems to suggest? I think... I, I think... I, I, no, I don't believe that I raised it in strong terms. I probably just sought from him... Um, an understanding as to why the decision was taken. I can't remember precisely what he said. Thank you. Um, 
To the best of your knowledge, did the Treasurer raise this matter with the Premier? I'm not aware. To the best of your knowledge, did your did the Treasurer raise this with the head of the department with the Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet? I'm not aware. And to the best of your knowledge, did the Treasurer discuss this with Mike Pratt, the <coughs> Secretary of the Treasury? There may look, you'd expect that there might have been some discussion um, yeah. as between them in their weekly catch up. Yeah. But beyond that, that's an that's just me drawing an inference rather than having any actual knowledge. You would expect that, which is why I ask about it. But you don't recall being party to any such discussion? No. But I, I may well have been because I was in, in, in those discussions. Um, uh, but again, I can't recall when those discussions were taking place, at what point in time. Mm -hmm. But So your evidence is really these functions, these staff, sailed from the Treasury cluster to the... Uh, Premier and Cabinet cluster really with barely a uh, murmur is really the uh, impression you're giving with this evidence. It was not strongly contested by your office or by the Treasurer. I think that's correct. Or by the Treasury. I don't know about the Treasury, um, but certainly by us we had other priorities. Yep. Mr Black, I might just take this as an opportunity to gift you some documents that we can tender right now, if you don't mind. Uh, can I um, just ask you, first instance, just in respect to, <clears throat> so I'm clear here, uh, you commenced in the role as Treasurer's Chief of Staff 18 January 2021. That was your evidence, I heard correctly? Correct. But uh, the office was obviously functioning in January that year, correct? Uh, yes, it was. I'm unsure of... I'm unsure of what the uh, arrangements were before I commenced in relation to um, uh, Christmas period. Yeah, okay. But yes, always. But fair enough. And just in, in respect to diary requests and the such, um, you would, uh, well, at first instance, it would be the case that people would just, would go to the executive assistant of the treasurer at the time, so, or if they were requesting Correct. a meeting, amongst other people, I presume? Correct. But that was a legitimate way in which people could seek a meeting? All diary requests ultimately have to find their way through um, uh, the executive assistant um, as that's the only way we can properly coordinate the diary. So you might have a... Standard office yeah. practice, yes. You might have a diary request that comes first to myself or to um, a policy advisor or somebody else within the office, but ultimately it needs to be coordinated and managed through the, um, the diary setting process. And can I just ask, if, if a person was to make a request... Um, to the EA directly for a meeting, what would then happen? Would the EA have authority to just grant them on their own volition or would they have to seek your approval, the Treasurer's approval, the Policy Advisor's approval? How does that work? In the ordinary course, um, we had a diary meeting with the Treasurer. Yeah. And uh, um, um, the great majority of meetings would be um, popped into the Treasurer's diary off the back of those discussions from time to time, there are other circumstances in which meetings would be put into his diary without having um, that direct input with him, but that's really only in a departmental context, not with externals. So it's the case of effectively the EA would prepare a log of requests uh, mm -hmm. that they bring to you Correct. and the Treasurer at the time? Yes. And what, you'd go through them and say, yes, no, maybe here's what I would like beforehand? Correct. And was it just the U3 or is there other people? Is this a... It depends. I mean, sometimes you might have um, a diary request that has come via a member of staff and in those circumstances that staff member might be invited into the meeting to um, explain why they think it's important for the Treasurer to take that meeting. Just to be very clear, this is a very important decision, like mm -hmm. allocation of ministerial time is a really important... Uh, it is. Correct? Yeah. And... It is the case that, particularly with senior members of the government, uh, it can't be treated lightly um, because the ministers' calms can't be wasted, correct? Diary management is a constant problem. 
Indeed. <laughs> and, uh, and look, I just want to be very clear, Mr. Black, what you're describing is relatively standard arrangements, correct? Mm. There's nothing exceptional about them. No. And what the frequency of this would happen roughly weekly, was it? Roughly weekly, yeah. Yeah, and, that, and I presume that this was a matter that the Treasurer took an interest in because, like any person, it's they'd be interested. Time. Yes. And so he was a presumably an active participant in it? Yes. Would he be provided prior to that weekly meeting any information about what was to come? No. So he had the opportunity to be ambushed effectively with his 30 people who'd like to see you in the next two weeks type of routine? Effectively, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure he's, he, he welcomes that as much as anyone would. He loves diary time. I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, thank you. Um, can I take you please to page seven of the tender bundle that you've just been given? I have it. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to refer to these people by their um, positions, not their names, Mr Black, just as a matter of respect for them, if you don't mind. Um, as well. Um, you can see here, this is an email that is sent on the 12th of January by the Executive Assistant to the Treasury Secretary to the person who I'm going to ask you to confirm is the Executive Assistant at the time to the Treasurer. That's correct. Thank you. And you can see here that this is a diary request. As you can see, non-urgent for your return, interview New South Wales Agent General, UK, Europe and Israel. You see the subject? Yes. And then you can see, uh, uh, hey, X, uh, I won't read you the first paragraph because it's not relevant, uh, but you can see the second. Uh, Treasury engaged NGS Global to conduct executive search for the New South Wales Agent General and the panel has now concluded the interview process and are recommending Mr Paul Webster for review and endorsement by the Treasurer. Please find attached resume of Paul Webster, job description, interview notes. Can you please let me know if the Treasurer is available to meet with <coughs> via MS Teams with Mr Webster? Mr Webster is UK-based, so hours are sometimes tricky, but Mr Webster has been very accommodating. I've included his details below, but I'm more than happy to tee this up. You see that? Yes. So you can see here just the most important part of that is sort of, I guess, two bits. The first is... Uh, the panel has now concluded the interview process and are recommending Mr Paul Webster for review and endorsement by the Treasurer, which clearly states what the purpose of the meeting would be, amongst other things, or at least an opportunity to get him to know him. And then you can see, equally, there's a request for a time for the Treasurer to meet with Mr Webster in order for, Mr. for the Treasurer to reach a view about Mr Webster's candidacy. See that? Yes. It's fair reading. Thank you. Um, what Do you recall any discussions or the Treasurer's EA about this request? No, time? I don't. Do you recall any discussions with the Treasurer about this request at the time it was received? Not at all. Okay. Do you mind going up the page? To, it's over page six and page seven. Yep. You can see that the Treasurer's EA replies two weeks later. Yes. As well. Uh, and it's on a Monday. You see that? So yes. I presume that would have been the day that the diary meeting would have taken place, start of the week. Is that a fair no. inference? No? I wouldn't infer that. The diary meeting, we pop it in when we can. Okay. But at this point as well, uh, important to bear in mind, um, by that stage, I had been working for the Treasurer for... A week. A week. I do remember that. Yeah, I was and about to say. in addition to that, um, as I recall, uh, the Treasurer had been working from home uh, for that first week. Um, so I believe on that Monday it was the first time that uh, I saw the Treasurer in the, the the office after commencing in the role. That's helpful context, Mr. Black. And I was about to say, to be very fair to you, you're one week into the job at this point in time. So it's fair to say that contextual knowledge was still perhaps being acquired. Including as to office process, yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But this, the, the Treasurer's EA presumably has been the EA for a while, correct? Yes. Okay. And so this person replies and CCs you, uh, hi, X, before proceeding, proceeding to scheduling an e-meeting between the Treasurer and Mr Webster, the Treasurer has requested a short list of the other candidates that were interviewed together with a copy of their resume. 
You, you see that? Yes. And then over the page, just to round out this email, when this info is available, could you please send to me and I'll forward it to the treasurer for his attentions? Correct. Yes. Do you believe presumably the EA was acting on... I mean, I, I can only presume the EA was not making up this request? I can only assume what's in front of me because I don't have the benefit of any recollection in that regard. I don't have yeah. a recollection of a discussion with the treasurer. I certainly don't remember having a diary meeting on um, his first day back in the office, so I can't comment. So, do you... Okay, um, so just unpacking that, you presumably... I could presume you would have registered the email, but you can't recall it until you've seen it again now? I certainly can't recall it. Yeah, fair enough. And... Uh, do you recall having any conversations with the treasurer or the EA or any policy advisor uh, at the in the office at the time about this shortlist? No. Do you know which policy advisor was managing this without having to name them? But was it a senior policy advisor? Was it the director of policy or...? It was an advisor. And yes, I do. Okay. I think that we may get to that person later, which will then have a title <clears> to refer to them. But we can just, at this point, refer to them as a policy advisor? Yep. Do you recall discussing with the policy advisor why the treasurer was interested in a shortlist? No. Okay. Um, do you know whether or not the treasurer got the short list? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, let's go up the page. If you don't mind going to page five. Actually, this is where we're going to get a bit more confused, to be fair. Uh, if you don't mind... Just gonna hold for one second, if you don't mind. Uh, by any chance, do you have a document in front of you that's labeled S1, which is outside that tender bundle? No, I don't, Mr. Mulkey, I'm sorry. That's okay, that's not your fault, it's my fault. Um, uh, yeah. Just going to ask, at this point in time, after this request is made, do you recall a policy advisor following up the request? No. Um, no recall whatsoever about the po any policy advisor on the 8th of February no. following it up? Okay. That's not to say it didn't happen. And my understanding is from the evidence that's been given before this committee uh, that it did, but I have no recollection. Okay, so let me just be very clear here on the narrative, right? Like 25th, we have a request apparently channeled from the EA to the Treasurer about the Treasurer seeking a shortlist. Um, can you turn to page four, three and four, but working back from page four of the tender bundle? Sorry, I just found it. So just on the bottom of page four, that simply identifies the sender of the email, which I think is, the, was that the policy advisor yes. you were thinking about before? So let's just refer to that person as policy advisor because mm -hmm. there's going to be two of them. So we'll call them policy advisor one, if you don't mind. Certainly. Just out of, I do want to respect their privacy. Um, but you can see that policy advisor one um, sends an email to Miss Kylie Bell and another person with the subject trade commissioners and then seeks an update. Uh, morning, Kylie and X, hoping you can provide me with an update on where the trade commissioner appointments are up to. You see that? Yes. So that's taking place two weeks after um, the treasurer has requested a short list. Uh, do you recall having any conversations with this policy advisor about the process? No. Do you have any reason to know why this person would have been doing a prompting an update at this point in time? Uh, I can only speculate. I don't know for certain. Okay. What would that speculation be? She was the policy advisor uh, responsible within the office for that particular area and she was undertaking what I would have thought to be a reasonably routine inquiry. Hmm. Okay. Were you aware at any time at this point in time, was the Treasurer meeting with the Deputy Premier at all? Uh, he, he, he would have been, yes. Do you, at any point in time, did the Treasurer in any discussion with you around this period of time reference any conversations he was having with the Deputy Premier about any matter to do with, with the stick appointments? No. Okay. You can go up to top of page three. Uh, you can just see the response that the advisor, policy advisor number one gets. And you can see here, uh, 
High X, Jenny West, our new depth sec, has been leading the interviews for the London Agent General and Tokyo stick position. Internal interviews have been completed and I believe meetings are due to be scheduled with the Treasurer soon to, be, to meet preferred candidates. Our goal is to launch our new London and Tokyo operations by July this year with the remaining hubs then scheduled over the following six months. The attached provides our current timeline. I have CC'd in Jenny so she can arrange a time to chat with you to talk you through these things in more detail. Uh, I presume that the policy advisor never shared with you that timeline? No. And not, to, did, not to my recollection. She may have, but I have no memory of that. Do you, you recall at all the policy advisor uh, registering with you um, or providing any form of an update as to where these positions were having received this advice? No. Okay. And is it possible that they would have done that with the policy director? or I don't know. Okay, um, fair enough. Now we have to go back in time. Were you off this? I just had a couple of questions on that point. On the... Going back to... Yeah, good. You, you... No, not yeah, good. Yep. Keep going. So yeah. you Don't mind the strategy sorted out for oh. this. Sorry, did you have something to say? No, I just thought you had your order, strategy sorted out. Order, order. It's, it's just ignore interjections and, and continue, Mr Mookie. Okay, thank you. Um, so... Thank you for that. If you don't mind just returning back to where we were before on page six. Yep. Yeah. Um, so where we left off, um, we were talking about the email on the 25th of January, 2021. Yep. Yes. Then you can also see, just going up the page... You can see that the Treasury Secretary's EA, uh, that she emails the Treasurer's EA and CCs you and says, Deputy Secretary Jenny West has kindly sent through the attached emails with the details from the recruitment agency, NGS Global, including the shortlist. Jenny also mentions that she's happy to discuss if she was required. <coughs> so the Treasurer's request to get the shortlist is achieved within two days. You see that? Yes. And your CC. With CC'd. Australia Day in between. Yeah, with okay. Australia Day in between. This is the, day be, the request's made the day before Australia Day at 6.19pm and it's satisfied the day after Australia Day on the 27th of January. Just for context. Yes. Do you recall seeing that shortlist? <coughs> no. I accept that the email was sent to me, but I don't recall seeing it. Do you recall discussing the shortlist at any point from then onwards to, with the Treasurer at all? No. Okay. Um, do you then, uh, just going up to the next email, <clears throat> this one is over page five and six. Nine, nine February? Yes. It's the email that commences 9 February from the Treasury Secretary's EA, 3.01 p.m. You see that one? Yes. And this time you're actually the subject of it, as in you're, you happen to be the first person addressed. Uh, I, hi, Bran. I hope this email finds you well. I just wanted to check in on my offer and assistance with getting the interview meeting in the calendar. Please let me know if there are any other details I can provide. Christine in your office has also reached out to Jenny West and Carly <coughs> Bell asking for an update on where the Trade Commissioner appointments are up to, so I just want to assure that everyone that this is in the works. Also, quick update, we have identified a preferred candidate for the North Asia role based in Tokyo and, if possible, we'd like to lock in a time for them as well. This candidate is located in Sydney, so we can hold the, the meeting in person or virtually. I'll be guided by your preference and then send through the same material. Do you recall seeing that email? No. But I, again, accept that I received it. Sure. Okay. Uh, we'll then go up in time to just the final email on page five where it says here, the Treasurer's EA responds and CCs you, hi, I will revisit the request with the Treasurer to, and brand to set up an e-meeting for the New South Wales Agent General UK, Europe and Treasury and add stick North Asia candidate to the list. So the Treasurer's EA is presumably doing what was expected of them, which was to respond, but then flags that she would revisit the request with the Treasurer and you. Do you recall the... The Treasurer's EA doing that? No. Do you recall the Treasurer's EA doing that with the Treasurer? No. Having, no. So what happened? Do you have any recall as to what happened with this particular meeting request? No, I don't. As I've said before, this just didn't register as one of our priorities at the time. And, uh, you know, when you look at the date there, the 10th of February, uh, that's two weeks before the half-yearly review 
was handed down and that was wholly and solely the focus that our office had at the point at that particular point so um, I am not surprised that I don't have a recollection of this okay um, I'm going to pause there and then there's a few other emails to do in respect to an attempt to get this meeting going um, but I might just pause to ask my colleague before we move off these particular pages yeah so just to recap on a couple of things I think you've said but it, just for clarity that um, you accept that that you don't recall but you accept that the shortlist was emailed to you indeed um, at any do you recall any reason um, why well let me put to you first you the you see that email on page six indicates that the treasurer himself requested the shortlist the wording is the treasurer has requested a shortlist of other candidates that were interviewed. You accept that's the request from the office? Uh, I accept that that's the wording, but I have no way of verifying. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't personally recall that, no. but you accept that that's the request the from the, the Treasurer's email. EA to the agency. Are you aware of any reason why the shortlist was being requested? No. The email also goes on to say, when the info is available, could you please send to me and I'll forward to the Treasurer for his attention is that I'm just interested in whether that is a usual practice. If this information came back, say the short list, would it have sorry, been... Where was, where was that? This line? is on page Hol 7, the highlighted... No, sorry. Page 7. Yes. Would you have expected the a short list such as this to be emailed straight through to the Treasurer? No. But you agree that that's what this email does say? That's what the email says. Yeah, but it would have been unusual for that to occur. Very much so. Thank you. Um, did you have any concerns when you saw this request or when you received this short list, excepting that you don't recall very much about this No, I, I don't recall having any... I don't. That's not to say that I had concerns or that I didn't have concerns. I don't recall anything in relation to this email. Why didn't you have concerns about the Treasurer personally requesting a short list for a merit selection process in the public sector. Why didn't this spark a concern? Um, he was being asked to... Well, I, I don't recall receiving this email, hmm. um, but why? you're asking me why I wouldn't be it's concerned. precisely my question. Why didn't this email, where the Treasurer personally requests a shortlist in a merit selection process conducted by the public sector, you're an experienced chief of staff, why did that not spark concerns? Why don't you recall this email? Well, there, there are a couple of points that I'd make there. Firstly, um, I don't have any knowledge at that particular point in time in relation to what type of recruitment process this is. Um, it is a recruitment process uh, that is being clearly handled by Treasury I think it's fair to assume that if uh, um, Treasury comes to the Treasurer's office with an offer to meet a candidate, then it is permissible for that meeting to be arranged mm -hmm. within the context of whatever recruitment was taking place. Mm -hmm. And equally, um, if there were a request to meet with, sorry, to uh, see a short list of other candidates, um, then uh, it would have been a matter for Treasury to say either, yes, that's permissible in the context of the process, or no, it's not. <coughs> the recruitment process wasn't being managed by us. I agree um, that the agency... The only, yep. the, what, I, what I would add is that I think these proceedings have... Um, conclusively shown that with respect to Mr Cartwright, uh, everybody involved was proceeding on the basis that it was a Cabinet appointment. Mm. I, I agree that the agency may have provided advice, but um, I'm asking, did you, why did you not develop any concerns uh, when the Treasurer personally requested this short list? But on what basis would I be concerned? So, am I right to understand, Mr Black, that your evidence is because at this time the prevailing assumption was it was a cabinet process, inevitably the Treasurer would have to give concurrence? Well, I didn't have an assumption at the time because I wasn't thinking in relation to this particular 
issue. As I've said before, it wasn't a priority. But um, what I can say is that uh, I just on the basis of what I'm reading in front of me now, that if there were a, a request for information put to Treasury, it wasn't a matter for the Ministerial Office to say, well, this, and can't, this can or can't be done in the context of public sector recruitment processes. That's a matter for the agency. Well, that may be a matter for the agency. I'm simply asking, did it catch your attention? Because in my experience, it's highly unusual to ask for a short list of candidates who have not been appointed, not I been recommended. I, I wouldn't agree with that at all in the context <laughs> of job interviews. <laughs> I'm um, concerned to hear that, Mr Blake. No, I, 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 would, I, I would think it is an appropriate thing to do if you're being presented by an individual, if you're being presented with an individual um, to ask, well, uh, um, who else was considered in this process? That strikes me as reasonably normal. But in this event, in this situation, you don't have any recall of the Treasurer acting on the information that was provided to him? No, I have no recollection. And so you have <coughs> no recollection of the Treasurer saying to you that, oh, gee, this shortlist doesn't look particularly good, I have an issue with Mr Webster? No, not at all. Do you have any recollection of the Treasurer raising with you any concerns about Mr Webster? No. <coughs> yeah, do you recall having any discussions at all with anyone in the office or the public service about Mr Webster? No. Uh, is it possible that the Treasurer is having such conversations with any policy advisor? I, I couldn't comment on that. Okay. Uh, but you accept the agent general position in UK was being recreated? Yes. And after 30 years? Yes. And in fact, that this actually was a strategy that was led by the Treasurer to yes. the three format level New South Wales. And it was one that he absorbed some public heat, to be frank, which I created for him. You That's could, decent of you. Yes. Uh, and so, but despite that, it wasn't a key priority at the time. Is that what you're saying? By the time I came into the office, yeah. it wasn't a priority. Okay. It was never on my list of priorities. But just to be very clear here, there is no recall of the Treasurer ever expressing to you any issues with Mr Webster? That's entirely correct. So do you have any reason to, or understanding at all about why this meeting with Mr Webster never happened? I think the context of the timing associated with re this request would probably give you a reasonably good um, answer. Um, specifically, no, but again, consider it in the context of the time. It was within the month prior to half-year review. But, Mr Black, doesn't that raise the question, why is the Treasurer taking time out of his busy schedule to request this shortlist if it wasn't a priority? I can't speak to whether the Treasurer made that request I can only speak to what is here in writing in front of me, but I have no personal knowledge <clears> as to whether or not that request was made. Uh, well, well just it states you, clearly here it was you, made. You, in the in weeks before the half-year budget uh, process you're referring to. No, I, I accept that. Okay. Um, fair enough. But your point is basically that there are other matters which were more urgent at the time. Correct. Okay, but in the interim period, right, between... When was the half-year budget review given that year? I believe it was the 25th of February, but if it wasn't that date, it was around that time. Fair enough. Okay. Um, can we just go forward in time on the, in the documents um, as well? If you don't mind turning to page 9. Just... And... 10. As well... Um, just to be very clear here, there is no basis mm. for any reasonable person to conclude that you should have seen this email before uh, at all. But this does give us a real insight into what Treasury's expectations were at this point in time as well. You can see here that the Executive Officer of the Office of Deputy Secretary Trade is providing an update to the Deputy Secretary around uh, where all these stick appointments are up to. And you can see here, just I'm on page nine now, um, on the email that is uh, from uh, that is sent at 12:49 p.m. on 18 February 2021. Uh, yep, yep. You can see here, hi Jenny, in your weekly update to Mike, you asked to include the below on upcoming cabinet ERC DAPCO submissions. Please note the AG and stick appointments require a set form for endorsement by cabinet and are not fully fledged cabinet submissions. To be frank, that actually aligns with what you said, Mr Black, which is what everyone has said to us, which is at this point in time, everybody thought that these were cabinet positions as well. But you can see here, 
appointment of the Agent General to the UK New South Wales Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner to the EU and Israel. You can see here that Cabinet DAPCO ER table Cabinet meeting date planned for 15 March 2021, pending candidate being endorsed by Treasurer, DP and Premier. Do you see that? Yes. And you can see that the e-Cabinet lodgement date is 1 March 2021. Do you see that? Yes. As well, if you go over the page, you can see the same applies to the stick Tokyo position. Yes. And then you can see that at this point in time, and we'll probably have to revisit this after lunch with the Americas, uh, you can mm. see that the Americas position is slated for the 10th of May 2021. Yes. yes. So just going back to the first on page nine, planned for 9, 15 March 2021, uh, had to be lodged by 1 March 2021. Now, the first thing that we have established here is that the only candidate who could have been presented to Cabinet that day is Paul Webster because Mr Cartwright is not yet in the process um, at all. He doesn't enter the process until officially 22 February, but he actually isn't interviewed until 30th March as well. I have no knowledge in that regard, but... Yeah, well, I don't expect you to, Mr sure. Black, um, to be very frank. I'm just disclosing that so you can understand the timing here. But you can clear here quite clearly the Treasury is sort of saying uh, that they need the Treasurer to weigh in on this in order to present Mr Webster's candidacy to the Cabinet. That's, a, that's how I read that as well. And then you can also see at the top, Miss West replies by going, we won't be in a position for March for the UK role. Do you recall having discussions with either Miss West or the Secretary of Treasury around the urgency of this request at all? Not at all. And do you have any, uh, between that 18 February and 1 March, any recollection whatsoever, excepting that the half year review is being given in that period of time as well? No. Do you have any recollection about any conversation with the Premier between, uh, sorry, the now Premier, then Treasurer, between 1 March and 30 March 2021? In relation to what? And to a, Mr. Webster's, a meeting with Mr Webster and or Mr Webster's candidacy? No. So I accept at this point that your earlier evidence, Mr Black, which said that this wasn't a priority at the time because of the reasons you gave um, as well. But the problem is, is that as a consequence of that inaction... <clears throat> uh, or oh, sorry, that's not the right way of putting it. As a consequence of that decision, uh, that then gives the opportunity for Mr Barillaro to invite Mr Cartwright to apply and for the process to then be reopened, which would never have been possible had the Treasurer actually met with uh, Mr Webster and it had proceeded as according to the original date as well. So I'm, I'm just asking you do, you, do you accept that as a result of the inaction of the Treasurer in meeting with Mr Webster that gave rise to the circumstances which led to the termination of Mr Webster's candidacy? I can't comment on that. I have no knowledge. Okay. So As I said, the, 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 my recollection of this matter was that at some point in the year there was a discussion with Mike, uh, with Mr Pratt, I should say, with respect to um, there being a candidate in the field who I now understand to be Mr Webster, and then some weeks later, and I can't recall how many, um, I can recall being aware of the fact that there was another candidate. And that's as far as I can recall. So how did you become aware of another candidate? Again, in a, in a, a similar uh, discussion with Mr Pratt. Mr Pratt told you? I believe that's correct, yes. And did he tell you, give you any indication as to why there was another candidate that was allowed into the process? No. Okay. And did you tell the Treasurer? Uh, it may have been in the course of, I, I can't recall, um, but it was either in one of my weekly one-on-ones with Mike or in one of the, um, the weekly Treasurer, Chief of Staff, Secretary meetings that we had, but I can't recall. I'd, all I can recall is being conscious of the fact that some weeks later there was another candidate in the mix. All right. And is Mr Pratt disclosed that to you and or the Treasurer at one of your weekly meetings? Is that... I believe that was the case. Okay, so the Treasurer was told that another candidate had entered the process. Did he raise, do you recall him raising any objections or making any inquiries about that? No. And in that point, it didn't come up that the Treasurer had asked for a short list and was apparently sent one? No. Um, so was the Treasurer at all surprised? Do you recall any surprise? No, I, I, don't recall, I, I don't recall reaction one way or the other. Okay. Can I ask, in respect to the North Asia position... Uh, 
the treasurer did end up meeting with the treasurer with the candidate who was successful, did he not? I understand he did. And how did that meeting happen when the other one couldn't? I did, can't comment on that. Okay, so if you turn to page 13. You can see that this is a, um, it's to do with, well, the best evidence we have available to us is that it's an email which is actually about uh, the Japan position. Um, and you can see that it certainly says here, I can confirm the preferred candidate has met with the DP and the treasurer. And the only person that we're aware of who's in any of these positions who's ever met with a DP, with a treasurer, is a stick uh, North Asia position. Just, is that, do you recall the treasurer meeting with any of the other candidates for any other positions? Not that I recall. Okay. So that's happened to have done by the 6th of April uh, as well. And I haven't bored you with all the logistical emails that were being organised in respect to organising that Japan meeting. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> it's a... Uh, any time, Mr. Black, I'm here to help. Um, it's, so, but can you give us shed any light in how it's possible that the Japan candidate goes forward but Mr. Webster does not? Uh, I, I, apologies, I, I honestly can't. Fair enough. I don't um, recall. Uh, fair enough. Um, just going back then to the page on the 9th of that, uh, turning back to page 9, sorry, if you don't mind. So this email, this update that is provided to Miss West is on the 18th of February. Uh, we then have evidence from Mr Cartwright and I'm just going to read you from his opening statement. I don't know if you had an opportunity to view any of Mr Cartwright's evidence at this hearing today or earlier. Uh, have you? Or I've, I've seen some. Yeah. But Let me just read not. you the pertinent matter um, here. He, he says, on 17 February 2021, I attended a coffee meeting which had been requested by the then Deputy Premier John Marillaro. The Deputy Premier had asked me if I could introduce him to a board member from the New South Wales Business Chamber. After that board member left us, the Deputy Premier asked if I might be interested in the UK Agent General role. I was taken by complete surprise by his question because I had not heard much about the role since it was announced by Premier Peter Clinton in 2019 of the Global Strategy Announcement. Um, that's what he says then. He then goes on to say, during the conversation, the Deputy Premier asked me what package I had been on at the chamber and I told him that my base was about 650k and that for the past few years, my annual bonuses had been about $150,000, i.e. a total of about $800,000. The Deputy Premier then said that the New South Wales government would probably be offering a base in the low fives plus the <coughs> usual support for offshore trade roles such as the payment of rent and school fees. He said that the government was keen to attract high calibre people from the private sector who understood business and trade and were passionate about New South Wales who knew how to get business deals done. Um, just so you know... He then also goes on to say on the, he met again with the Deputy Premier on the 18th of February. I met the Deputy Premier in his office at Parliament House and I told him that I was interested in the role. He then made it clear during the meeting that he would immediately let the external recruiter know of my interest and that there was an established independent recruitment process to be followed and that he was not uh, have any further involvement in the process. I might just leave the excerpt from Mr Cartwright's statement there and just ask you, were you aware that the Deputy Premier was engaged in such activities? No. Was it appropriate for the Deputy Premier to be engaged in such activities? I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment in that regard. That's not well, for me. Was it you, I accept that, Mr Black, but was that your understanding of what the leeway was available to a minister at the time? Again, I don't think it's appropriate as a member of staff to provide comment in relation to the appropriateness of what a minister is or isn't doing. Okay, so were you aware at all of the, any disclosure by the Deputy Premier to the Treasurer about uh, his... Uh, efforts with Mr Cartwright? No. Uh, are you aware of any disclosure between any member of Mr Barilara's staff and your and this office that you led? No. <clears throat> and so and heretofore you never heard that this conversation had taken place? I've obviously read about these conversations or um, uh, Mr Cartwright's evidence in the context of these committee hearings, but otherwise no. Okay. And do you have any, just again, do you, you don't have any recall of Mr. Ba of talking with Mr. the Treasurer about any conversations he was having 
<coughs> with Mr. Barilaro about the UK and or other stick positions between January and February of that year? Uh, I couldn't, again, I, I certainly couldn't be clear on dates, but as a broad proposition, I don't recall discussions in relation to this matter. Okay. So, Mr. Cartwright <coughs> has <coughs> provided a written account of his conversation, uh, which was far more contained perennious than the one that he gave us at the hearing. And to be fair to him, it was his best endeavours to recollect it uh, as well. But he actually did provide written and uh, further written evidence about this in, uh, well, sorry, a further email to the recruiter on the 31st of March 2021, which aligns with what he says there, but perhaps doesn't give the full picture. Because on the 20, on 31st March 2021, he's emailing the recruiter. And just to be clear to you, Mr Bra uh, Black, so you have an idea of where in time, the events this is taking place. Mr Cartwright is interviewed on the 30th of March. He's <coughs> offered the job on the evening of the 30th of March and then can negotiations commence on the 31st of March about his package that he should get paid. He says this... 9.47am. He says this, when the Deputy Framer first asked me to consider the role back in early Feb, he and I had a very open and frank discussion about my circumstances. I, I've been on a package of over 800k for some years and made financial commitments accordingly. And about his view that the current package on offer was not attracting the right calibre of candidate. Uh, apart from improving the base package, he mentioned low fives. He indicated privately, of course, <clears throat> that he and the Treasurer had reached an agreement that the cost of suitable family accommodation in an inner suburb of London uh, could be taken care of by the New South Wales government outside of the salary package. Uh, he also suggested that given I had kids in school here and an elderly parents who recently moved to be close to, I should propose how I believed I could make it work. Uh, his parting words, I, 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 I'm just not gonna read you the next two sentence, but he then goes on to say his parting words were, you come back and tell us how it can be made to work for you uh, as well. Um, firstly, were you aware that, I presume you were not aware, Mr Blatt, that, that Mr Barilaro was going into this deep level of detail? That he was going into what, sorry? This level of detail and the conversations he was having with Mr Cartwright? Well, I wasn't aware of any of those discussions. Fair enough. Um, and equally, uh, can I ask you as well, did you ever have any discussions with the Treasurer about such an arrangement? No. Mr Cartwright has told us now on two separate instances he's affirmed that this is what he was told by the Deputy Premier, <clears throat> that there was an arrangement uh, with the Treasurer. And in fact, he affirmed it again this morning as well, uh, that the Treasurer and the Deputy Premier had reached this arrangement uh, as well. He hasn't shifted. And to be very fair to Mr Cartwright, he's been consistent with that version of events mm. as well. Uh, was the Treasurer having meetings with the or discussions with the Deputy Premier about this in isolation from other ministers, to your recollection? Not to my knowledge. So do you have Mr Mookie, that's, we'll, we'll break there if that's okay. So uh, uh, it's 12.30, which means we are uh, at a lunch break for until 1.30. <coughs> so we'll come back then. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. you.
Welcome back, uh, Mr Black. Hope everybody had a good lunch. We will now go straight to questions from the opposition again. Um, <coughs> Mr Black, prior to lunch, we were just asking you about whether you had any recollection um, of any conversations with the Treasurer um, to do with the uh, conversations he may have had with Mr Barilaro. And I think you were off the point you had none. That's correct, yes. Um, and we will, <coughs> I'll move on from this pretty quickly, but I was just going to say, is there any, uh, uh, in respect to the Treasurer's engagement with the shortlist process and with the Webster meeting, I presume he made no reference to any conversations he was having with Mr Barilaro? No. So I ask you again, um, before I pass to my colleague, if he's got any more on this particular matter, which is, do you have any explanation for why or how Mr Webster was removed from the process? Um, no, I don't. And uh, uh, Do you mind moving the microphone forward again, Mr Black? Sorry about that. No, I don't. As I said before, the only recollection I have, and it's really not a, a question of timing, was being aware at one point in time that... Um, there was a preferred candidate who I now understand to be Mr Webster in the role and then subsequently also being aware that there was a new candidate um, uh, in, in the role. But I couldn't tell you the, the, the timing between those two recollections. Yeah, and you did recall that this was disclosed to you and the Treasurer at a meeting with Mr Pratt by Mr Pratt? I believe that's the case. I couldn't say definitively, but I believe that's your best that was the case. Yep. Yep. And just in respect to that, did Mr Pratt tell you at the time that Mr Cartwright was recommended into the process by the Deputy Premier? No, not that I recall. And I, Mr Black, I think you've really covered this um, in some of your answers, but just for clarity, you don't have any awareness or any understanding of the nature of the agreement that Treasurer Perrottet may have reached, suggested by the Deputy Premier to Stephen Cartwright about how the cost of suitable family accommodation might be dealt with, how the cost of school fees might be dealt with in the remuneration relating to the agent general position. No, no Thank knowledge you. in that regard. Uh, Mr Black, just before we move beyond the agent general position, uh, do you mind... Let's go forward in time to the point where you are... Uh, <clears throat> well, the Treasurer is now the Premier and you're now the Premier's Chief of Staff, which is from recollection October 4 onwards, wasn't it, or October 5? That's correct. And uh, do you, at that point in time, as be the change in function that ensues is that you, of course, well, the Premier, of course, becomes the employer of all departmental secretaries, that's correct? That's my understanding. And in practice, it's delegated to the Secretary of DPC? That's also my understanding. But it's routine, is it not, for department secretaries to uh, either con well, contact you should they feel that there's a matter which requires the Premier's uh, office's attention? Yes, it does happen. Uh, in the ordinary course, it's the ministerial office that contacts me. So when I say it happens, yes, it does, but uh, it's not all that common. Okay, so if that was to happen, it, it's fair to say it's not routine for a direct contact by a department secretary without the minister's office advising you earlier. I wouldn't say it's not routine, but it's not as common as um, the contact that I expect between ministerial officers. Okay. Between Mr Cartwright taking the position up, uh, which was in July formally... In October, did Mr Cartwright ever seek to contact you to talk about any matter? Con contact me? Yeah. No. Uh, are you aware of him attempting to make any contact with the Treasurer? Not to my knowledge. Fair enough. And uh, just in respect to when you become Premier, when the Treasurer becomes Premier, do you recall Mr Cartwright from that point onwards in October last mm. year making any contact with you about any issues to do with his remuneration? No. Do you recall... Any conversations uh, with Secretary... Actually, at this point, she's not Secretary. Uh, any conversations with CEO of Investment New South Wales, Amy Brown, to do with any issues to do with Mr Cartwright's remuneration? Not from the point in time at which uh, the Premier became the Premier, no. In October that month at all? No. Around October 27, 28, no, no. particular recollection? Fair enough. Um, do you recall... 
uh, having any conversations at any point in time with Miss Brown about Miss uh, Cartwright's remuneration. Yes. Do you wish to take us through that? I want to give you a right of reply. No, thank you. Um, uh, I was uh, contacted by uh, Miss Brown, um, and I believe it was on approximately the 11th or the 12th of May. This year? Um, this, uh, no, last year. Yep. Uh, in relation to um, uh, Mr Cartwright's remuneration. Uh, and she... Sorry, can I... 11th and 12th of May 2021. That's correct. So when the treasurer was treasurer? Correct. Okay, yep, thank you. So she um, indicated to me that she had a preferred candidate. Um, she indicated that uh, she was nervous about losing that candidate and the basis for those nerves, so to speak, um, was that he was asking for a salary that couldn't be paid. Um, I indicated to her, uh, um, I, I agree, I've, I've, I've read her evidence in this regard and I entirely agree that I said to her that um, there are important roles. Um, I also said to her that I'd had experience myself um, overseas seeing how important these roles could be, uh, being in rooms where uh, um, you have a presence from Victoria and Queensland and South Australia, um, actively seeking trade opportunities, but an empty chair from New South Wales. Um, and uh, I also agreed with her that uh, it was appropriate, or it, that he should be paid appropriately. Uh, where I disagree is with respect to, I guess, what followed with respect to her evidence. Uh, what I indicated was, as I say, that he should be paid appropriately, but I didn't know what appropriate was. So my recollection is that we had uh, one or, uh, sorry, um, two exchanges. I can't recall whether the second was by text or by phone, but the first was certainly by phone um, because uh, the first one concluded with me effectively saying, uh, I don't know what is appropriate. Do you know what is appropriate? Have you done any benchmarking? And uh, she indicated to me in that call that she hadn't. And, uh, and that was the end of that first contact. Then um, subsequently, and it, I think from memory it was within 24 or 48 hours, she reverted to me and indicated that um, she'd um, uh, done a bit of work and figured out that either the, uh, the Victorian or Queensland um, Agent General had been the, um, the DPC secretary uh, for that state and that that person had taken um, that salary over with them to their Agent General position and uh, that was 800,000. Um, and I indicated to her that that was uh, too much. And, uh, um, and she said that Austrade paid its um, officials either, um, I think it was 450 or $500,000 base with a uh, $100 or $150,000 um, uh, expenses allowance. And I also considered that that was too much, um, being aware as I was of roughly what secretaries make in New South Wales. What I put to her was that um, she should consider um, potentially uh, a $400,000 base with a $200,000 performance incentive. But what I stressed to her was that that was just an idea because um, I didn't uh, know what was appropriate and I had no experience in relation to these matters. Um, and I would say that I was surprised to get this telephone call. It came out of the blue. I'd had no previous contact with her in relation to these matters. Uh, and after that subsequent follow-up, um, I had no further engagement with her or um, in relation to this issue. Okay. Um, is there... <clears throat> Just let me just put to you one or two of the propositions that Ms. Brown did, just in case there's anything further you wish to sort of respond to directly. But um, effectively, my colleague, Ms. Sharp, sort of... Uh, look, sorry, before I do that, Ms. Back, 
I, I appreciate the evidence, and it does align with what Ms. Brown says um, as well, with some key differences, which I appreciate you've pointed out as well. But Ms. Brown is of the view that uh, that the word for word she says, he tells me his view that the salary would be worth it, or relate his view, but he couldn't tell me or direct what to do with this candidate, and I was very clear on that. Um, I mean, I think she's paraphrasing your conversation as well, uh, as well. But do you recall telling Miss Brown specifically that you thought that a salary at the expectation level that Mr. Cartwright had would be worth it? Uh, I can categorically rule that out. And I should add in that regard, I didn't know Stephen Cartwright. So I'd had never had any contact with him. I still don't have his details in my phone. Um, have only spoken to him once in my life. So um, the, for me to say, oh, he's worth it, is not consistent with the knowledge of him that I had. Okay. I did push Miss Brown and said, was it a strong opinion? Was it given emphatically? She said yes. And she goes, I still remember the conversation uh, as well. Uh, but your account is different in that respect. You, you don't recall giving any emphatic advice to that effect? I can categorically rule that out. Okay. Thank you. Did you have anything else? Mr Black, your... I mean, at this point, offering those opinions, you're reasonably heavily involved in the remuneration discussions about a public sector appointment. Um, did you feel uncomfortable about that at all? Well, I, I wouldn't say that I was heavily involved. As I said, she called me out of the blue. Mm. Yeah, um, and I accept that. And, and, yeah. and the conversation stood out to me at the time yeah. because it was... Um, I mean, I, I don't recall ever having had a conversation about public sector remuneration yeah. beforehand or yeah. since. Yeah. Um, but she was calling me and, um, you know, in the ordinary course, I try and be helpful and I tried to be yeah. helpful to her. Yeah. Um, so that's why I said to her, and, and I do stress that the frame of the conversation was, um, I've got a preferred candidate. Um, I'm scared of losing or I'm, I think, mm. nervous of losing that person. Scared is probably mm. over-egging it. Um, he's asking for too much. Mm. And so from, from my perspective, I'm thinking about, well, what is appropriate? Mm. And that's why the first conversation um, or the first exchange rather um, uh, concluded with me saying, well, what's an appropriate benchmark? Mm. And she didn't have that information at hand. So mm. she reverted to me mm. with some examples. Mm. But I was uh, um, surprised that I was being asked for mm. this um perspective, having had no experience previously with respect yeah. to public sector remuneration yeah. or indeed um, trade roles. Yeah. And that, I mean, that strikes me as reasonable, I have to say, that um, this this did strike you as an unusual request. You helped to the best extent you could, hmm. uh, but it was an unusual circumstance to be placed in. Uh, yes. Did you inform the Treasurer of that discussion? No, I didn't. Yeah. And was there any discussion subsequently that he would have been aware of? Not that, I, not, not, not that I'm aware of, no. Did you disclose this unusual discussion with anyone else in the office? No, I didn't. And I think um, uh, the conversation, as I said, stood out to me because it was unusual. Hmm. Um, but it also stood out to me at the time because um, uh, I was um, madly in, in the middle of budget yeah. preparation. It yep. was in the middle of May. And um, May is the sort of the most difficult month in terms of ERC <coughs> workload pre-budget. <coughs> so uh, it was um, out of the blue in that it was unrelated to <coughs> anything that we were working on <coughs> at the time. And um, I can... Um, I, I don't recall raising it with, with anybody afterwards. Um, and I wouldn't consider that to be unusual because mm. I would immediately have refocused on what we were dealing with on at the, the time. task at hand. Yeah. Yep. Well, looking back, finally, just looking back now, knowing what you know now, you dealt with it as best you could at the time. But as you look back now, with the benefit of the Premier's comments that people shouldn't be involved in these processes, looking back at Mike Pratt's comments to this committee, that it'd be inappropriate for ministers or presumably their officers to get involved in remuneration discussions. Does it strike you now as not only unusual, but also something that you preferably would have not expressed a view about, that you would have steered clear of? Well, uh, if I could have avoided an opportunity to appear before this committee, I think <laughs> I would have. Uh, but uh, we won't take it too personally, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, uh, I, I do stress at the time I, I wasn't seeking to be involved. 
I was endeavouring simply to assist by making some suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, and those suggestions really went to what type of thought process should go into. Yeah. Um, and, and I accept that, Mr Black, but I do. I am going to press you on, given the Premier's comments, given the Secretary's comments, the former Secretary, do you now accept that uh, that's an inappropriate level of engagement, one you'd prefer you were not engaged in at that time, looking back? I, I wouldn't say that what I did was inappropriate because, again, she contacted me mm. and all I did was offer an opinion in mm. relation to effectively a question put mm. to me. Would you do I it wouldn't again? say that I was involved. <clears throat> yeah, would you do it again? Uh, I think I would have to think very carefully about it in future. Thank you. Mr Black, can I just say what date did that conversation happen? Did you give it the date? It was, uh, it was approximately the 11th or the 12th of May. Right. Can I just take you to page... 19. Um, work back from page 19 of the tender bundle, if you don't mind. Certainly. Just to, This is, a, um, again, start working back from page 19. Page 19 has the last part of the email that comes from Miss West to you, which says, and CCs Miss Brown... Uh, and it goes, Brown, uh, as you know, the investment is establishing six global hubs. Um, the most important part is the last paragraph. We're seeking to arrange for the Treasurer and the Deputy Premier to meet the preferred candidate for the AG role, Mr Cartwright, and provide their endorsement for the candidate's appointment. You see that? Yes. Just in the middle of the page, you reply two minutes later. Yes. Going, thanks, we'll come back to you ASAP. You see that? Yes. And then... Early, if you CC go up, go on to page 17. Yep. This meeting takes place, as in the Treasurer's PA or EA um, comes back and indicates the following diary availability, you can see. Yes. And at the top, you can see Miss West replies, thanks, I'll check with Amy and come back. We're still finalising the package with the AG candidate, which may be the only sticking point on timings, and you see that's on the 26th of May, 2021. Yes. So just in respect to the conversation Miss Brown, uh, Bla Brown was having with you, uh, which was close to, if not days before, this particular email, um, uh, were the two related? No. Okay, so you don't see Miss Brown... Con you said Miss Brown contacted you out of the blue. Is it the case that Miss Brown was contacting you to... a provide you or did she indicate that she was advising you providing you some of the information ahead of this request not that i recall okay um and when you got this email do you recall getting this email no i don't recall getting the email but i accept obviously that i received it yep um but it then when you said we'll come back to you asap uh did it not sort of incur to you then to sort of go well where's what, what's going on with the remuneration look at the timing again it's uh Sure. During that uh, intensely busy pre-budget period. And as things stood, ultimately, um, as I understand it, the Treasurer did not meet with Mr Cartwright. Yeah, and look, to be fair, I think that's right. The, the meeting never actually takes place. But equally, when you get an email saying the only sticking point is on the package, two weeks later, that didn't prompt any action on your behalf? No, it was entirely a matter for Miss Brown. And I made that clear to her in the call as well. Ultimately, it's a matter for her. All I could do was offer an opinion. Okay. And just that second contact that you made reference to? Yes. Which was a couple of days later? Yep. Is it, was it the same day as this email or the day after or I, I no couldn't idea. recall. It, it was, it was um, at some point within 24 to 48 hours of the first. Um, so it's possible that it was? It, it is possible okay. indeed. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, Mr Black. We'll, uh, in that respect, otherwise we'll move on to the mm. next part. If that's all right, Mr. Um, like we really do appreciate your evidence in respect to the agent general appointment um, as well. Just to close that matter out, uh, this year, uh, Mr. Cartwright didn't. Are you aware of any attempt Mr. Cartwright made to contact the premier to discuss any matters to do with his remuneration through the course of this year? No. Um, when was the first time you became aware of the fact that there was a change in the agent general's remuneration arrangements? Was it through this inquiry? Uh, yes, I believe that's the case. Okay, so other than that, you had no knowledge of the fact? No, and none at all. 
uh, you have no recall of Mr. Minister Ayres or his office making any disclosure to you around this? Not that I can um, recall, no. Thank you um, on that matter. Thank you. Um, we might just now turn, if you don't mind, to uh, the issues to do with the America's appointment, if you don't mind, as well. Uh, as well. Um, firstly, you we, we've made it clear that there was some confusion around with the AG... Sorry, when the Asian General was being appointed, the common understanding was that that was a cabinet appointment. That's correct? Correct. And then at some point it changes in respect to the other stick positions after, I think, legal advice that was provided by the Department of um, Premier and Cabinet's legal or general counsel. I'm not aware of the circumstances in which that change was made. But, okay, but when yes. did you become aware of the fact that there was now a new process in place for the appointment of sticks? Well, it was, um, as I recall, it was actually another telephone call from... Amy Brown. Yeah. Um, uh, again, it, it it was unusual for me to receive, I think, telephone calls from her. I, I, I didn't take them all that often. Um, I, I should say I didn't receive them all that often. And uh, um, she contacted me to ask why a decision had been taken to uh, transfer the roles, so to speak, from a cabinet, sorry, from a a GSC process to a cabinet process and I didn't know the answer and said to her, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer and I can't help you. When did that conversation take place? Uh, I think it was... Um, I think it was late August or early September. I was able to be specific with respect to the previous date because I could cross-reference my diary but I haven't been able to do that with respect to this date. Okay, so it was around August. I think that's right. Okay. But I can't confirm. Thank you. And uh, prior to that, would you consider this... Uh, uh, well, firstly, let's just establish Miss Brown at this point in time had moved clusters, correct, to DPC? That would be correct. And so part of the reason why you would have considered it to be an unusual call because she was no longer a leader of an agency within your own cluster, correct? Yes. And uh, but Miss Brown has sort of said to us that she was keeping the Treasury involved namely because there was a lot of transition and turnover. Was that... Sort of your understanding as to why you've been called, or you've never been given an explanation as to why you were involved. I can't speak to whether or not she was engaging the treasury, but yeah. I can say that it was, at least from my perspective, um, unusual to be receiving a call from her. Okay, um, where was we? The treasurer's office getting updates about where the recruitment process was up to in respect to the America's position around August twenty one. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, Certainly by that stage. I mean, to the extent that this, as I said earlier, wasn't a priority by the time that I became the then Treasurer's Chief of Staff, um, somewhat later in the year after that administrative transfer had taken place, it was very much not a priority. Okay. Um, can I ask you in that respect then... Um, do you, can you turn to page 26 and 27 of your bundle? Certainly. Thank you. So, so we're from 20, 26 to 28. Well, actually, twenty nine to be frank. Um, is a series of emails and including an excerpt of uh, the way the IT system, I guess, or some IT system records the distribution of briefs to various personnel uh, and officers as well. And if you start on page sort of twenty nine, you can see that a brief is prepared for the treasurer around the appointment of senior trade and investment commissioner Americas. You see it on page 28? Yes. And then equally there's an attachment, which is a final selection panel. And then equally there's a candidate reports. You see that. And then you can see that that's submitted. If you just go up from 28, you can see this, the, the approval chain uh, as to who all the officials were. And you can see that Ms. Brown approves this on the 6th of the 8th, 2021, at 3.46 p.m., 
and I think it's it's distributed to the respective officers. And just to be clear <coughs> to you, Mr Black as well, similar briefings go to the Deputy Premier and the Premier's office on almost identical times as this one. Yes. If you go forward in time, uh, on pages, sorry, to page 30, you can see the briefing note that has been signed by the then Premier. Yes. And then if you go to page 31, you can see the briefing note that is sent to the Treasurer's office. Yes. And then if you go, forgive me for duplicating that a few times, but then if you go to page 37. Yes. And 38, starting on 38. The bottom of 38, um, you can see that the executive yes. officer of the office of the chief executive says revised brief, sends it through to the DLO in your office, who on page 37 yes. says returning this brief as noted. Uh, you see that? Yes. So someone got the brief, someone looked at the brief, someone noted the brief. Do you know who that was? No. So can you explain to us... Um, Given that we established earlier this morning about the way in which briefs are handled, uh, that is, they're submitted to a policy officer who was inspected, and if believing that there's any issue of concern would elevate it, and if anyone would elevate it, would bring it to your attention for di further direction. Uh, do, you, do you recall that happening in respect to this brief? No, I don't recall this brief being brought to my attention. Okay, um, so can you give us any explanation as to how this brief could be returned to the department as noted? from someone in the Treasurer's office without either you or the Treasurer knowing? Well, I think uh, a couple of points in that regard. Um, firstly, um, if you look at the brief, the, the recommendation is that it be noted. And sure. um, in, uh, with my team, uh, and, and to the point that I made earlier, once a brief comes in, it's submitted to the DLO and the DLO makes the call as to where the brief subsequently goes. Um, in the ordinary course, as you'd expect, it would go to a policy advisor and uh, the policy advisor <coughs> can then make a call as to where the brief needs to go after that. Um, looking at this brief, uh, as I say, it's a brief requesting um, that the matter be noted and I think... Um, it would have been entirely within the remit of a policy advisor to determine that for a brief of this nature, it could be noted at that person's level and then returned to the agency. So this is the brief that informs the Treasurer's Office that Miss Jenny West was considered to be the successful candidate for the America's position. And uh, you're quite right in saying the advice to you is to note it as well. If you turn to page 30... <coughs> You can see that the recommendation uh, is virtually identical to the recommendation that is made to Premier Berejiklian. Yes. And Miss Berejiklian notes it herself and signs it and returns it. Signs it and dates it, yeah. And dates it. And so I accept your, your view that, that effectively all the Treasurer's Office was doing was what was asked of them, which was to note it. Uh, but i just pushing you on this because clearly the other two ministers who got this signed it themselves or at least caused their electronic signatures to be added to it. And just to be fair to Mr Barilaro's evidence, his evidence was is that uh, his electronic signature was applied to the document but he really couldn't explain how that happened as well, um, just in that respect. But the issue is, is that there's certainly no dispute from Mr Barilaro that he may have seen it and we haven't heard from Mr Berejiklian to be fair on this particular matter as well. But the evidence is clear in relation to the Premier, uh, the former Premier. But you're saying effectively that... Is it your... Sorry, you're saying that your policy advisor uh, may have chosen to note it themselves rather than pass it on. I'm saying that I don't know with any certainty what in fact did happen, but based on office procedures, I would have thought it is entirely within the scope of uh, the policy uh, or of a policy advisor's discretion to make that call. Um, and, you know, I would also note in that regard, again, context is important here. 
um, if you look at at least the date that this was approved um, by uh, Miss Brown to be submitted, and I'm just trying to find the relevant Fix. page. It's on page six, 37. Um, uh, sorry, it's on... Uh, no, I've got, I've got it. That's fine. Yeah. Um, the, the 6th of August, that was really a month into what was, as I would describe, the busiest professional time of my life and probably um, uh, certainly at the time, uh, the treasurers as well. We were a month into the Delta um, uh, um, lockdown and uh, since that time, since that commenced, we'd spent um, quite literally uh, every day, um, weekends, weekdays, of course, um, dawn until the wee small hours, uh, preparing ERC submissions, mm. um, difficult negotiations with the federal government, preparing for crisis policy meetings, um, ne negotiating and having discussions with stakeholders in relation to support packages. Um, I, I can... Um, very safely say that this was so far from the uh, the treasurer's um, priority list, it wasn't even in the ballpark at the time. And um, uh, had I been a policy advisor at that point, I wouldn't have submitted a brief for noting to him in this regard either. Look, uh, Mr Black, I don't dispute any of that, but I just would point out that Paramount Berejiklian signed it within a day of getting it. Stuart Ayres, which I was remiss of me not to inform you that Mr Ayres got a similar briefing and he signed it within a day after I think the Premier did from memory and, it's at the de and the Deputy Premier also did the same. So I, I, don't ex I absolutely agree that every minister can absolutely exercise their own judgment on this respect. But what's unusual in respect to the Treasurer's Office engagement with this brief is that it, it, the other three ministers sign it within a day or two and then but somehow the Treasurer's Office returns it with it only being noted. But I accept that you might disagree and that you might... Well, actually, I should ask you, it was a matter of judgment or you think it was a matter of judgment on the part of the policy advisor not to draw it to the attention of the Treasurer's? I think for a brief of this nature and the circumstances entirely. But, Mr Black, this... If, if we wind forward till uh, <coughs> when this Barilaro inquiry... When this Barilaro appointment became public, which I think might have been the 17th of June, this matter's then been a matter of controversy uh, every day for about 12 or 14 weeks since then. Um, you're saying you're still not aware today where this brief travelled in the Treasurer's office to not be signed by him, That's even correct. as you sit here today. That no idea. That's even correct. though the Treasurer, now the Premier, has reassured his colleagues that he didn't sign this brief, this has been the subject of some discussion in the Parliament and publicly no one in your office has inquired how this brief travelled through your office. Is that what you're telling us? I'm not saying that nobody's made inquiries, but we haven't been able to uh, determine anything other than that the brief um, was returned to the agency for noting. Have you made inquiries? Uh, uh, I, I have sought to try and um, understand what happened with this brief, yes, but beyond what is in the documentation... I haven't been and able what to... what did these advisors say when you asked them if you, they signed check. this brief? Um, they don't recall either. You've got to understand here that this is a brief that is coming up to a minister who no longer has any portfolio responsibility or cluster responsibility in any way, shape or form with um, these appointments. Mm. So uh, for the, um, the Treasurer, as I say, you've got the context of COVID, um, you've got... Uh, the fact that he has no responsibility in this regard, and then you've got the fact that it's just a noting brief. So your position is no one in your office recalls this brief or noting it, and there is no record held in your office or in the department of well, who, who you, it was who noted it. You've got the records here as to um, uh, as to what we have as well. Beyond that, I'm not able to shed any light. Okay, so let's move forward from the events of the 12th of August onwards uh, as well. Um, we have established through the course of this inquiry that uh, Minister Barilaro brought a submission to the Cabinet to alter the appointment process uh, for these positions to revert it back to effectively being ministerial appointments. Uh, I presume you were following that part of the inquiry? 
Oh, you... I'm aware of that, yes. <laughs> and uh, do you have, recall having any, uh, your office or you having any discussions with the <clears throat> Deputy Premier's office uh, at all about that submission? No. Do you recall uh, whether or not uh, the Treasurer raised it with you as an area of concern with him at all? No. Do you recall the Treasurer making any mention of any discussions he had with Mr. Barilaro? No. Mr. Barilaro has told us that I think effectively it was possible that he did have conversations. In fact, the way he put it was the only way this can get onto the Cabinet table is if with the concurrence of the senior leadership. And he said he took it to senior leadership group. Uh, I presume, and to be fair to him, he did actually make clear that I think the Treasurer was a member of the senior leadership group. Do you uh, have any recall about the Treasurer raising with you or after any leadership group discussion? No. The former Deputy Premier's former Chief of Staff made the point to us as well that she was operating off the assumption that Mr Barilaro would take responsibility for dealing with this with the Ministers, which accords with your understanding, as in she wasn't talking about this at the staff level as well. But I just want to stress again, you had no conversations with Mr Barilaro? No. So this submission is then lodged effectively on September 18 and it's agreed to at a Cabinet meeting around the 27th of September. Do you have any recall of the Treasurer making any points around that point? No. And the Deputy Premier told us uh, that only two ministers in the Cabinet meeting raised issues with it uh, and he wasn't prepared to name them. And, of course, I presume you, you, you weren't at the meeting either, but... Did, are you aware of the Treasurer saying to you anything anecdotally about such things? No, I don't recall any discussion in relation to this submission at all. Okay. Indeed, as I mentioned previously, the, the first that I was aware of it was that call that I had um, from Miss Brown uh, when she was asking whether or not I knew of the origin of this submission, which I did not. Okay. Thank you. Um, just, just go forward now in time to uh, a week later. So September 27, Cabinet agrees to this change. Um, one week later, the Premier is, well, the Treasurer is now the Premier, October 5. Uh, do you recall any, the, the Premier, sorry, let me just establish some base facts here. The Premier then becomes the Chair of the Cabinet, correct? Correct. And then he's then responsible for uh, the uh, administration of the Cabinet agenda? Correct. As well as presumably the administration of the agenda that is put before the leadership group? or the subcommittee of cabinet that operates uh, as well? No, it doesn't tend to operate that way. Okay. Uh, the, the Premier takes carriage of the cabinet agenda, yep. but subcommittees of cabinet are, um, for the most part, have, have their agenda set by the chair of those relevant subcommittees. Okay. Uh, but the strategic leadership group of cabinet, which we had established from the General Council of DPCs and a committee of the cabinet... Premier. Um, as well, is that the Premier's chairs that or someone else chairs that? Uh, I'm not sure what she's talking about in that regard. There is no um, strategic leadership well, group. Well, to be fair, that there, might be my thing, but the leadership group or senior minister's group or anything like that? Uh, there is um, what we call um, strategy committee of Cabinet. That's the one, sorry. Okay. Is that the Premier? Chair? Yes, the yes. Premier chairs that as well. And he decides the agenda? Yes. Okay. Did... Do you recall Minister Ayres coming back to that group or having any conversation? Well, firstly, sorry, do you recall Minister Ayres raising or his office raising with you or your office, the Premier's office, a decision to uh, delay or otherwise not implement the Cabinet decision to change this into ministerial appointments? No. He's made this point to the head review. He says he disclosed it at two instances, one in October, one in November. Do you have any idea what Minister Ayres is talking about? No. Uh, and uh, do you recall having any conversations with the Premier about the status of whether or not that Cabinet submission was in effect? No. The, what we have established through this inquiry is that Cabinet submission leads to the termination of Miss West's candidacy for this role uh, and the reopening of the position as well. This time, at this point in time, uh, you are now sort of the Premier is obviously in charge of DPC and DPC, through Investment New South Wales, is running this process. Do you recall receiving any advice from Ms Brown or Investment New South Wales through your policy advisors or to you directly that inform them that the process to recruit an America's position would be repeated? Not that I can recall. Okay, so when did you learn about the fact that there was to be a repeat of the process to recruit a trades commissioner to New York? 
I, I don't actually recall um, if I was aware <clears throat> of that before this inquiry. I may have been, but I don't actually recall being aware of that. Um, again, some context here is important. The Premier, of course, sets Cabinet agendas, but in the course of running through Cabinet agendas, um, my focus is on those areas that are of the greatest strategic importance to the Premier. Um, and uh, to the extent that there are other items on the agenda, uh, uh, my team will raise those items with me um, to the extent that they feel that there is a need to. But uh, um, not every item would be raised in that way by any stretch. And as I say, my time is prioritised towards those areas of greater strategic significance to the Premier. So I don't recall being aware of this as an issue, uh, to be honest, at all. OK. Um, so just in terms of the events from... Uh at this point, Stuart Ayres is being supported by the DPC cluster, correct, as well? I believe that is correct. Okay. So from October to December, yeah, your best recollection is, is that no specific advice was given to the Premier's office around this process. I, I couldn't say that definitively, but I have no knowledge of that. Thank you. That's clear. When did you first become aware of the fact that Mr Barilara had an interest in the role? Uh, I, I can't tell you precisely... Um, but I believe it was early this year and uh, it was in a conversation that I had with Mr Coots Trotter. Okay. And what uh, did he say? Uh, all I can recall him saying uh, was um, words to the effect of that Mr Barilaro was um, an applicant in the process. Had applied, so this was post the 19th of January. Yes, I believe that's correct. And did that pique your interest? Were you surprised to hear that? Uh I was um, I, I was aware that um, it would be um, something that might attract public attention, but he was an applicant in a process. Hmm. But you immediately formed the view that this could possibly be controversial. No, I was aware that it would be a matter that may attract public attention. What was Mr Kusro telling you? You'd have to put that to Mr Kurt Strotter. Uh, did you... Inc uh, well... Uh, was it in a routine meeting that you yes. disclosed it? Right. So it was in your weekly or standard meeting? It would have been. But again, I can't remember when it was. And up until that point, you were unaware that John Barilaro had applied for this? Entirely. America's position. Yep. That was despite the fact that he had informed the Premier uh, that he would be applying. Well, I, I, I am aware of the evidence before this committee. Yeah. Um, but personally, I was entirely unaware of that. Yeah, so the Premier was told, but as the Premier's Chief of Staff at the time, you had no idea at that point until this meeting after the 19th of January. The first I knew of the application was when Mr Coots Trotter informed well, me. Well, the question was not about the application, Mr Black, it was about Mr Barilaro's interest in the role, when that, we were first aware of his interest in the role. Well, that, yes, in that conversation as well. Right. Thank you. And sorry, I know my colleague just asked you, but... You recollect the conversation with Mr. Coots Trotter was uh, early this year? Yes. And we're we talking January, February? I couldn't tell you, to be honest. Okay, so sometime I mean, I, it, after it, January. It, sort of, it feels, as, when I sort of think about it, it, it um, I recall that it was quite early in the year, right. but I couldn't put a specific month or and did, certainly not a date. Did you then raise that with the Premier? Not that I recall. Why didn't you raise that with the Premier, given you'd already formed the view it could be controversial? No, I'm saying that I don't recall. You don't recall whether or not you mentioned to the Premier of the state that the former Deputy Premier might be applying for this role? No, this and may have... I, what I'm what I am unsure of, and it may well have been that this was a conversation that um, was had in the weekly catch-up that... Uh, the Premier and I have. So the Premier may have been point in of the order, meeting chair, when... Point of order. Mr Black's trying to uh, elucidate his response. Um, it would help if Mr Graham allowed him to complete his answer before he jumps in. Yeah, uh, thank you for the point of order, Wes, but uh, there isn't one. I've been listening to the exchange. Well, I think Mr Black has been able to respond and answer uh, the questions very clearly and occasionally if members interrupt a witness providing a response, that is okay. So, uh, yes, Mr Graham, was, if you proceed with your was, questions, it, was it has been going on... Excuse me, this it exchange is com being completely respectful. Mr Black has been able to respond, and if we start doing interjections at this time again, we'll just take it, uh, take it uh, up into 
government time well, no, if they're not, not legitimate again, points not, of order, Mr Fain. That is not the resolution of the committee. But anyway, Mr. I made Graham. my point of order. You can Thank rule you. against it. That's fine. Mr Black, I think you're about to say that the perhaps the Premier was in that meeting with Mr Kurt Strotter and yourself. That's correct, but I, I couldn't recall exactly. Yeah. And do you recall anything about the Premier's reaction when Mr Kurt Strotter informed you for the first time that Mr Barillaro was... No. Uh, applying for perhaps not the Premier for the first time. No, I don't recall anything in that regard. Yep. I do remember, as I said, that um, uh, I was informed, uh, I believe um, uh, uh, the Premier may have been in that, um, in that same discussion, but I can't recall precisely. And did you then have any subsequent discussion with the Premier about the potential controversy with this appointment? Well, at that stage... Uh, he was an applicant in a process. That's, I'm not asking, did you give the Premier any advice about involving himself in the process? I'm asking, did you ask the Premier or make, did you speak to the Premier at all about the political implications of this appointment, one you had already come to the conclusion could draw some attention? I may have had a discussion with the Premier in that regard. I can't recall. Mr Black, you've, there's a lot you haven't recalled in the process today. You would have used that phrase about 100 times up till now. I, I think can accept it, in your this early, is a question. I can accept in the early <clears throat> weeks of your role that might have been acceptable, but I find it less believable when it comes to the What's appointment the of the former Deputy Premier Point of order, into Chair. this role. Something Point of order. That this is not the opportunity quite significant public to make attention. statements. I'm what going is to the press question? you... I'm happy to answer that. <laughs> yeah, I'm do, I just want to press that question. Do you really not recall giving the Premier advice about this appointment? I dare say I would have had a discussion with the Premier. Just give us As your I best said. recollection. Yeah. Well, I don't discuss private conversations that I have with the Premier, and I won't before this committee. OK, but you Mr... But, but, but you, as part of Chief of Staff, of course, you would uh, draw attention to um, political consequences of decision-making, correct? Of course. Yeah. And it's possible that you may have done that in this respect without necessarily disclosing the nature of the advice that you gave. This wasn't uh, a matter with respect to which the Premier had any decision-making role. Hmm. But, Mr Black, that is a very different answer to say you don't want to discuss it at this committee and we can, you know, we'll, we'll take that under consideration. I'm not saying that's suggesting that's inappropriate. It's very different to saying you don't recall. No, I, I don't... very different I, answers. No, 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 no. What I'm saying here is entirely consistent. I don't recall. I dare say there may have been a conversation, but I don't recall, A, whether there was, um, or B, what was said. But one way or the other, had there been a, t a conversation, I don't think it is appropriate for me to discuss the private conversations that I have with the Premier as his Chief of Staff. Thank you, Mr Black. We won't push you on that aspect. Um, but can I just ask, did you make any inquiry to Minister Ayres' office as to what was going on here? No. Uh, did... Uh, why not? Uh, for um, the very simple reason that um, uh, Mr Kutz Trotter made it plain that this was a um, public sector appointment. It wasn't a matter for ministers. OK. And... Uh, did you make any inquiries into whether or not... Sorry. Um, uh, I'm going to push you then, Mr Black. On, on the basis of that answer, um, a lot does turn then on when this conversation was taking place because Minister Ayres' involvement in these matters uh, between January 22, like literally the date January 22, and February 8 have been somewhat heavily uh, interrogated by this committee because that's at the point where we've established he was adding names to shortlists and we were, he was adding names, uh, in making inquiries into sort of where things were progressing. And we've also established as well that he was in communication with Mr Barilaro in December and or October, November, actually, I think, as well. Um, so I'm going to push you again, if it's possible that you can recollect or even take on notice um, where, to be able to identify when you were having this conversation with Mr Kutstrotter. I'm happy to take it on notice, but honestly, I've I've tried in the course of um, thinking about today's appearance to uh, sort of narrow things down, and, and I've tried to do that as well with respect to conversations with Ms Brown um, where possible. Um, um, in some instances, I've been able to by cross-referencing diaries, including with my wife's diary, um, but in this instance, I, I don't think that I can, but I'm happy to take it on notice. Thank you, Mr Bailey. Uh, just let me clear, I really do appreciate that 
the preparation that you put in as a <clears> uh, to the it is appreciated. But the reason I ask you whether you were making inquiries for Mr. Ayres is equally it gives rise to the question of was Mr. Ayres making any disclosures to your office or you uh, or the Premier for that matter about the contact he was having with Mr. Barillaro and his otherwise his engagement in this process? Not that I recall. Okay. So we established that Mr. Coots Trotter tells you uh, at that point. Do you recall any further conversations with Mr. Coots Trotter in which he informed you about the outcome of the selection process? Uh, yes. Uh, there was a, a further conversation with uh, Mr. Coots Trotter um, in which he, uh, as I recall, indicated that um, Mr. Barillaro was to be or had been um, the successful candidate in the process. And do you recall when that took place? No, I, I don't remember the, when that took place. Uh, was it around April? Uh, it, it, it could have been. I, I, I couldn't tell you um, exactly. It was, it was some months after... I feel as though it was some months after that, that first... Look, I think we've been able to establish from Miss Brown and Mr Coots Trotter and the evidence that they gave to respective committees, Miss Brown to this one and Mr Coots Trotter to their estimates, that uh, Miss Brown sought the intervention of uh, Mr Coots Trotter. I think the way she put it was to sense check or the proposition, given it was her decision, with a view that she certainly left the impression, in fact, all but said, that with a view that Mr Coots Trotter would raise it with the Premier's office and other senior leaders of the government to see whether or not such a decision would create <clears> controversy <throat> that the government would consider not to be helpful. Me paraphrasing, to mm. be frank, but that's effectively the import of the evidence that she gave as well. And to be fair to Mr Coots Trotter, he, he made clear at estimates that uh, he was very, I, I guess you would put it, coy in order not to involve himself in the process, mindful of his responsibilities under law as well. Paraphrasing again. Uh, and I'll be clear, I am paraphrasing it, but just to be fair to Mr. Cooper. No, I've read his evidence. Yeah. And, 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 and entirely aligns with my um, recollection of the conversation that I had with him. Um, he did not in any way um, uh, uh, put to me a proposition that would suggest that there was some level of influence that was capable of being exercised by him or by our office. Indeed. Uh, it was very much an informing conversation and... Um, he made it very clear, uh, again, um, that it was a, a, a GSE process and uh, it was not a process in which ministers um, had any involvement. And I presume that you didn't... Well, what did you say in response? Do you recall what the Premier said in response? Well, I didn't say much to Mr Coots Trotter because there wasn't a huge amount that could be said. Uh, um, uh, I... Um, Recall that I, um, again, I can't remember whether or not this was a conversation that I had with Mr. Coots Trotter on my own or with the Premier, um, but one way or the other, there would certainly have been a conversation. There was indeed a conversation um, between myself and the Premier afterwards, um, but again, I don't think it's appropriate for me to canvass those private conversations. And look, I'm not going to invite you to. I respect the privacy. Um uh, matter that you're raising, but it is fair to say you at least disclosed to the Premier that you had received this advice from Mr. Kutstrada? Yes. Okay. Uh, but, I, but, but I'm not sure whether or not he was in the conversation yeah, himself, sure. so it may not have been necessary for me to disclose that to him. Okay. But you had some conversation with him after? Yes. And look, to be fair to you, Mr. Bike, I mean, the former Deputy Leader of the Government had just been appointed to a position, mm. of course, it would create a, at least a point of conversation with the Premier. Um, that's reasonable as well. And I'm not going to ask you to canvas uh, in depth what that was. But do you recall at this point in time, uh, Minister Ayres coming to any form of a leadership group, a strategy committee, anything of the sort, to make a disclosure that Mr Barilara was a successful candidate? No, not that I recall. So... Uh, the evidence that's been put in front of us is that the only reason why Miss Brown had confidence to make that decision <coughs> is because certainly in her way she puts it effectively is, is because uh, Minister Ayres had told her that he had made such a disclosure and that uh, there wasn't any meaningful opposition um, that would interrupt her decision making and therefore she felt she had confidence to proceed with the appointment. 
do you have any evidence? Can you shed any light on any of those events as to whether or not any of that actually happened or not happened? Or I can't shed any light in that regard, no. Okay. Do you want to stop pausing yeah, Should I? I've got some other matters to move no, on to. Just on this particular no, thing, we'll go no, forward. Good. Okay, so just in respect then to uh, the events of... Uh, this is sort of, I guess, finalised in respect of May is when Mr. Barilaro then has his appointment effectively finalised. Uh, from May onwards, uh, did the Premier's office take, make, take any sort of contingency steps in order to prepare for a public announcement? What do you mean by contingency steps? Well, did you uh, have any conversations with the agency or the Minister's office as to when the announcement was likely to take place? I didn't personally, but Your office. Th there would have been some discussion because yeah. media releases go through our office. Sure. And presumably uh, when it was announced, which <clears> I actually <throat> think was Friday the 18th of June, maybe the 17th, it could have been Friday, it was definitely the Friday. Uh, were 17th. You, 17th of June. It was Friday the 17th of June. Were you aware that the announcement was likely to be made that day? I would have been aware, yes. And at that point, no objection to the raise? by your office around either the timing of the announcement, given it was four days before the budget or anything like that? Well, I don't think it's appropriate for me to disclose um, conversations that are happening within my office um, or that I'm having with the Premier. Uh, you know, th those are private communications in the context of political decision-making. Um, okay. Uh, when the premier, when this is then announced, the premier at a press conference on the twenty first um, defends it. Effectively, says it was a merit based appointment. What inquiries were made in your off by your office in that interim period in order to facilitate to give the pre the premier the confidence to make that claim? Sorry, what was the date? The Monday. It would have been the twentieth, I think, the day before the budget. Uh, so the the um, in the, the 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 second conversation that uh, I had with Michael Coots Trotter. Um, he indicated to us uh, that on his advice, <coughs> as in he was advised, <coughs> that the process was um, uh, fair and independent uh, and um, uh, an ordinary um, public sector process. Okay, so you were relying on the advice of the Secretary of DPC that, in order to... For the Premier to make that claim. Indeed, and he in turn, as I understand it, was relying on the advice from the Department, um, uh, from um, uh, the, the... Then Secretary of the then Department Secretary. of Enterprise Inter Indeed. Investment and Trade. Uh, and then equally, can I... Look, I'm not going to have too much before I pass to my colleague, uh, just on this. In respect to the claims that the, then the Premier then made to the House, uh, I think that week as well, uh, was the Premier relying on... This is the, only because there's been a bit of confusion around this. Um, at first instance, it was explained to us that the Premier was relying on advice that was given by the Department, uh, and that is the Department of Enterprise, Investment and Trade. Uh, but then equally, it was introduced to us by, I think, Mr Coots Trotter and his evidence that actually he was also relying on evidence given to him by Minister Ayres. Uh, do, you have, do you know which one of them was providing that advice prior to the um, tr Premier making the claims in the House that this was... Uh, independent merit-based process? So I'm aware that there was a meeting um, between uh, um, the Premier, um, uh, Miss Brown, um, Miss Boyd, um, and um, there may have been, and possibly also Minister Ayres, I'm, I'm not sure, um, and that uh, the Premier received advice at that meeting from Miss Brown that the... Um, uh, uh, in relation to the recruitment process. Okay. So it probably came from that meeting. That's my understanding, yes. I wasn't at that meeting. I had a, another meeting at the time. Um, but uh, in the course of um, reviewing um, uh, evidence before this inquiry, um, I've seen that Miss Boyd has indicated that it was Miss Brown uh, <coughs> that informed the Premier about the nature and status of the recruitment process. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask just two other issues, more ones? Uh, in respect to the conversations that have been pu publicly established which took place between the Premier and Mr Barilaro prior to his application, Mr Barilaro Torres, he encountered the Premier in Martin Place. Do you recall having any conversations with the Premier after such an encounter? Not at all. 
Premier has said publicly that uh, that Mr. Barilaro informed him at a social function. Do you know what function that the Premier was referring to? No. Um, and there haven't been any subsequent discussions given the contradiction in those two uh, bits of advice about which of those two it was, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, no. Uh, the Premier, in Mr. Barilaro's evidence, indicated that um, when he was told that the Deputy Premier would be applying for the role, said something like, either great or go for it, can you shed any light on what was discussed when the Premier was informed that Mr Barilaro was applying for the role? No, and I wasn't aware of that. And just uh, in the interregnum period from the point that Mr Barilaro resigns from the Ministry, but prior to him resigning from the Parliament, he made clear that he was having just general friendship chats, catches up with the Premier, check-ins, as you would expect from close colleagues who have worked together in intense circumstances, to be fair to both the parties. But do you recall having any conversations with the Premier around those conversations and with and whether Mr Ballarat expressed any interest? No. Because Mr Ballarat was making it clear he was making inquiries around, from October onwards, effectively, around this role, but you can't recall any specific... No. no. N- not even anything specific, nothing at all. All right, so he, Mr Ballarat's evidence, I would have spoken to Mr Perrottin about four or five, six occasions... Uh, I can't say that it's more than that. They're on the phone, repeated discussions of this October, November, December period where he was weighing up, in fact, had decided to apply for this role. None of that uh, came across your desk, is of your knowledge. You can't shed any light on... No, I entirely accept that that's his evidence, but I didn't have any communications put to me in that regard. I might just turn to um, uh, two other issues briefly um, and then hand back to my um, colleague. I want to rewind to that second discussion you have with uh, Mr Coots Trotter. The first one, sometime after the 19th of January, you're informed, perhaps the Premier's informed for a second time that Mr Barilaro is applying. You're then told, I think you said around April, that he was the successful candidate. No, what I said was that I, 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 I believe that the first conversation was early in the year, but I couldn't recall yeah. precisely when, and the second conversation was, I believe, some months later. Yeah, couldn't recall, but after he was appointed? Mm. Yes. Yes, so after the 19th of January. And the um, second discussion was when? Uh, I can't recall whether or not Mr Coots Trotter said to me um, that Mr Barilaro... Um, uh, was the successful candidate or was very likely to be the successful candidate. I, I, I can't recall um, whether or not it was mm, sure. which one of those Except was. that. And to that question about when that discussion occurred, I'll just press you on that. I can't remember, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I think we were suggesting around April uh, in the earlier um, discussion, why was it that uh, Amy Brown is then texting and evidence before the committee. FYI, I've been told that Premier and DP are comfortable with the appointment of Barilaro as stick to the Americas and requested to get on with formalising the arrangements, which I'll do. I I can't speak to why Amy would send that. Yeah. Can you give any reason, shed any light, as to why the Premier and the Deputy Premier might have been comfortable with John Barilaro being appointed? I, I can't speak to that. I can't speak to the basis on which she sent that text. Do you agree that, given the advice you had received from Mr Coots Trotter, that it would not be appropriate to have involvement in this public sector process, that the Premier's view, the Deputy Premier's view, should have been irrelevant to whether or not this proceeded? Yes, I don't, I'm don't. i not aware of any involvement. Yeah, so given the formal advice you received from the Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, if they were expressing a view, it should have been irrelevant, it was probably inappropriate. Do you agree with that observation? Well, I don't know whether or not the Premier was expressing a view. That's a text from Miss Brown. Mm. It's unreflective of direct communication with the Premier. So I am reluctant to speculate on that. Mm. I, I'm simply asking about the advice you received from the agency. And he simply I can speak to that. Yes. And I can say yeah. that in accordance with that advice, we took no steps to my knowledge. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask about another matter Shortly before Minister Ayres resigned, I think that was on the 3rd of August, um, 
Minister Stokes was in contact with him to express his view about whether or not Minister Ayres' position was sustainable, that is, his public position over this role. He, I think, conveyed that by text. Uh, it suggested that Minister Ayres uh, responded along the lines of, have you asked Premier Perrottet to resign as well? Were you aware of any concerns uh, in your office that if Stuart Ayres was sacked, the same charge might be pointed at Premier Perrottet for his involvement in these appointments? Uh, I don't think it is appropriate for me to canvas the discussions that were taking place within our office at that particular point in time. Um, and I'd make one point there, and that's that, as I understand it, this inquiry is designed to consider the basis on which appointments were made. This would seem to me to go to a point that is beyond that, and indeed the political response <coughs> in relation to the appointments. Well, Mr Black, I'm going to press you on that because it goes to the appropriateness of these appointments and the perceptions of the Premier's Cabinet colleagues about his involvement. Well, I'm going to take in the some of these appointments. I'm going to take the point of order in that case. Point and order's I will been put, taken. I will put uh, what Mr Black has put forward uh, to Mr Graham, to you, Chair, and uh, seek your ruling on it. What do you mean you're wanting to seek my ruling on what? Uh, as to the appropriateness of the question, uh, given the objection of the witness. The witness, in, as part of the procedural fairness resolution, the... the, the uh, the witness is able to question the appropriateness of the question and seek a ruling from the chair. Now, Mr Black has done that. I agree with him um, and I'm asking you to make a ruling on that. He's objected to the question. So what was the line of questioning again, The John? line of questioning is um, were there concerns, is, is Mr Black aware of concerns that amongst the Premier's Cabinet colleagues that the same issues that were raised with the heirs' involvement could have been raised about the Premier's involvement. Was that an item of discussion uh, at any point that Mr Black recalls? And that was Mr. an Black item of discussion between... Uh, between anyone who Mr Black was in contact with. Yeah, the, the witness can answer the question if well, he doesn't no, Mr. Black, answer Mr. the question. Mr Black has, the has taken the point of order that it's outside the terms of reference and I would agree with him. Well, well just, just perhaps by way of guidance in terms of the procedural resolution, maybe the way forward would be to allow Mr Black to give his answer first and then... we. But where a question, where just, where a question can I, is, can I just, can I just, just uh, maybe if we just allow Mr. Black to give his answer, as Mr. Black would be well and truly aware that he can decline to answer the question on the basis he just declined. He's well and truly entitled to do that, and we can't push him beyond that. But we're entitled to push him once. No, no. But uh, again, um, the procedural fairness resolution is clear that where a witness objects to a question, um, and where it's clearly outside the terms of the refer terms of reference, um, the the witness may do so. For, well, firstly, Object. and firstly, uh, <laughs> Mr. Fang, the question I believe was according to the terms of reference. Again, we have allowed quite uh, free-ranging questions, uh, which I think has been according to the terms that, of reference that, because it of the, certainly doesn't mean the terms that they, of reference the trying questions. to seek the way in which these these appointments um, were made. I think the question is fine. If the, well, I'm if happy the to, witness is objecting an answer to that. answer the question, you could state the reasons why you're objecting. He did. No, I, I'm, I don't have, um, as I've said before, I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on um, private discussions between myself and members of my team or indeed with the Premier. Um, but... Uh, what I can say is, and this is um, a matter within my own knowledge, that I am not aware of any um, attempt to influence the process. Mm -hmm. um, I am going to press you in this matter, Mr Black, to this extent. Um, so I accept the answer you've just given. Um, to your knowledge, uh, was that a concern of the Premier's Cabinet colleagues, though, that the pattern of behaviour demonstrated by Stuart Ayres might also be levelled at Premier Perrottet, given his involvement. Oh, this goes point. to perceptions. I will take, well, I'll take the point of order, which is the same point of order that Mr Black raised last time, which is that this is not uh, in relation to the process of the selection. It's around the political uh, 
decision making which is outside the terms of reference. Again. And also awesome. it is not appropriate to be putting these sorts of questions to uh, the Premier's Chief of Staff. Mr Fang, just to be clear, firstly, it's not outside the terms of reference. I'll just allow Mr Black... So which part of the terms uh, of reference Graham, is covered by this? Mr Graham asked that question. I'll just see uh, what Mr Black uh, is responding to. Chair, uh, I'm sorry, this is... It, the Chair has ruled. I wouldn't disclose conversations that I would have had with um, members of the Cabinet in relation to this either. That's not something that I think it's appropriate for a member of staff to do. To your knowledge, did Minister Ayres say to Minister Stokes by text, have you asked Premier Perrottet to resign as well? No, I'm not aware of that. Just, uh, just two other matters, um, Mr Black. Just in terms of the actual Cabinet decision to convert these into ministerial positions, has the Premier's office taken any steps <clears throat> to cause that Cabinet submission to be implemented? Not that I'm aware of. But Can I ask why not? Is it still a standing position of the government or not, to your best of your knowledge? No, no, no. What I'm saying I'm, I'm not aware. But that doesn't mean it's not happening. I'm just unaware. Well, look, and to be frank, uh, that's fair enough, but that is itself a telling, like, because if it is obviously the Premier's responsibility to make sure Cabinet decisions are followed, correct? Yes. This well, cabinet decision was made a year ago, more than a year ago. It, like, it's ministerial responsibility to implement the cabinet's um, decision. cabinet decisions. It's, it's not the premier's responsibility to hold ministers to account, though, is it? What was the second point that you just raised? No, it's, the premier's. Think, it's, it's the minister's. That. It's the premier's responsibility to make sure ministers are held to account to the decisions made by the cabinet collectively. Oh, that's pretty standard. Of course, but it's not as though the premier, line by line, goes through cabinet submissions to make sure that ministers are complying with the terms of sure, the but decisions the reason, made. The department would. But the reason yeah, I the ask, agency would. That's okay, point, yeah. point of order. One one of you needs to be asking the question. Hansard can't record it. Nobody can understand it. Um, there needs to be one question. Wes, that's not a point of order. It is a point of order. Not a, it's that a, is not a, a point of order. That's not a point of order. order. It goes through you, me for you, starters. Honestly, the so, that have so been coming out today. Can Mr. I just ask? Can, Mr. Can, Mr. Mulkey, thank continue. you, Chair. Mr. Black, um, given the New York position is not filled and apparently will be reef, well, the process to appoint the New York position will recommence presumably after this inquiry is finished. It's just a question as to how is that position then going to be recruited? Is it through a merit-based appointment through the public service or is it going to be through you, a... You'd uh, have to direct that to the Secretary of the Department or the Minister. I'm not on, aware. Okay. So it's my question is, has the, has, your, has the Premier's office caused or asked or made any inquiries into the Minister's office as to what progress has been made in respect to implementing this Cabinet position? Not that I recall. Okay. Just are, the other... Are we still at the point where the government can't tell us how these positions are appointed? Is that still the case today? I'm not sure what you're saying with respect to that question. So, sorry. How are these positions appointed today, is given the conflicting Cabinet decisions? Again, that is what a is question the... that I would submit is better put to the Minister responsible for these appointments or the Secretary. Can I just, the uh, last matter I just wanted to ask you very quickly about, just in respect to the secretary, the former secretary of the Department of Enterprise, Investment and Trade, um, just so we can establish this, legally, Mr Perrottet was her employer, correct? Yes. And then it was delegated to the secretary of DPC, which is a standard arrangement that's entered into in all secretaries, correct? Correct. And the secretary can, of DPC can then exercise the employment function, uh, Correct? Correct. And uh, the Secretary did exercise that function in respect to reaching a determination around the conduct of that person, correct? Sorry, can you say that again? The Secretary of DPC, Mr Coots Trotter, did in fact exercise that function when he caused an investigation to take place into her conduct as the Secretary of DEIT, correct? That's my understanding. And as a result of that investigation, it was agreed that the secretary, the former secretary's employment would be terminated under Section 41 of the GSC Act, correct? That's my understanding. Were you informed? Was your office informed that that was likely to happen? That Miss Brown was likely to be terminated? Under Section 41 of the GSC Act, as uh, opposed to the misconduct provisions of the GSC Act? Not that I recall. Um, Mr Coots Trotter um, uh, is a... Uh, um, a stickler for the rules um, and we were aware from the outset that um, 
any matter to arise from the head review was a matter for him exclusively. Okay, but that was an active decision because, to be frank, the delegation power can be exercised concurrently. Like a delegation doesn't relieve you of your legal position. It just allows another person to exercise a function on your behalf. Of course. But in this instance, it was uh, entirely appropriate that Mr. Coots tried to take And no one state. disputes that. But what I'm asking is, is that were you told? Told what, sorry? That Mr. Coots tried to, did he tell you as your delegate? Sorry, and I say not your delegate, as the Premier's delegate, that he had reached a conclusion that uh, termination under Section 41 was the appropriate action? I don't recall. Um, he, he certainly kept us in the loop in relation to decisions that he had taken. He did not seek our views in relation to um, uh, um, potential decisions. <clears throat> and I presume you did not advance a view either? No. And not. in respect to just the minister, the minister, look, I did actually ask him repeatedly about what role he played here. He made it very clear at estimates that it was a matter for the Premier and a matter for the Secretary of DPC mm. uh, as well. Do you recall the Minister at all involving himself in this in real office? No. Do you all. recall uh, any uh, effort to seek a briefing from the Minister as to what his views would be on this matter or not? No, okay. certainly not. Okay, thank you. That's the end of questions from the Opposition. We'll go to questions from the Government if they have any. No particular questions, thank you, Chair, but... Uh, Mr Black, just if there's anything that you'd like to round off on and revisit that's been brought up earlier this afternoon. No, I'm fine. Thank you, though. All right. Well, thank you. All good. Thank you for appearing, Mr Black. Appreciate you agreeing to appear before this inquiry. That is the end of today's hearing. Thank you. Thank you.